Chapter 12 Nadine Kissing Lucas was beyond anything I ever imagined it would be. You know in the movies when the guy gets the girl and he sweeps her off her feet, then everyone starts clapping and this beautiful, teary-eyed music starts playing? Then they cut forward a few months and he's carrying her out of the church on their wedding day. Everyone's throwing rice and is all happy. Then they drive off into the sunset and nothing can ever hurt them again? That's what Lucas's kiss felt like, but better. It was like nothing bad could ever touch me. Lucas's hand came up to cradle the back of my neck. A fire ignited deep within my belly, and I relaxed into the kiss. My lips parted, and his tongue slid inside my mouth. It felt as if the ground had dropped away, like we were spinning in midair, and the whole world had ceased to exist around us. My heart lifted in my chest before the adrenaline settled in and sent my heart pummeling against my ribcage. My hands tangled in Lucas's hair, and I dragged him closer to me. He kissed me harder, like I was the very breath he breathed. My nipples hardened beneath my shirt, begging for more. Lucas drew away, and his soft eyes roamed over my face. I was frozen in place, unable to move, blink, or breathe. Several quiet moments passed as we stared deep into each other's eyes, until I thought my lungs might burst. It was the only indication I had that time was still moving forward. I'm sorry, Lucas whispered. I shouldn't have done that. I shook my head and finally took a breath. It's okay, Lucas. I'm glad you did. I hesitated as my gaze roamed over his bruised features. I longed to kiss him again, but right now wasn't the time. Let's get you to a hospital. The next few hours passed at an ungodly slow pace as Talia and I waited in the emergency room for Grant and Lucas. When they were finally released, Grant had four stitches above his eyebrow, and Lucas's broken nose had been set. We took the guys back to their dorm room, then brought them ice cream before turning in for the night. We didn't see them the rest of the weekend. I tried visiting Lucas on Saturday, but no one answered the door, even though I was pretty sure I heard footsteps behind it. I could hardly sleep over the weekend as the kiss replayed over and over again in my mind. Every time I thought about it, my heart lifted in my chest. And then I remembered that I hadn't seen Lucas in days, and my pulse quickened for entirely different reasons. He was obviously avoiding me again, and I was ticked off about it. One minute he's kissing me like his life depends on it, and the next he falls completely off the map. I was getting really sick of his mixed signals. Tuesday morning, I woke with a terrible shooting pain in my left hand. My whole body was stiffer than normal, and it took at least 15 minutes of lying in bed, trying not to scream, before I could shift and get into a more comfortable position. Lupus was like that sometimes. I had good and bad days, and it was all totally unpredictable. Talia noticed I was lying in bed longer than usual. Hey, girl, are you going to take your bath this morning? My neck was so stiff I couldn't even work up the strength to shake my head. Screw my body. Why did it hate itself so much? Eventually, I told her. Well, you better hurry up, she said as she brushed her hair. Miriamic history is in half an hour. I groaned and reached for my phone on my bedside table. She wasn't lying. I think I'm going to skip today, I said. I didn't want to, since it was the one class I struggled the most with. But I hadn't skipped all semester, and I figured I deserved a pass at least once. Today just wasn't happening. Talia turned from the mirror and shot me a concerned expression. Are you going to make it to Conjuring Basics later today? Yeah, I'll make it. Talia frowned and grabbed her bag. Okay, feel better. I scoffed. 
I'll try. It was another hour before I got out of bed, and another hour after that before I finished my bath and got dressed. I was feeling a lot better, but all I wanted to do was go back to sleep. I had a few hours before conjuring basics, and I needed to get some homework done before I went, but I couldn't bring myself to work up the energy. I couldn't recall a day this bad since before my diagnosis. Eventually, I got so hungry that I knew if I didn't head down to the cafeteria soon, I'd end up passing out before I got there. I ate, then headed off to Conjuring Basics. Before we jump into our next lesson, Professor Carlyle said, let's review what we already know about Conjuring. Professor Carlyle was a short, elderly seer with salt and pepper hair and an equally gray cat who looked like he was on his last life. You'd think at first glance Professor Carlyle was too, but he had this energy about him that suggested he had many years left. He continued, Earlier in the semester we learned that conjuring is bound by many rules. You can't conjure something out of nothing, and you can't make one thing disappear from somewhere and end up in another. Imagine a pocket universe that follows you around everywhere you go. To subconjure, you take an object from your hand and place it into this pocket universe. To conjure, you take something from that universe and place it into your hand. Professor Carlyle held out his hand, and a cane materialized out of nowhere. Conjured. He smiled brightly and did a little tap dance at the front of the room. At the end, he kicked the cane and made it spin around in his hand. It disappeared right in front of our eyes. Subconjured. See? Simple. A few people clapped at the demonstration, but it was half-hearted. I couldn't wait until I had magic, so I didn't have to lug around my textbooks wherever I went. It'd be so convenient to have my wallet at my fingertips without having to actually carry it around. I mean, I'd be fine with it if the fashion industry just gave women pockets, but I guess that was more of a stretch than actual magic. What we haven't talked about yet this semester is Conjuring's limitations, Professor Carlyle said. Let's say I wanted to fill my pocket universe to the brim. How many items do you think I could take with me? A hand raised at the front of the room. Five? The girl guessed timidly. Professor Carlyle pressed his index finger to his lips. Hmm, not exactly. Ten! Someone else shouted, and Professor Carlyle shook his head. A hundred! Another voice came. Professor Carlyle didn't stop shaking his head as more and more students piped up with their guesses, the numbers growing each time. I couldn't help but think that my classmates were idiots. This obviously wasn't the kind of answer Professor Carlyle was looking for. I raised my hand, and his eyebrows shot up. Miss Evers? The room went quiet, and I cleared my throat. Wouldn't it depend on the size of the objects, and not the amount? His eyes brightened and he smiled. Professor Carlyle had one of the most expressive faces I'd ever seen. Precisely. But how big do you think our invisible bag is? Could I, say, fit a car in it? Or an entire library of books? He looked directly at me, but I didn't know how to answer his question. Professor Carlyle clicked his tongue. No guesses? Some jock in the front row leaned back in his seat. I bet you could fit a car. Our professor cocked an eyebrow. You think so, Mr. James? Sure, he claimed. I'll bet you ten bucks after my evoking ceremony, I'll subconjure a car. Professor Carlyle smirked and stepped up to him with his hand out. You're on. The two of them shook on it. Then, Professor Carlyle turned to the door at the front of the lecture hall. He stepped behind it and put a door stopper in front of it to keep it open. Practically, the whole class craned their necks to see what he was up to. I couldn't see anything, 
until he shot back into the room, sitting on a chest of drawers that was on wheels. He sat with his knees crossed and his arms held in the air, like he was making a grand entrance to a Vegas show or something. The chest of drawers spun once. He jumped off and nearly stumbled over his cat, but he made a clean landing. The class clapped and cheered for him. Ladies and gentlemen, a chest of drawers. Professor Carlyle gestured to it. It was dark mahogany and looked a lot like the dressers we had in our dorms, except it was longer and shorter. This is approximately the size of your unique pocket universe. So, by all means, Mr. James, if you can manage to subconjure a car, I'd be very interested to see that. Professor Carlyle turned back to the chest of drawers and conjured his cane, then started tapping it against the drawers. This is all the space you get, ladies and gentlemen. In my opinion, it totally beats a duffel bag, and it definitely saves you money when you fly. The class chuckled. A girl at the front of the room raised her hand. What happens if you try to subconjure too much, if your space gets full? Let me ask you this, Professor Carlyle replied. What would happen if I tried to fill this chest of drawers too full? Well, the drawers wouldn't close, obviously, she said. Exactly, Professor Carlyle said. It'll push back. Things will start spilling out. Simple as that. The jock eyed the chest of drawers. So what happens if you subconjure a person? Professor Carlyle raised an eyebrow. Why, Mr. James, do you have plans to kidnap somebody? James sent a nervous glance around the room at the people who were laughing. No, I just wondered, you know, could you survive it? The pocket universe. I don't know, Professor Carlyle answered. That's another limitation to conjuring. You can't subconjure a living thing. One of James's friends leaned over to him. There goes your kidnapping plans. Shut up, he shoved his friend. I raised my hand, and Professor Carlyle called on me. I'm curious. Can things get lost? Like, if I wanted to subconjure something to hide it from someone, would they ever be able to find it? Or say I subconjured a valuable family heirloom, but I died before I had a chance to pass it on. Would it be lost forever? Professor Carlyle pressed his lips together firmly. That's a very good question, Miss Evers. And this is why I advise you, never subconjure anything of value. That said, there are ways to retrieve items from someone else's personal stash. However, it is a very complicated spell that requires more than one individual to perform and is only done on rare occasions. Why, Miss Evers? Is there something you'd like to retrieve? I shook my head. No, I was just curious how it works, is all. Snooping into someone else's pocket universe is dangerous, Professor Carlyle warned. You may not like what you find. Don't let your curiosity get you into too much trouble, Miss Evers. I chuckled under my breath. Professor Carlyle didn't know me at all. After class, I made my way to Headmistress Verla's office for my first evoking ceremony training session. I turned down a short hall, but it was deserted. I glanced down to my campus map to confirm I was in the right hall, then walked to the end. There sat a pair of double doors with a plaque that read, Headmistress Clarice Verla. I raised my fist to knock when I heard a deafening bang sound from the other side of the doors. My heart leapt up to my throat, and I swayed on my feet as the ground shook beneath me. I heard the sound of doors swinging open from the adjacent hall. Then came the many footsteps. 
A second later, white smoke began to billow out through the cracks around the doors. It was unusually thick and didn't smell of fire. I eyed the smoke curiously and reached my fingers out to touch it. A stinging pain shot through my fingers, and I jerked away like I'd been burned. Professor Wyckoff, my introduction to tarot professor, rounded the corner. Her usual calm demeanor was replaced by a terrified look in her eyes. Dear goddess, she cried, what's happened? I, I don't know, I stammered, stepping away from the smoke creeping out into the hall. My fingers stung like I'd been attacked by a bee. Professor Wyckoff whirled around as two other professors came running. Get Professor Richards. The other professors went running to get help, while Professor Wyckoff turned back to me. She grabbed me by the elbow and spoke gently. Come, child, you must stay away. Wait, what's going on? I asked, terrified that I'd just encountered some sort of chemical weapon. Is Headmistress Verla going to be okay? What is that? Professor Wyckoff pulled me into the next hall and guided me to stand next to the wall to let a group of professors pass. I noticed Professor Richards among them, clutching a flask full of blue liquid. Tell me what you saw, Professor Wyckoff instructed. My jaw dropped, and I rubbed my aching fingers with my thumb. I think I was still in shock. I, I didn't see anything. I just walked into the hall when I heard a bang— then I saw the smoke, and you were there a second later. Professor Wyckoff grabbed my wrist and inspected the ends of my fingers. They were bright red, but otherwise looked fine. She breathed a sigh of relief. Child, what are you doing in this part of the school? Voices yelled down the hall, and it took me a second to process her question. I came to meet Headmistress Verla. We have an appointment. Okay, she said with a frown. You stay right here, Miss Evers. I didn't really know what was happening, so I did as I was told. After Professor Wyckoff turned the corner to join the other professors, I heard them start to argue. We need to figure out who did this, a male professor said. Agreed, Professor Wyckoff replied. This is a threat. How do we know it's not just a prank? A second female professor asked. We don't, the first guy responded in a clipped tone. But until we know, we must treat it as an attempt on the headmistress's life. Professor Wyckoff gasped. Who would do that? I was breathing heavily, unable to process what they were saying. Was someone out to kill? Headmistress Verla? Relax, I've got the perimeter secure, Professor Richards said. The antidote is working, but it will take a few hours. The sound of clicking heels caught my attention. I looked up to see Headmistress Verla breezing down the hall. Her black cat ran behind her, but he was so fat that he more or less waddled. I breathed a sigh of relief grateful that she hadn't been in her office when that thing went off. Her eyebrows hung low over her eyes, giving her this dark look that seemed strange on such a beautiful woman. She walked past me, like she didn't even see me, and stomped straight up to the other professors. I inched my way along the wall to peek around the corner and get a good look at them. "'What in the name of Mother Miriam is going on here?' she cried. A sting bomb, Professor Richards said. But not to worry, headmistress. This potion should take care of it in a few hours. He held up the blue potion I'd seen him running past with. Most of it was gone. Professor Wyckoff's jaw dropped. A stink bomb? No, Professor Richards replied. A sting bomb. It's a defense potion brewed using a stinging nettle. It's fairly harmless, but it hurts like a son of a bitch. 
Thank Alora had Mistress Verla wasn't in her office when it was set off. Did anyone see who did it? Verla demanded. Odin stepped toward the cloud of smoke and hissed. The professors all glanced to each other and shook their heads. Professor Wyckoff's eyes brightened, and she looked to me. My face paled as I was caught eavesdropping. There was a witness, Professor Wyckoff gestured to me. Headmistress Verla's face fell as she turned to me. Nadine, tell us what happened. Timidly, I stepped out from around the corner and joined the professors. The double doors were open. All I could see behind them was a wall of white smoke, but it just hung there in the air instead of creeping into the hall. I actually didn't see anything, I admitted. I only just arrived when it went off. An older male professor who looked cocky as hell gazed down his nose at me. He wore an ironed suit and his gray hair was combed into a neat style. Who's to say you weren't the one who set it off? He reached out and snatched my wrist. Ow! I cried. Oh, please, he sneered. I barely touched you. Proof. He held my hand up to all the other professors to show them my red fingers. He pointed an ugly finger at me. You've been caught red-handed. Did you think this was some innocent little prank, half-blood? I gaped at him. Did he seriously just have the nerve to call me a half-blood in front of all these other professors? Professor Damon, had Mistress Verla shouted. He dropped my hand, and I held it to my chest protectively. If I had any strength in it at the moment, I might have curled it into a fist and sucker-punched that smug sneer off his face. I prayed to Miriam I'd never have this professor. He seemed awful. Headmistress Verla stepped forward to get up in Professor Damon's face. How dare you accuse a student of this? She is my mentee. Well, I, I, he stammered. Headmistress Verla scoffed at him. Go do something useful with your time, Archibald. Professor Damon narrowed his gaze at her before huffing and stomping off. Headmistress Verla turned to me. I'm very sorry, Nadine, but I'm afraid we're going to have to reschedule while I deal with this. I'll get back to you on our next session. Okay, I said. I'm sorry this happened. Headmistress Verla shook her head. Don't worry about it. Unless you saw something happen. She eyed me like she too was a little suspicious. If she was, I wasn't sure why she'd stood up for me. I didn't, I said. I swear. Had Mistress Verla looked at me a moment longer, then dropped her shoulders. You may go. I walked away feeling really confused. Did Headmistress Verla seriously suspect me of trying to sabotage her? Why would I do something like that? The only person in this school I knew who had the balls to sabotage someone like that was Chloe. Speak of the devil. I exited a long hallway to see Chloe, Gwen, and Camille huddled in a group and snickering at each other. Can you say deja vu? They'd done the exact same thing after they broke into my dorm room. I stomped straight up to them. Chloe noticed my approach and shot me a death glare. She placed her hand on her hip. What's your problem? I crossed my arms and stood just inches from her. She was a lot taller than me in her heels, but I liked to think I intimidated her nonetheless. A sting bomb just went off in Headmistress Verla's office. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? Chloe scoffed and rolled her eyes. Please, I've been standing here for the last ten minutes. My girls will back me up. Camille pursed her lips in my direction. At the same time, Gwen tossed her blonde hair over her shoulder. 
It was the first time I'd noticed a cauldron tattoo on her chest. It definitely wasn't there before, which meant she must have gone through her evoking ceremony recently, and that Chloe now had a right-hand alchemist to do her bidding. So what? You put a timer on it or something, I accused. Chloe shot an innocent look to the other girls. I don't know. Can you do that with potions? The other two shrugged in unison. Chloe leaned forward so I could feel her breath on my face. You don't know anything about this coven, Nadine. You don't want to leave on your own? Then I'll make you. My hands tightened into fists, but my fingers were still burning from the sting bomb. Is that a threat? Chloe stepped away without acknowledging my question. Good luck passing your evoking ceremony without any training. She flipped her hair over her shoulder and started walking in the other direction. I gaped at her. That was a confession if I'd ever heard one. No one had tried to hurt Headmistress Verla. Chloe had set off that sting bomb to sabotage my lesson. She knew I had it this week because Camille and Gwen had been in the metaphysical shop when Headmistress Verla and I talked about it. That bitch would do anything to drive me out of town, including ensuring I failed my evoking ceremony. And all for what? A dead feud between our grandparents? Get a life and stop trying to ruin mine, I shouted down the hall. Chloe continued on her way, swaying her hips as if she never heard me. I'd bet anything she was the one who'd raided the alchemy lab last week, too. Gah! I screamed, turning on my heel and storming in the opposite direction. I was passing by the cafeteria when I caught sight of Grant, sitting alone at a table near the door. I walked in and plopped down across from him. He glanced up at me, but he didn't have any food in front of him. I shot him a curious expression. What's got your panties in a bunch? He asked. I huffed. Chloe's at it again. Grant frowned while he poked at something beneath the table. What'd she do this time? Well, I don't have any proof, but I'm pretty sure she's responsible for setting off a sting bomb in Headmistress Verla's office to sabotage my evoking ceremony training, I said. It does sound like her. He winced, then stuck his finger in his mouth and sucked on it like it hurt. I eyed him curiously. What are you doing? Oh, this? Grant held up a small device with digital numbers on it. I'm checking my blood sugar before I eat. I tilted my head, and the knot in my chest loosened. You have diabetes? He nodded as he took his bag from his lap and placed it on the table. It opened like a flat wallet and was filled with his medication. Not a big deal. I can hardly remember a time I didn't have it. I suddenly felt an instant connection with Grant that wasn't there before. Obviously, diabetes and lupus weren't the same thing, but I always got a jolt of excitement when I met someone with a chronic illness. It was like they were the only people who even remotely understood what I went through. How long have you known? I asked. Since I was 14, he replied as he grabbed a needle and started filling it with insulin. I was 15 when I was diagnosed, I blurted. I usually didn't talk about my disease to just anyone, but I felt like Grant would understand. He raised a curious eyebrow. Diabetes? I shook my head. Lupus. That's autoimmune, isn't it? He asked casually. I smiled. Usually I was met with, Oh, Nadine, I'm so sorry. Or, Have you seen a doctor about that? But Grant just wanted to know more, like I was telling him about one of my classes. Yeah, my doctor says it's common in the coven, I said. He injected his shot, then nodded. Yeah, it comes with being half human. A silent beat passed between us, but I broke it. Do you want to get dinner together? 
Sure, I just have to wait a few minutes for the insulin to kick in, he said. I folded my hands in my lap. I can wait. Are Lucas or Talia joining us? He shook his head. Lucas is meeting his mentor, and Talia has a study group. I frowned. I wasn't sure if Grant was covering for Lucas or if it was the truth. What's wrong? Grant asked, sensing my discomfort. I hesitated a moment, but I couldn't stand not knowing. Does Lucas really have a meeting with his mentor? Yes, Grant answered honestly. Why wouldn't he? I pressed my lips together. Well, I haven't seen him since... since our kiss, I wanted to say. Instead, I said, since the hospital. He has a habit of avoiding me, and I'm worried... Don't worry, Nadine, Grant assured me, but I sensed uncertainty in his tone. Lucas just needs time. My stomach sank. Time to decide how he truly feels, I thought. I tried not to let my disappointment get to me, but it was hard when all I could think about lately was that kiss. Lucas said he didn't want to be with me. Then he kisses me. Like that. The best kiss of my entire life. What the hell was his deal? Well, I guess it's just us two then, I said. Yep, just us. After a moment of silence, Grant said, Hey, do you think if we put our immune systems together, we'd have a working one? I laughed. I don't know about that. Mine's trying to kill me. Mine too, but in a different way. He started putting his supplies away in a bag that held it all. I've got type 1 diabetes. My immune system attacks the cells in my pancreas that produce insulin. I have to eat regularly and inject myself to regulate my blood sugar. There's no cure, but at least life's pretty normal, as long as I plan ahead. Same here, I said. Do you have to use an insulin pump? I was too curious not to ask questions. Grant subconjured his supplies, and they disappeared from the table. I could if I wanted to, but then I'd have to wear it all the time, and I'd have to take it off when I'm active, which is a pain, especially with how much I swim. With the shots, it's in, out, and done, and there's a lower risk of infection. That makes sense. So, I'm curious about something. If mixed kids in the coven like us end up with autoimmune diseases, how'd the first generation survive? I asked. I mean, there was no treatment for this type of thing back then, and I'm pretty sure they weren't all purebred. Grant leaned forward, looking interested by the question. Back then, they didn't have their magic suppressed in childhood like we do now. They didn't? I asked. No, Grant said. Mother Miriam started suppressing our magic when she saw what a danger it could be to the children. That's when the evoking ceremonies began. Anyway, back before the kids had their magic suppressed, their bodies became accustomed to the magic faster, before their immune system could be triggered. But Grant sighed. Mother Miriam had to make a trade-off to control children's magic. In the long run, I guess a few sick witches and warlocks are better for the coven than hundreds of kids running around with unpredictable magic. I chuckled. Yeah, I guess it is. Turns out we just drew the short straw. Grant rolled his eyes. I always seem to draw the short straw. It's like I'm cursed or something. I guess you could be, I joked, considering curses are real. Grant pressed his hand to his heart and dropped his jaw. Now who would want to curse me? I'm a darling. I cocked an eyebrow. Are you? I've heard horror stories from Talia. He dropped his jaw further. What did she tell you? I threw my head back and laughed. Nothing, I was joking. Grant blew out a breath of relief. Oh, good. Hey, maybe you can work in a good word for me. With Talia? I asked. He nodded. I scoffed. 
Ugh, you're going to have to do the work yourself. Come on, he begged. At least give me a hint. How do I get the girl? I don't know. Serenade her? I joked. Grant tapped his chin. That might just work. You're a genius. I pressed my palm to my forehead. I wasn't serious. Well, it's worth a try, isn't it? He asked. Yeah, I guess, I admitted. The truth was, I was pretty sure Talia enjoyed the chase. Eventually, she'd cave, but not before Grant jumped through hoops to get to her. Grant finally said he was ready to eat, so we made our way through the buffet line. He went straight for various dishes instead of contemplating them, like he'd planned out his meal beforehand. We returned to our table and chatted. Halfway through dinner, Grant's eyes focused on something behind me. I turned to see the gang of idiots who'd beat up Hem and Lucas, sitting at a table in the corner of the room. They were wearing their stupid, treacherous tarantula leather jackets, and one of them was trying to see how many peas he could shove up his nose. Totally badass. Not. Heat flared in my bones, and my eyes narrowed their way. Idiots, I mumbled under my breath. Grant scoffed. No kidding. Did you know the Imperium did nothing to punish them? My jaw dropped. You're kidding. There were witnesses. You have stitches above your eye. Grant shrugged. Yeah, well, apparently they have better things to worry about than some petty fight. My nostrils flared. That wasn't a petty fight. That was battery. Shh, Grant glanced around the cafeteria. I know. I'd like to get back at them, too. But I can't justify going after them when they could just beat me to a pulp again. It was five against two, I said. It was hardly a fair fight. My hands clenched into fists as I thought about all the terrible things I could do to get back at them. The gears started turning in my head, and a wide smile spread across my face. Curiosity filled Grant's eyes. What's going on in that pretty little head of yours, Nadine? I leaned forward. Tell me, Grant, how badly do you want to get back at them? He eyed me. Depends on what you have in mind. I crinkled my nose. I've got a plan. This is dangerous, Grant hissed at me. Lucas would kill us if he knew we were doing this. I smirked. Why do you think I didn't invite him? He grabbed me by the arm and pulled me behind a black sedan. I kept my gaze on the five tarantulas across the school parking lot. They were piling into Ryan's black sports car. It was past nightfall now, and the only light we could see by was the moon. I cocked an eyebrow at Grant. So what? I thought you wanted to get back at them. Not by following them, he said. Nadine, you don't know these guys. I rolled my eyes and zipped my leather jacket all the way up. I've known enough guys like them. Now let's go before we lose them. I hurried out of my hiding spot and raced a few cars down to my own vehicle. I unlocked the doors and tossed my backpack on the floor below the passenger seat. Grant hesitated, then ran after me and climbed in beside me. I threw the car into reverse. Did you see where they went? Grant pointed to the right. That way. I tore out of the parking lot and followed the tarantulas down the road. I caught up quickly but was careful to keep my distance so they wouldn't notice my headlights following them. Lighten up, Grant. I nudged him in the side. I thought you, of all people, would be thrilled to get back at them. Hell yeah, but I don't want you getting in the middle of it, he said. I smirked. You have a lot to learn about me. Grant looked at me for a few seconds, then caved. 
Okay, Nadine. I'm all in, as long as you understand what you're getting yourself into. I scoffed. I'm not scared of these assholes. Grant clicked his tongue. I think we need to hang out more often. I already like you ten times more. I chuckled. That's because I'm awesome. Where are these guys going, anyway? I don't know, Grant said. But it looked sketchy to me. I glanced to either side of the road, but there was nothing but trees. I didn't recognize where we were. Wherever the tarantulas were going, it wasn't into town. The tarantulas turned into a long driveway. I slowed and tried to take in as much as I could about the property, but we could hardly see anything from the road. All I saw were more trees. What the? I whispered. Hairs rose on the back of my neck, and I was getting a little creeped out. Whatever this was couldn't be good, which meant I definitely had to check it out. I pulled off to the side of the road and cut the engine. What are you doing? Grant glanced back to the dark driveway. I smirked at him as I opened my door. We're going to check it out, of course. Grant frowned. You sure, Nancy Drew? I smiled at the nickname. Positive. I shoved my car keys in my pocket, then grabbed my bag and swung it over my shoulder. Grant stayed by my side as we entered the woods and crept through the trees. What do you think they're doing back here? He asked, looking amused. I shrugged. Sacrificing babies? Grant chuckled. Probably. I half expected to walk in on them around a bonfire, conducting some dark ritual. Instead, we came upon a run-down house with their car parked out in front. It looked like nothing more than a small weekend cabin, no bigger than two bedrooms. I'd kill to know what they were doing inside. I swung my bag off my shoulder and opened it. Contents clicked together and fell to the ground. My heart lurched at the noise. I froze and glanced to the house to make sure no one had heard. Shh, Grant hissed. He looked down to all the boxes and aluminum spray cans I'd run back to my room to get after dinner. What is all this, Nadine? I gathered the contents and shoved it all back in my bag, then handed him a can of spray paint. I bought it at the joke shop in town after Chloe trashed my room. Just in case. Grant read the spray paint label in the moonlight. He smirked and started shaking the can like he had a good idea for it. What else have you got in there? I started digging through my bag to show him. Unpoppable bubbles, multiplying silly string, and these beads that smell awful when you touch them. An evil grin spread across Grant's face. I like how you think, Nadine. Like an alchemist. I shrugged. I have my moments. I might have something we can use, too. Grant conjured a collection of firecrackers. Put those back, I whispered. We don't want to let them know we're here. Now, let's go before they come back out. I want to get those jerks back for what they did to Lucas's face. Grant's jaw dropped. What about mine? I smiled. Yours, too. For you and Lucas. For me and Lucas, he repeated. Grant and I crept through the shadows toward Ryan's car. Grant started spraying the back window with hot pink paint while I threw the stink beads through the open driver's side window. They scattered across the front seats. I threw the rest of the container in the back. When that was empty, I pulled out a can of unpoppable bubbles. They rushed out of the container like spray paint, covering the seats with big, soapy-looking bubbles. I smiled proudly as I emptied the can. Adrenaline pulsed through my body, and my heart slammed against my ribcage. It was exhilarating. Next, I pulled out the can of multiplying silly string. I sprayed that all over on top of the bubbles, then touched it, just for fun, and to test it out. 
Beneath my fingers, the silly string started growing, twisting into new strings everywhere I poked it. Grant snickered as he sprayed the tires with paint. I think that's good, he hissed through the darkness. Hang on, I said. I pulled my keys from my pocket and dragged one along the side of Ryan's car. It made a satisfying screech as it dug into the shiny black paint. I smiled proudly. Okay, let's go. We shoved our supplies back in the bag and started toward the forest, but we didn't make it there before the front door of the house banged open. Hey! One of the tarantulas shouted, making my heart leap up into my throat. Grant grabbed me by the hand, and we sprinted into the trees. My knees groaned in protest, and I couldn't keep up with Grant. I slowed and caught myself on a nearby tree. Not far from us, we could hear the tarantulas screaming about what we'd done to their car. Grant tugged at my hand. Come on, Nadine. We've got to go. I knew he was right, despite my body telling me otherwise. I suddenly regretted following the tarantulas on a day I was so wiped I could hardly walk. Give me a second, I gasped. Grant seemed to realize I wasn't completely myself because a look of concern came over his face. Get on my back, Nadine. I didn't have a moment to question it because Ryan was shouting at his tarantulas to split up and find whoever vandalized his car. If I didn't get moving fast, they were going to catch up with us. I climbed onto Grant's back and he started moving through the woods. He stopped in his tracks when he turned toward the road, and we saw orbs hovering in the forest ahead of us. They're going to see us if we go that way, I said. I have an idea, Grant whispered. He turned around in the opposite direction and doubled back toward the house. What are you doing? I hissed. They're not going to look for us over there, he pointed out. Good point. Grant moved quietly through the trees toward the back of the house. From what we could see, Ryan was angrily trying to clean out his car, but the multiplying silly string was getting tangled in his hands. He swore and flailed his arms around angrily, making it clear he was going to strangle whoever had done this. I thought it was hilarious. The other four tarantulas were in the trees, looking for us, without a clue that we'd slipped past them. Grant set me down. I steadied myself against a tree and sat on the ground. He crouched beside me, keeping close watch on all the tarantulas. Are you okay? Grant asked. I was a little lightheaded and could feel that the blood had drained from my face. I felt like curling into a ball and falling asleep right there. But I couldn't say that to Grant. My disability never gave me any rational reason to feel the way I did. These waves of fatigue hit randomly, and there wasn't much I could do about it. I'll be fine, I told him. Thanks for asking. We sat there for another ten minutes, and I started to feel the blood return to my face, which was a relief. Ryan had managed to pull most of the bubbles and silly string out of the car, and it just lay there on the gravel in a heap around the vehicle. He was still pissed about the spray paint. The four tarantulas returned. Whoever it was got away, one of them said. Shit! Ryan growled in rage and kicked one of his tires. Incompetent fucks! Get in the car, we're leaving. Grant and I breathed a sigh of relief at the same time. He turned to me with a smile. Good work, Nadine. You've successfully pissed them off. I shrugged. It's a gift. Ryan tore out of the driveway like he was ready to raise some hell of his own. I snickered as we watched their lights disappear through the trees, but I held my breath when they reached the end of the driveway. I prayed they wouldn't turn to the left where my car was parked. Luckily, they took a right back the way we came. We were safe. Come on. I gestured to Grant and got to my feet, then crossed the small clearing to the side of the house. 
Nadine, he hissed through the darkness. What are you doing? I reached for the side door and turned back to him. Aren't you the least bit curious? Someone could be in there, he pointed out. I shrugged. It was unlikely, since there weren't any other cars here and the lights were off. Don't you at least want to find out? I turned back toward the door and twisted the handle. It didn't budge. Guess we're not getting in, Grant said. I eyed him. Don't you know a spell to unlock it or something? Grant glared at me, like he wasn't using it, even if he did. Not a problem, I said. I brought my lockpick set. I pulled the lockpick out of my bag, and Grant's eyes went wide. What do you have that for? I shrugged. It's a hobby. Despite Grant's obvious unease, he looked impressed when I picked the lock in under a minute. I didn't know breaking and entering was a hobby. I really am a bit of a Nancy Drew, I teased. Come on. Grant groaned and followed behind me. A little light? I suggested. An orb formed in Grant's palm, lighting up the stairwell in front of us like a flashlight. We were standing on a landing, where a few stairs went up to a kitchen on our left, and the rest went downward to the basement. Come on! I waved my hand, and Grant and I started upstairs to the main level. Like I guessed, there was no one here. It was eerily quiet, and apart from a few empty soda cans and a bag of chips lying on the ground, it looked like no one had been here in years. There was hardly any furniture, just a couch in the living room and an old mattress in one of the bedrooms. Everything was covered in a thick layer of dust. Why do you think they came here? I whispered to Grant. We were alone, but the place gave me the creeps, so I kept quiet. I don't know, he replied. To hide a body? Talk to the ghost who haunts this place? You think it's haunted? I asked. He shrugged. I'm not a seer. I glanced into the second bedroom, but it was empty. Let's check out the basement. Grant stopped me at the top of the stairs. Let me go first, Nadine. I stepped out of his way, and Grant took the stairs first. I followed close behind. When we got far enough down the stairs to see in the light of his orb, I inhaled a sharp breath. The basement was nothing but endless counters, all covered in various alchemy supplies. There was even a huge shelving unit in the corner, with tons of ingredients packed haphazardly into it. Grant's eyes grew wide. He tossed his orb into the air, and it split into a million tiny stars, lighting up the room like it was daytime. It took me a second to find my voice as I took in all the cauldrons and vials. What is all this? Those guys aren't even alchemists. Grant was too shocked by what we'd found to say anything. He walked over to the supply shelf and started reading the labels. Dragon scale? Breath of a Kirin? Hunbit skin venom? I don't even know what that is or what it's used for, but it's definitely not something these guys should be able to get their hands on. Grant continued walking while I walked around the room, inspecting all the supplies. Mermaid scale? Blood of a vampire? Wolven tooth? Nadine, none of this stuff comes from the coven. These are all from other magical societies, like the Elementi and Arcania. To get your hands on this stuff? Goddess, you'd have to be the Imperium. Or, at a minimum, the alchemy supplies director at school. I came up behind Grant to look at all the vials. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. A real phoenix feather and a hair from a unicorn. And to think... Just a few months ago, I thought witches were nothing but fiction. You mean you can find this kind of stuff at school? I asked. Grant nodded. I raised an eyebrow. Isn't it obvious, then? 
Grant's jaw dropped. No. You think they're the ones who raided the alchemy lab? I gave him a bored frown. No, it's too unlike them, I said sarcastically. Grant picked up a vial that had a thick blue liquid in it. What do you think they're going to do with all this? I pressed my lips together. Well, they're not alchemists, so my guess is they're going to try reselling it. An evil grin spread across Grant's face. They can't sell it if there's nothing to sell. I was instantly intrigued. What are you suggesting? We steal it back? Grant rubbed his hands together mischievously. I've always wanted to play Robin Hood. Steal from the rich and give to the poor? Grant crinkled his nose. More like steal from the assholes and put it back where it belongs. I smiled. Count me in. Chapter 13 Lucas You did what? I growled. Grant sat on his bed and sucked air through his teeth. He knew he was in deep shit with me. Nadine and I followed the tarantulas to an abandoned house and robbed them? I paced around the room, my hands fisting at my sides. Is that a question, Grant? He shook his head. No, we definitely robbed them, but we only did it to give the stuff back to the alchemy department. We dropped it off in Professor Richard's room. No one saw us. I raked my fingers through my hair. So you put Nadine in danger? Grant gaped at me. It was her idea. When did this happen? I demanded. Grant shrugged. Over a week ago. I wanted to tell you, but... But? I cocked an eyebrow. Grant frowned. I thought you'd be mad. Of course I'm mad! I yelled. I don't want Nadine anywhere near Ryan or any of the tarantulas. What were you doing hanging out with her anyway? I don't know, he said vaguely. She wasn't feeling well, and I guess she just... My jaw dropped. She wasn't feeling well? Like how? Grant furrowed his brow. I don't know. She didn't give me a detailed list of her symptoms. I covered my mouth with my hand as realization struck. It's my fault. I muttered, thinking back to the kiss. What's your fault? Grant asked. My teeth ground together. The kiss. I never should have kissed her. About that, Grant hesitated. I stopped pacing and faced him. About that what? Grant sighed. Well, Nadine's kind of upset you haven't talked to her since then. She thinks you've been avoiding her. Oh, so now you've been talking to her behind my back? I fumed. Today was not a good day. My temper was all over the place. Come on, Grant said. You know it's not like that. I had been avoiding Nadine, but I only did it to protect her. I still hadn't decided if I was summoning the Reapers at the Reaper Moon and risking the Abyss. And if I didn't, I couldn't take things any further with Nadine and make her the Reaper's shadow. I have good reason, I said. I know that, Grant told me. But Nadine doesn't. You should talk to her. I groaned. You know what happens when I talk to her. You turn into a lovesick puppy? Grant teased. Shut up. I grabbed my pillow and threw it across the room at him. Grant checked the clock on his nightstand. It's almost noon. You should go ask her out to lunch. You should go ask Talia out to lunch. I sat back like a child. Grant crossed his arms. Tell you what, I'll one-up you. I'll serenade Talia if you have just one lunch with Nadine. I scoffed. That I'd like to see. Grant shrugged. The sooner you go ask Nadine to lunch, the sooner I can get to serenading. I groaned, but I snatched my hoodie up off the bed anyway. Fine, I'll do it. I could hear the sound of Grant laughing in delight as I left the room. I shoved my arms through the sleeves of my hoodie and sauntered down the hall with the hood up. This was going to go absolutely fantastic. Not. I raised my hand to knock on Nadine's door, but I hesitated. 
After waiting two weeks since the kiss to talk to her, she probably never wanted to see my face again. Goddess, what was I thinking? Girls were so emotional. She probably took it super personally, which I guess I couldn't blame her for. Before I could talk myself into knocking on her door, it swung open. The sound of piano music spilled out into the hall, and Nadine's bright eyes stared back at me. When I saw her, it was like a dark storm cloud lifted from above my head. My hood fell to my shoulders. She was so pretty, with her hair down in waves and tight skinny jeans hugging her curves. How had I managed to steer clear of her for two weeks? This girl drew me in like a magnet. She stumbled back a step, surprised to see me standing there. Lucas? Nadine, I am... Fuck, why couldn't I talk? I spit it out before I could make a total fool of myself. I came to see if you wanted to come to lunch with me. Nadine's features hardened. She didn't say anything for several long seconds. I half expected her to yell at me, considering the death glare she shot my way. It was preferable to the silence. I had no idea what she was thinking. So you're not avoiding me? She finally asked sharply. Ouch. Well, I'm here, I replied. Nadine hesitated, but her tone softened. I was just headed down there anyway. Hang on. She left the door open and hurried back inside the room. Talia sat at her piano bench playing the keyboard, and she hummed under her breath. Nadine returned moments later. Is Talia coming to lunch? I asked, holding my breath. I liked Talia, but I kind of wanted to be alone with Nadine. No, she said as she shut the door behind her. She's stuck in the zone. We started down the hall side by side. I noticed she was clutching her fists tightly. She was holding something. What's that you've got there? She bit her lip and looked up at me. It's for you. Nadine held her fist out and I placed my hand beneath it. For me? I asked in surprise. Nadine opened her hand and a small, cool object fell into my palm. It was a blue stone. Um, thanks, I said lamely. Nadine raised an eyebrow, like my indifference amused her. She stopped at the top of the stairs and turned to me. It's Celestite, Lucas. I blinked at her a few times. I knew that was supposed to mean something, but I hadn't taken crystal studies yet. It's a calming stone, Nadine explained without me having to ask. You know how you can't sit still and you're always fidgeting? I am, I asked. I'd never noticed, but I guess she was right. She nodded. I bought it for you at the hospital gift shop, but I haven't had a chance to give it to you. I thought it might help you feel better. My heart instantly melted at the sentiment. I didn't care what the stone was meant for. The fact that it came from Nadine made all the difference. Thank you, I said genuinely as I curled my hand tightly around the celestite. That's very thoughtful. That's very thoughtful? Who was I, the Pope? I wanted to say something more, but Nadine turned away and started down the stairs. She gripped tight to the railing, like she was afraid she might fall. Are you okay? Fine, she told me. Why? We reached the bottom of the stairs, and I breathed a sigh of relief. It's just... Grant told me you weren't feeling well. Nadine scoffed and continued toward the cafeteria. I never feel well. I have my good days and my bad. What's today? I questioned. A good day or a bad day? A weight like a rock settled in my stomach. I dreaded the answer. Nadine frowned. How about we don't ask questions we don't want to know the answers to? Now that pissed me off. I grabbed Nadine's hand and stopped her just outside the cafeteria. She scowled at me and jerked away. I gaped down at her for a second, shocked that she was so offended by my touch. I guess after avoiding her so long, I deserved that. I do want to know the answer, I assured her. I always want to know how you're feeling, Nade. She crossed her arms and her eyes darkened. Really? Is that why you haven't spoken to me in two weeks? You want to know how I feel, Lucas? 
I feel confused. I feel abandoned. Holy shit. Nade, I... I feel like I did something wrong, and I don't know what it was. Angry tears rose to her eyes, and it was like a knife through my heart. I feel like we had something going, but when we kissed, it was like... Like you just decided I wasn't worth your time anymore. Fuck, I'd really screwed up. That stone in my stomach grew heavier and heavier by the second. That's not it at all, I insisted. A few people slipped by us on their way out of the cafeteria, and I realized we were blocking the doors. I took Nadine by the shoulder and led her down the hall where we could talk in private. She didn't shy away from me this time. Look, Nade, I pressed my fingers to my eyes. The reason I've been staying away is because I'm concerned about you. She scoffed. For real, Lucas, because you say stuff like that, but it doesn't feel like it. It's true, I promised. You already know we can't be together because of the Reaper's shadow. Screw the curse, Nadine shouted, earning us a few stares from people in the hall. She quickly lowered her tone. The curse has nothing to do with you not talking to me. My face began to heat, and my lips pressed tightly together. She didn't get it. Yes, it does, I snapped. I hated myself for the harsh tone I was taking. I never wanted Nadine to be on the receiving end of one of my freakouts. But if this was what made her understand and kept her away from me, then maybe I had to hurt her a little. Maybe I had to be the asshole to save her. The curse has everything to do with this. I said, because every time I'm near you, I just, I just, you just what? Nadine snapped. Before I knew what was happening, I grabbed her face and pressed my body up against hers, pushing her back against the wall. My lips swooped down, but I stopped a millimeter away from her mouth. I was dying to claim it as my own, to kiss her one more time, but I became a statue stalled in fear. Nadine's chest rose and fell rapidly. Her eyes were practically begging for it. My dick wasn't cooperating either as it hardened in my jeans. What I wouldn't give to get rid of the clothes between us. I swallowed and my voice lowered to a soft whisper. Every time I'm near you, Nadine, I just want to kiss you. Nadine inhaled a sharp breath. She wrapped her hands around my back, pulling me closer until her breasts were pressed against my chest. Images of the night at the lake flashed through my mind. I wanted to be back there, to feel her skin on mine again. Nadine's breath wavered. So kiss me, Lucas. By the goddess, I almost did. Then all these warning bells went off in my mind, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. I couldn't keep hurting her. I stepped back and dropped my hands from Nadine's face. I'm sorry, Nadine, but I can't. Look what happened last time I kissed you. Nadine laughed, but it wasn't the kind of laugh where she was having fun. It was like she couldn't believe what I was suggesting. You mean I got sick? Exactly, I said. The curse causes illness the closer we get physically. Nadine blew out an exasperated breath and spoke firmly. Let me make something very clear. I have lupus. I am sick all the time. Nothing you do now or ever will change that. This is not your fault. But what if... Exactly, Lucas. She cut me off. You're basing this all on what if. Well, I have a question for you. What if Lucas Taylor just wanted to be my friend? What if we just hung out and <gasps> he didn't expect sex from me? I gaped at her. Is that what she thought? That I believed hanging out with her meant she owed me sex? I didn't expect a damn thing from her. I'd love it if we could just be friends, Nadine, I said harshly. But how can we do that when you keep leading me on? You're the one who tried to kiss me at the lake. You just asked me to kiss you now. Do you get some sort of thrill out of this? Thrill? She bit. Oh, fuck. I was making this worse. Right now, it was hard to keep my mouth shut after what she just accused me of. 
It's like you're addicted to danger or something, I accused. Like you're trying to see just how far you can push it, just like you did when you followed the tarantulas. Her eyes went wide, like she couldn't believe I'd throw that in her face. I went after them because of what they did to you, because I care. I rolled my eyes. Don't say stuff like that, Nade. She scoffed. Why not? It's true. I raked my fingers through my hair. For the first time since I met her, I was seriously frustrated with Nadine. It's not true, I insisted. People don't care about me. She gaped at me like I'd just insulted her. Are you serious right now? Grant cares. Professor Warren cares. I'm standing right here telling you I care, and you still can't believe it? No, I can't, I growled. I can't believe you would put yourself at risk just to be with me. She pursed her lips. Maybe I would. Why? I cried. You know the risks of getting involved with me, and you'd still want to take things further? Maybe you're worth it, she argued, fuming. But I'm not. The further we go, the sicker you get. You must love the pain. The hall went dead silent. For a second, it was as if time stood still. Then I realized what I said, and my stomach dropped. Nadine's lips pressed into a thin line. You think I like being in pain? You think I'd like being disabled? I sighed. Come on, Nate, I didn't mean... Screw you, Lucas! Nadine spat. You don't know me at all! Nadine slammed her shoulder into mine as she stomped off into the cafeteria to eat lunch alone. My heart felt like it was breaking into a million pieces, and that heavy stone in my stomach had all but consumed me. I guess I didn't have to worry about avoiding Nadine anymore. I'd done exactly like Grant suggested, and been a complete ass. Nadine would be the one to avoid me from now on. I tossed and turned all night. How could I have acted like such an idiot? Jerk. Total and complete asshole. That's what I was, and I hated myself for it. I wanted to do better. I wanted to be a better person, but I didn't know how. My eyes shot open in the darkness to the most excruciating nausea I'd felt since I'd heard the kid. I curled into a ball on my bed, waiting for the thought to come and the nausea to pass. I bet no one will notice. They never cared anyhow. Ah, oh, fuck, not another suicide. I tossed the covers off myself and made a beeline for the bathroom, but I didn't make it that far. I doubled over at the trash can and heaved. The stench of puke filled the room, and Grant stirred in his bed as I made gagging sounds. I never handled suicides well, but this one was particularly taxing. It echoed the exact thoughts I'd had when I considered offing myself. No! I screamed at myself internally. I didn't let myself think about that. I'd decided long ago I wouldn't go back down that road. I had to take my mind off it somehow, so I crawled back into bed and put my headphones in to listen to music. But tonight, even the heavy beats that usually drowned out my thoughts didn't work. I hated myself. And it wasn't just because of my gift. Even if I got rid of it, it wouldn't fix the way I felt about myself. Nothing could. In that moment, I truly meant it. I had no hope. I didn't want hope. Without it, I could never be disappointed. I wished I could have said I slept that night. But I didn't. I just lay there shivering in a ball as the darkness of my own mind closed in around me. I hated feeling this way, but I deserved it. I didn't know how much time passed, but eventually I heard the sound of the door slamming and Grant squealing as he came into the room. I hadn't even noticed he left. I groaned as I pulled the blanket down from my head. The daylight coming through the window was blinding. 
What the? Grant ran across the room and jumped on his bed a few times. He didn't even notice me. He ran back to the door and double-checked the people for goddess knows what. Grant, jeez, I sighed, trying to find my bearings as I stirred awake. What's going on? You're acting like a girl. Grant's eyes went wide. What are you still doing in bed? I pressed my hand to my pulsing forehead. Don't feel well. What happened? Grant bit his lower lip. I was going to serenade Talia. I had everything set up in the lounge, and I was going to play the grand piano and everything. You can't play piano, I reminded him flatly. But I chickened out, Grant groaned, like he hadn't even heard me. I rolled my eyes and threw the covers back over my head. So try again and don't chicken out this time. You don't get it, Grant said. Ugh, I'm a total fool. I shrugged. At least he and Talia were still on good terms. He wasn't a total loser like me. He didn't know how good he had it. Grant sighed and stomped out of the room. Thank the goddess for some peace and quiet. Except, I quickly realized the peace and quiet was just as excruciating, if not more. My thoughts were racing far too quickly, burying myself into a deeper, darker hole than I was already in. I knew the only way to drag myself out of it was to get out of bed. I told myself that all I had to do today was take a shower, but I couldn't even manage to do that much. It wasn't until late afternoon when I finally decided I couldn't hold my piss any longer and dragged myself out of bed. After showering, I eyed the bed. It called to me, but I knew if I crawled back under the sheets, I might not get out for a week. I decided to leave my room and grab some takeout from the cafeteria. I wasn't really hungry, but I could practically hear my mother's voice in my head. Do they feed you at that college, Lucas? You're getting too skinny. Speaking of my mother, today was as good a day as any to visit her. I hadn't seen her all semester, and I knew Dad would be down at the bar drinking away his troubles before he had to go back to work for the week. I left the school and let my feet carry me home. I wasn't really watching where I was going or paying attention to how long it took me. Even the chill of the October air didn't register. Eventually, the small black house came into view. My family's little three-bedroom was nothing compared to the elaborate Gothic houses along the main stretch of the road through town. Ours shared the same architecture, but was practically a dollhouse compared to the other houses in town. I breathed a sigh of relief when I didn't see Dad's car in the driveway. Mom didn't have her own car, but I bet she was home anyway. Dad never let her go anywhere on her own. I didn't knock. Even after all this time, it didn't seem right. I opened the front door and my mother gasped. Lucas, don't come in. But it was too late. I'd already witnessed the damage. Across the living room and through the kitchen doorway, I saw my mother on her knees. Huge chunks of glass lay at her feet, surrounded by a giant splatter of shepherd's pie and little drops of blood. My stomach bottomed out. I rushed over to her, kneeling at her side to help clean up. By the looks of things, I'd just missed my father. Mom, I sighed, looking down to the broken dish and her wrapped up hand. A casserole dish? What was his problem this time? The casserole was too salty? Not salted enough? No, she said, wiping her gauzed hand across her nose. It was my fault. I dropped it and cut my hand cleaning up. She could tell me that all she wanted, but I'd never believe it. What terrified me was that she actually believed it herself. You don't have to lie to me, Mom, I said as I placed broken bits of glass in the garbage beside us. I remember how he is. My mother pressed her lips together, but she continued to clean up as an excuse not to meet my gaze. You don't remember him as well as you think, Lucas. We had good times, too but you choose to focus only on the bad. Why do you demonize him so much? I gaped at her as I tore a wad of paper towel from the roll. Because he's a jackass, Mom. Before I could blink, my mother huffed and snatched the paper towel from my hand. She looked as if she might slap me, though I knew she'd never lay a hand on me. How dare you? She snapped, catching me off guard. How dare you talk about your father like that? You know he can't control it. My breath grew hot. How could she keep telling herself that after all this time? 
Of course he can, Mom. I shot back at her. He tells you that so you'll excuse his behavior. I do not excuse it, she argued. I sighed. Mom hadn't changed at all these past few months. She was still in denial, and no matter how much I tried to tell her otherwise, or how much space I gave her, there was nothing I could do. I guess I thought that I could change her mind somehow. It was just another person's burden I carried. She was so deep in denial, she didn't even know the burden was there. I took a deep breath and placed my hand on Mom's shoulder to get her to look at me. She sniffed and glanced up. Mom, you know I'll always be here for you, right? The crease between her eyebrows deepened. No, Lucas, I don't. I haven't seen you in months, and then you show up here out of the blue just to insult your father? I don't want to hear it. I froze in place. My own mother didn't want me around? She preferred my sorry excuse of a dad to me? Tears brimmed Mom's eyes, and she placed a hand over her mouth so I wouldn't hear her sobs. Hey, Mom, I said softly, reaching out to her. She shrugged me off. It's just so hard to see you here, Lucas, she admitted. I've already come to terms with the fact that my son is dead. My guts twisted. I know, Mom. We've all dealt with Eric's death in different ways. Mom shook her head and placed her hand on the side of my face. Not Eric, Lucas. You. The night we lost Eric, it was like... Like we lost you, too. Every muscle in my body tensed. Her words were like a knife through my heart. Maybe I hadn't been lying to myself all this time. Maybe it was true that no one wanted me around anymore. Chapter 14 Nadine Lucas Taylor was a jerk. I couldn't believe I fell for him. And yet, at the same time... I couldn't stop thinking about him. I flipped between the two moods so quickly it could give me whiplash. No, no, he's definitely a jerk. I tried to put him out of my mind in demonology the following week. Today we move into our unit on demon deals, Professor Daniels announced. She was a middle-aged woman with flowing brown hair and a beautiful Bengal cat that lounged on her desk every lesson. Before we begin, let me lead off with a warning. The one and only reason we cover this unit is to warn you of the dangers of making deals with demons. I will not be teaching you how to summon a demon, and I strongly advise you never do so. The consequences can be dire. A shiver ran down my spine. Though I'd never seen a demon before, my mind brought up horrible images of creepy, black-eyed men, the spirits of those who followed evil gods. In my head, they were followed by demonic monsters. Professor Daniels had shown us drawings of some of the monsters, and I hoped to never encounter one in my life. They were terrible creatures, created by the gods or mutated from magical creatures. There were canines that were nothing more than skin and bones, creatures with the skull of a deer for a head, and three-headed lions with black manes and golden eyes. She didn't have to tell me twice. I wouldn't be caught dead summoning one of those things. As we all know, our history is rooted in the summoning of demons. Professor Daniels continued. With demon blood in our ancestry, it is easier for Miriamic people to summon demons than it is to summon other spirits, as the demons are more willing to show up. That said, demons only appear when they can strike a deal that will benefit them. Someone spoke up from behind me, though I didn't see who. But what about Santos? He helped Mother Miriam even though there was nothing in it for him. Professor Daniels cocked an eyebrow. Is that something you'd wish to risk? Demon deals always come with a price. I raised my hand. I was too curious not to get in the middle of a discussion. What kind of price? Can you give an example? Chloe shot me a scowl from across the room. 
What, I wasn't allowed to talk now? I ignored her. Professor Daniels hesitated, then cleared her throat. An extreme example might be making a deal for more magic. This kind of deal would require... She hesitated and got a faraway look in her eye. Well, it'd require a soul. My muscles tensed. There was something deep and dark in her tone that suggested such a thing was worse than giving up your own soul. Almost like... Like you'd have to kill to make the deal. Who could do such a vile thing like that? Headmistress Verla called me into her office that afternoon. She stood from her desk and straightened her blazer when I walked in. Odin purred from his spot on her desk. Nadine, I'm so glad we finally get to prepare for your evoking ceremony. Have a seat. She gestured to a chair across from her. My hands shook as I sat. I shouldn't have been so nervous, but I was. My evoking ceremony would determine my magic and where I fit within the coven. I couldn't mess this up. Headmistress Verla rounded her desk and leaned against the corner, placing her hands in her lap. I'm sorry we had to cancel our previous lesson. How are things going here at school? I relaxed a little as she spoke in a casual tone. They're fine. My history class is a lot to take in, but I'm really enjoying all the others. The corners of her lips turned into a frown. Is that something I can help with? I could set you up with a tutor. No, I said quickly, though I appreciated the kind gesture. Let's get started, then. She returned to her seat behind her desk and stroked Odin's fur. He closed his eyes and swished his tail, enjoying the gentle massage. Let's begin with any questions you have. It'll help me get a feel for what we need to cover. Headmistress Verla spoke to me like I was her equal. I should have felt better about it, but it put me on edge. Did I perhaps remind her too much of my mother? I didn't want to think about my mom, so I pushed the thought out of my head. What exactly happens during an evoking ceremony? I asked. Headmistress Verla gave a bright smile, like she was happy to answer the question. It's quite simple, really. You'll lie on the ground in a circle of five candles, one to represent each of the castes. Another witch will perform the ceremony by repeating an incantation. Who will that be? I asked. You? She gave a slight nod. If you want it to be, but you can ask anyone you choose, as long as they've already been through their ceremony. Your grandmother, for instance, would be a perfect example. I let out a deep breath. I'd really like for Grammy to be there with me. Can other people be there, or just the one witch? You can invite anyone, she answered. Some witches throw huge parties for their ceremonies, while others prefer to keep it strictly to family and friends. I was already forming a list in my mind of who I wanted to be there, but the list pretty much stopped at Grammy, Talia, and Grant. Lucas's face flashed through my mind for a second, then I remembered that I was mad at him. I shifted in my chair. What happens after the incantation is spoken? You will fall into a trance, Verla explained. This trance is so deep you won't even realize you're in it. Then how can I prepare? I balked. Nerves ignited deep within my belly. How could I pass the test if I didn't know I was being tested? Verla held up a hand to calm me down. Nothing to fear, Nadine. If your heart is in the right place, you will pass. I swallowed. What if my heart wasn't in the right place? I didn't even know what that meant. What if... I trailed off. I had so many questions I didn't even know which one to start with. Verla raised a curious eyebrow, and I nodded my hands in my lap. 
What if I decide not to do it? Verla frowned. Why wouldn't you go through with your evoking ceremony, Nadine? Because I'm scared. I don't want to fail. I can't let Grammy down. Instead, I just shrugged. If you don't go through with this, you won't receive your powers, Verla stated. Is my birthday my only chance? I asked. Verla pressed her lips together and nodded regrettably. It's the one and only night the veil lifts for you and allows you to contact Mother Miriam. Contacting her on any other night would be nigh on impossible. A knot formed in my chest. Usually I wasn't so afraid to take chances, but this was different. This was terrifying. Verla eyed me, and her features softened. Nadine, what's wrong? Perhaps I can ease some of your worry. My eyes locked on her cat so I wouldn't have to meet her gaze. I took a moment to breathe, then forced the confession out. What if... what if I don't have the power to be part of the coven? Verla furrowed her brow. What do you mean? I forced down the lump in my throat as my anxiety reached the surface. Well, I'm only half witch. My mom was a witch and my dad was a human, right? So what if I don't have enough power to pass Mother Miriam's test? Amusement crossed Verla's features for a moment before settling into a sympathetic expression. I assure you, Nadine, Mother Miriam doesn't work that way. As long as you have her blood running through your veins, she will accept you as any other. When a witch has a child with a human, their children have the same potential as the parent. You can be just as strong of an alchemist as your mother, Nadine. You think I'll get alchemy? I asked. It runs in your family, she stated. Mother Miriam almost always assigns families to the same cast, as the coven is very family-oriented. In some instances, she may assign you a different cast, if she sees fit, but it's quite rare. What about if the parents are from different castes? I questioned. Can you end up in two? Verla shook her head. No. There's never been a witch or warlock assigned to more than one cast. Mother Miriam will pick the one that's the best fit for you, regardless. So what do I have to do to become an alchemist? I asked. I'd like to run you through a few scenarios, Verla said. Of course, we can't predict what scenarios Mother Miriam will put you in, but we can... My heart leapt into my throat as Odin jumped to his feet and let out a terrifying meow that sounded more like a scream. His back arched and his hair stood on end. Verla gasped as Odin jumped off the desk and tore across the room like he was being chased. He ran around in circles, crying out like he was in pain. My stomach bottomed out as I watched the creature sprint from one end of the room to the other. A chill ran down my spine as he yowled. Before I could really process what was happening, Odin's head slammed into the wall, and he slumped to the ground. Good goddess! Verla cried. She leapt out of her chair and rushed over to Odin's limp form. She cradled him in her arms. Meanwhile, I was still trying to process what had happened. It was like he'd been possessed or something. I cautiously stood and draped my bag over my shoulder. Is he okay? Headmistress Verla kept her head down, and she stroked Odin's black fur. She shook him, but he didn't move. I... I have no idea what happened. She lifted her gaze to mine, and her features were so heartbreaking it made me want to cry. I'm sorry, Nadine, but... I've got to get Odin to the infirmary. We'll have to reschedule again. Don't apologize, I said, my heart still hammering. Go take care of your cat. Headmistress Verla hurried out of the room with Odin cradled in her arms. 
I slumped out of the office behind her, thinking how strange and out of the blue that all was. And then it hit me. Maybe it wasn't so random after all. Curling my hands into fists, I headed down the hall in the opposite direction that headmistress Verla had gone. When I passed by the lounge, I spotted the lucky three inside. They were sitting in the coveted chairs around the biggest TV. Chloe had her feet up on the coffee table and was inspecting her nails. It's been two weeks since my last manicure, she complained. I totally need a new one. Let me see, Camille offered, holding out her hand. My nostrils flared as I stomped into the lounge toward them. It was you, wasn't it? I growled. Chloe turned from Camille and looked up at me with utter disgust. What are you going on about? A few people in a nearby seating area looked our way, but I didn't care. I crossed my arms. What was it this time? Some poison slipped into Odin's food bowl this morning? A curse one of your friends cast on him? Chloe rolled her eyes and stood so that she was a mere step away from me. I seriously don't know what you mean. I narrowed my gaze at her. I know you had help. You don't have magic of your own yet. Chloe faked a frown and spoke in a mocking tone. Oh, dear. Didn't you know I don't need magic to get my way? Screw you, I growled. I wanted to rip her hair out, but with two other girls behind her, I didn't think it'd get me anywhere. You can mess with me all you want, but you don't get to touch other people or their cats. Chloe chuckled, but her laughter instantly died as she stepped forward. She was so close that our noses almost touched. You don't make the rules. Oh yeah? I growled. We'll see about that. I turned on my heel and stomped away from her, fuming. Chloe's laughter echoed through the room. You can't touch me, Nadine, but have fun trying. Oh, bitch, I will. I didn't really know where I was going until I passed through the main foyer and saw Talia. She clutched her books tightly to her chest with one hand. She held the other out in the direction of a very tall, very handsome warlock. He must have been a senior, but she looked up at him with dreamy eyes like he was a god. He had dark hair that fell into his eyes and a strong jawline. He traced his finger over her hand as she giggled. And this line here means you've got a hot date coming up, he teased. On Friday night, with me. Talia snickered. Well, the palm doesn't lie. I guess I can't say no. I furrowed my brow as I approached. What's going on? Talia finally tore her gaze away from the guy. Oh, Nadine, this is Cody. He was just... I was just enjoying Talia's company, he said slowly, deliberately. He didn't take his eyes off her when he spoke. She practically drooled. That's great, but I kind of need you right now, Tal, I said. Talia's face fell when she noticed my tight expression. Yeah, sure. I'll see you later, Cody. See you. He winked at her and walked away. Talia turned to me. What's wrong? Wrong with me? I balked. Who is that guy? What about Grant? Talia shrugged. I can't wait around for him forever. Cody asked me out, then I said yes. I frowned. That was too bad. I was rooting for her and Grant. Never mind that, she said. What's up with you? Chloe, I scoffed, like that explained everything. I looped my arm through hers. We need to gather the girls. It's time to raise some hell. Are you sure this is safe, Amy? Mandy asked as the four of us gathered around a cauldron in one of the alchemy labs. Totally, Amy assured us. She pulled her dark hair into a ponytail. 
though that depends on your definition of safe. Mandy was sitting on one of the tables, swinging her feet beneath her and tapping the tabletop with her long, manicured fingernails. She blew a bubble with her gum, and the pop sounded throughout the empty room. What's your definition? Amy chewed her lower lip. Well, it's not going to hurt Chloe, but it will give her some serious nightmares. I picked up various ingredients Amy had signed out from the supply closet and began reading their labels. My guts twisted as I thought about what we were going to do to her. I mean, Chloe deserved it, but was it worth it to stoop to her level? She'd done the same thing when she asked Amy to help her brew a revenge potion. My hesitation passed quickly, as I reminded myself that getting back at Chloe was the only way to stop her from sabotaging my lessons. If I didn't ruin this bitch, I wasn't going to make it through my evoking ceremony. How does it work? I asked. Once it's brewed, we'll sprinkle the potion in front of her dorm room door, Amy explained. When she crosses the line, it will trigger night terrors. Talia rubbed her hands together and smiled mischievously. How long does this stuff last? Amy pressed her lips together and thought, a few weeks, maybe? Perfect, I said. Let's make it real potent. I want to scare her panties off. Ew, no, Mandy joked. Let's keep those on. I've heard horror stories from Ryan. Talia chuckled. Do you think this is good enough payback? Or should we, like, make our hair fall out? In patches, I added. Or boils, Mandy teased. She could cover up the bald spots with a wig. Let's give her something she can't hide. Ooh, or hair, like all over her body. Talia laughed. Like Bigfoot. I snickered. How about a beard? Come on now, Amy joked. You're getting a little out of my pay grade here. I calmed my laughter. Okay, nightmares it is. Perfect, Amy said. Nadine, I need an extra hand. Talia, can you get me a spoon from the wall over there? What about me? Mandy asked. Amy smirked. You can just sit there and look pretty. Mandy lay on the tabletop with her head propped up on her elbow and the other hand on her hip. She batted her eyelashes. Like this? Amy's eyes roamed over her. That's perfect. Here, Nadine. I need you to pour these two vials into the cauldron the same time I do these two. We have to pour at the same rate. Got it? Got it. I took the vials of liquid from her hands. One vial read basilisk venom, while the other read cockatrice blood. A shiver ran down my spine. Neither of those sounded like friendly creatures. Here you go. Tali returned holding a big wooden spoon. Perfect, Amy said. Can you stir while we pour? Sure. Talia stood beside me and placed the spoon inside the cauldron. As Amy and I poured our vials together, Talia began stirring. A strong, putrid stench filled the lab, and dark gray steam started to rise from the cauldron. Mandy sat up straight and pinched her nose. Is it supposed to do that? Sure is, Amy said brightly, looking proud. The smell will go away once we finish brewing. She picked up another container full of dried herbs. She took a pinch and sprinkled it into the brew. It turned a thick, murky black, and big bubbles started snapping in the bottom of the cauldron like tar. A thrill went through me when I realized I was brewing my first potion. Amy added another spoonful of dried herbs, and the potion instantly cleared. It became thin and looked a lot like tomato juice. Amy took the spoon from Talia's hands and stirred while she waved her hand over the top of the steaming cauldron and muttered an incantation under her breath. Mandy watched in deep interest. She noticed my eyes on her and said, She's really good, isn't she? I nodded. Amy finished the incantation. She leaned over the cauldron and inhaled deeply. That's more like it. 
That was it? Talia asked, looking impressed. Amy scooped a spoonful of potion into an empty vial and held it up. That's all there is to it. Who wants to do the honors? To say I was excited to see Chloe get what was coming to her was an understatement. She'd used Amy to try to turn Mandy into a frog, torn apart mine and Talia's room, sabotaged my lesson with Headmistress Verla, then went after Verla's cat. She deserved every ounce of terror she got in her sleep tonight. I'd been given the honors of pouring the potion over the carpet in front of Chloe's dorm while my friends kept watch. No one spotted us, and we hurried away before we could get caught. Talia and I invited Amy and Mandy to stay in our dorm, in case anything interesting happened. It turned into a full-on slumber party, with pizza, manicures, and guy talk. Amy's cat, Stormy, and Talia's cat, Gus, snuggled up together on Talia's bed. Mandy had twisted my hair into a pair of French braids, and she was working on painting Amy's nails. Talia stood in front of the mirror, pushing her boobs up to see how much cleavage she could get out of them. Do you guys think I should wear a push-up bra on my date with Cody on Friday? Talia asked. Or is that just setting him up for disappointment? Mandy laughed. That depends. He can only get disappointed if he sees what's underneath the bra. Or feels it, Amy added. See, that's the thing, Talia said. I don't know if things are going to go that far or not. Should I play it safe? I looked up from filing my nails. If you want to play it safe, you're going to want to bring the condom box with you. Hold up, Mandy said. Condom box? Talia smirked and went to her dresser. She opened her jewelry box and a bunch of condoms spilled out. Yep, we had to restock after the lucky three trashed our room. Oh, that explains all the condoms, Amy said. Either of you need one? Talia offered. Mandy scoffed. That would be a miracle right now. I'm going through a serious dry spell. You? Talia held out a condom toward Amy. Amy crinkled her nose from where she sat on the floor. That's kind of useless for a girl like me. What do you mean? Talia asked. Amy raised her eyebrows. I thought you knew. Talia tilted her head to the side. Knew what? That I like girls. Amy glanced from Talia's shocked face to mine. She burst out in laughter. Oh, goddess, you guys, you should see your faces. I quickly righted my expression. I didn't mean to assume anything. No, it's fine, Amy assured me. I really thought you guys knew, just as long as you're still my friends. Of course we are, Talia said, placing the condoms back in the jewelry box. It just means more condoms for us. Amy chuckled. You can have all the condoms you need, girl. I'm not going to use them. Before anyone else could say anything, a high-pitched scream echoed down the hall. It shocked me at first, but my pulse quickly slowed as a proud smile spread over my face. Looks like it's showtime. Talia smiled mischievously and headed for the door. Mandy screwed on the cap to the nail polish, and Amy blew on her fingers. We all followed behind Talia as she opened the door. Down the hall, we could hear the sound of doors swinging open. Gwen rushed out of one of the dorm rooms as the scream came again. She pounded on the door next to hers and shook the handle. Chloe? Chloe, what's going on? Camille stepped out of the room behind Gwen in nothing but tiny shorts and a skimpy tank top. What was that? Chloe! Gwen screamed again, pounding on the door. Chloe's door swung open. She looked like a total mess, with no makeup on and her hair in disarray. Her silk nightgown hung off her at an odd angle. What in the hell are you doing, Gwen? It's like one in the morning. Gwen blinked a few times in shock. You were screaming. I thought... You thought wrong, Chloe snapped. Her eyes scanned the hallway, and she noticed a bunch of girls watching curiously. 
She raised her voice. What are you looking at? Go back to sleep, losers! A few people murmured to their roommates as they shut the doors. I, on the other hand, stepped out into the hall and crossed my arms. I leaned against my doorframe, proudly admiring our handiwork. Are you okay? Camille asked Chloe. Yeah, just a bad dream, Chloe admitted. I haven't had a dream like that in... She cut off as she noticed me standing there. She pushed past Gwen and Camille, her nostrils flaring. What did you do, Nadine? Me? I asked innocently. Whatever do you mean, Chloe? Mandy and Amy snickered from behind me. You cursed my sleep! She accused, pointing a finger in my direction. A few girls were still peeking through the cracks in the doors. Good. Let them enjoy the show. I hoped Chloe looked as crazy to them as she did to me in that moment. It was so satisfying to watch her stand there, shaking. I tilted my head to the side. How could I do that, Chloe? I don't have magic yet. She turned her angry gaze on Amy. It was her! Me? Amy fiend. You really think I'd do anything to you after you kidnapped my cat and threatened to kill her? Chloe's eyes darted from door to door. She noticed a few onlookers. I would never threaten a cat, Amy. Everyone knows that. Heat flared deep in my belly. No way was she getting away with such a bold-faced lie. I straightened and stepped forward. Really? Is that why Headmistress Verla's cat is in the infirmary? Oh, wait, let me guess. That wasn't you either? Chloe cocked an eyebrow, but she couldn't hide the fury etched in her features. I told you I don't know anything about that. Too bad you're not a very good liar, I said. Chloe's features hardened. She seemed to forget about all the other onlookers. Fine, Nadine. You want to curse me with nightmares? I'll show you just how much of a nightmare I can be. She whirled around and stomped back toward her room. Camille and Gwen stepped forward to join her, but Chloe slammed the door in their faces. When I turned back to my friends, Talia's eyebrows were raised. Wow, she's really intense, isn't she? I shrugged. Doesn't matter to me. I'm not scared of her. I heard you and Chloe went at it the other night, Grant said to me after class on Friday. I hadn't meant to meet up with Grant again, but he happened to be sitting in the same study area in the main foyer I usually sat in after introduction to Tarot. I scoffed as I settled into one of the plush red chairs. Believe me, if we went at it, she'd have a chunk of hair missing. Honestly, I couldn't believe she'd gone all week without retaliating. At least Verla's cat was back to normal, but I still didn't know what Chloe might do next. I'd been watching my back for days, and she had yet to strike. I figured it was all part of some elaborate plan to put me on edge. It was working. Between my feud with Chloe and everything going on with Lucas, I barely had a chance to breathe all week. I didn't want to ask Grant about Lucas, so I asked about Talia instead. So when are you planning to ask Talia out? Grant frowned. About three weeks ago? Every time I get close, I chicken out. Why? Because she already rejected me once, he admitted. I sat straighter in my chair. What? When? On move-in day, he reminded me. I asked her out, and she said we should all go out for muffins instead. I'm afraid she'll reject me again. I wouldn't call that a rejection, I told him. She's been waiting for you to ask her out again and has gotten sick of waiting. She's got a date with some guy named Cody tonight. Grant groaned. Cody White, are you kidding me? How am I supposed to compete with him? Grant sank down in his chair. She never would have gone for me anyway if she's got guys like Cody asking her out. Hey, don't say that, I scolded. 
Grant ran his fingers through his dark hair. Damn it. I missed my chance, didn't I? No, I reassured him. She can't date him forever. You don't know that, he grumbled. Grant's eyes went wide as they connected with something behind me. He sank even further in his chair until he was practically hiding. What? I turned around to see what he was looking at. Speak of the devil, he murmured. My eyes landed on Talia. She looked really cute in a casual red dress that fell to her knees and black boots. She wore her hair up in a high ponytail. Cody walked alongside her and tugged playfully at the ponytail. You look like a freshman with your hair up, he told her. You should wear it down. Tali reached up and touched her ponytail. You think so? Yeah, you'd look so much hotter, he said. Here, let me show you. He reached into her hair and pulled the elastic out of it. Talia's hair fell around her shoulders. She ran her fingers through the strands to straighten them. How's this? Perfect, Cody said, shooting her a smile. Let's get out of here. Can I have my elastic back? Talia asked. Cody looped it over his wrist. And risk you putting your hair back up? No way. It's mine for the night. Talia walked alongside Cody toward the doors. She noticed us as she was passing and waved. Good luck, I mouthed. As soon as Talia was out the door, Grant straightened. What a jackass. I raised an eyebrow at him. Is someone a little jealous? Grant's face fell. That's not what I meant. The way he took her ponytail down like that? It's an asshole thing to do. It was harmless, I argued. Grant crossed his arms. If I were dating Talia, I'd let her wear her hair any way she chooses. Before I could respond, Grant's face fell as his eyes connected with something else across the foyer. Uh-oh. I turned to see Lucas across the room. My heart lifted in my chest, then started pounding furiously. I hadn't seen him since that day I snapped at him by the cafeteria. I hoped he didn't come over here to talk to Grant. I didn't know what to say to him. And then I saw her. I didn't know who she was, but she was walking alongside Lucas and laughing. She was a tall blonde with legs that went for miles and a tiny little waist. Her hair flowed around her in perfect curls. She looked like she belonged on the runway. Who's that? I asked Grant before I could stop myself. Lena? He asked. She's nobody, a necromancer in one of his classes. They're writing a paper together. Grant said it like it should have eased my nerves, but it did the exact opposite. If she's nobody, why did you say, uh-oh, when you saw them? I demanded. Grant bit his lower lip. Because Lucas told me you two got into a fight. If you want my opinion, I don't, thanks. I snapped. I felt bad as soon as I said it. I didn't mean to take my frustrations out on Grant, but seeing Lucas with Lena made this red-hot jealousy ignite inside of me that I didn't know was there. I'd never met Lena, and I already wanted to slip a potion into her lunch that would turn her into a frog. I mean, the girl was too pretty for her own good. There was no way she and Lucas were just writing a paper together. They look awfully comfortable together. I tried to keep the bitterness from my voice, but it didn't work. Grant shrugged. Well, yeah, they went out in high school. My body went rigid, and Grant noticed. He was quick to add, But they weren't serious, not like that. I wasn't sure I believed him. The way Lena looked at Lucas, it was like she still had feelings for him. Fresh feelings. Lena threw her head back in laughter at something Lucas said, though I didn't hear what it was. She reached out and casually touched his arm. My teeth ground together. Lucas's gaze darted in my direction, and my heart jumped as our eyes locked. He looked away quickly and pretended like he hadn't seen me but it had been clear as day. 
Lucas reached out for Lena's hand, and my jaw dropped. He entwined his fingers in hers and whispered something I couldn't hear. It felt as if time stood still, but I must have been the only one frozen in time, because Lucas and Lena continued up the grand staircase, hand in hand. Grant gasped from behind me. Lucas shot one last glance over his shoulder, and he looked straight into my shocked eyes. It was in that moment that I realized he'd done it on purpose. I could feel a fault form in my heart at the blatant rejection. I took back what I said about Lucas being a jerk. Rubbing this rejection in my face to intentionally hurt me entered entirely new territory. Congratulations, Lucas Taylor. You've just graduated to full-level asshole. Chapter 15. Lucas. I saw the way Nadine looked at me when I passed through the main foyer with Lena. Her expression was full of longing, but it quickly shifted to an unadulterated loathing when she spotted Lena at my side. I couldn't explain it, but that look in her eyes tore my fucking heart in two. I hated how much I'd hurt her, but I had to protect her. And so I did what I had to do to keep her away. I grabbed Lena's hand. Nadine's features darkened and a heavy weight dropped on my stomach, but I couldn't back down now. Nadine had to know we could never be anything more than friends. If acting like an asshole was what got her to get over me, then I'd do it. Just go with it, I leaned over and whispered to Lena. Lena smiled back at me as we started up the stairs. Just go with it, Lucas? Are you flirting? Believe me, I said. You'd know it if I was flirting. Lena batted her eyelashes at me and my stomach sank. I didn't want anything to do with Lena. But here I was, holding her hand. I really was a jerk, wasn't I? I watched for Nadine over the following week, but I didn't see her. I was pretty sure she was the one avoiding me now. It was probably for the best. On Thursday, I stayed in bed, my head buried under the pillow. It was Halloween, a sacred holiday for the coven, which meant we had off school for the festivities, but all I wanted to do was sleep. That's it, Grant said from across the room. I was awake, just not moving. It's time for you to get out of bed. Grant grabbed my ankle and tugged. I jerked it away. Get off me, man, I snapped. You're not my mother. Not like I'd let my mom drag me out of bed either. It's Halloween, Grant emphasized. You have to get out of bed. I pulled my pillow off my head and rubbed my eyes. Grant stood beside my bed in a suit and cape. His hair was slicked back and he wore fake vampire fangs. You're ready already? I groaned. The festival isn't until dark. Grant shrugged. No, but there's plenty to do before then. We could hit up Main Street and shop the sales. That crowd is worse than Black Friday, I complained. But we can get free cider, Grant exclaimed. He was way too fucking cheerful. Didn't he realize this day was all about the dead? It was too depressing to handle. I don't want free cider, I grumbled, putting the pillow back over my head. Grant yanked it off me. You have to at least eat something today. Not hungry, I told him. My stomach felt hollow, but I didn't want to eat. Grant eyed me curiously, and his tone softened. Dude, what's up with you? Last year you couldn't wait for Halloween. I pulled the blanket up over my head. Last year was different. Why? Grant asked. I didn't answer. Grant huffed. He grabbed my blanket and tore it off from me, throwing it onto the floor. It was really cold without it, so I curled up into a ball to stay warm. Lucas, talk to me, Grant demanded in a harsh tone. I don't want to talk about it, I told him. I'm your best friend, man, he said. Let me help you. I swallowed the lump in my throat and turned my gaze up to him. Thinking about what this day meant only made my guts twist but Grant wasn't going to give up until I gave him something. I pushed myself upright in bed. 
I'm not sure I want to attend the festival tonight. Is this about your gift? Grant asked. It was obvious by his tone. He worried I'd faced too much death this past year and didn't want to celebrate. But that wasn't it at all. I shook my head. Then what? Grant asked, spreading his arms out in question. You love Halloween. The hay rides, the apple bobbing, the costume contest. You could even go to one of those seer booths and... Grant stopped in his tracks and realization crossed his eyes. Oh, he said flatly, eyeing the fallen expression on my face. You don't want anything to do with the spirits today. I curled my arms around myself because it felt like my guts would spill out otherwise. There's a reason I haven't gone to a psychic since he died. The words felt heavier than I thought they would. He died. Eric was gone. I knew it, and still it was hard to wrap my head around, because he wasn't totally gone. His spirit was out there somewhere. I was just too afraid to figure out where. You don't want to talk to him, Grant whispered, sinking into a spot on the couch. It's not that, I told him. It's just... I hesitated. I wasn't good at sharing my feelings. With Grant, we could talk about girls and crap like that, but I couldn't talk about the heavy stuff. I couldn't talk about my brother. The truth was, Eric hadn't reached out to me in the past year. If he wanted to talk to me, he could have contacted a medium and relayed a message. But he hadn't which either meant he was at peace with everything that happened, or he ended up in the abyss. It was easier to believe he was at peace. I'd rather not seek out confirmation. You don't have to visit a seer, Grant said. Just dress up and go to the festival with me. That's all I ask. I shrugged. I don't know, Grant. I'm not feeling very festive. Here's an idea, Grant said brightly. The veil's thin tonight, which makes seances super easy. You'll get an A for sure. I cocked an eyebrow at him. You want to help me do a seance for my afterlife studies class? For sure, Grant said. It'll be fun, and you have to do it sometime this semester. I sighed. I guess you're right, but I don't have a costume. Grant smiled. I have the perfect thing. Grant's idea of perfect was far from my definition. I lifted the hem of the robe I wore, ready to tear the freaking thing off, because I couldn't stop tripping over it. It was one of the black robes we wore the night of Nadine's initiation. Grant said I should dress as a reaper. Not cool, I'd told him rather harshly. I didn't mean it as a joke, Grant promised. It's an easy costume. I grumbled about it all day before finally giving in. At least I could hide beneath the hood. It was dark by the time we finally left the dorm. I held the celestite stone Nadine had given me in my hand. It was supposed to calm me, and our goddess knew I needed some serious help in that area. So far it didn't seem to be working. I slipped the stone in my pocket and instead focused on not tripping over my robe. Who the fuck were these things made for? The Harlem Globetrotters? I wasn't exactly a short dude. Dear goddess, Grant groaned. He stopped in the middle of the sidewalk and knelt down. He grabbed the hem of my robe and tied the corner in a knot so that it hung just above my feet. There, he stood and cocked an eyebrow at me. Can we get to the festival now? Jeez, I said. Someone's in a hurry. Trick-or-treating is already over, Grant pointed out, gesturing around the dark street. There were cars parked in every slot, which was why we decided to walk. I don't want to miss the bonfire, too. So you're going to dance? I asked. Hell yeah, he said as we started walking again. What do you think Halloween's about? We turned the street corner, and it was like stepping into an alternate dimension. The last street was so quiet and deserted, but Main Street was bursting with life. All the shops were open, and there were strings of orange and white lights above us. People walked up and down the road, since it was blocked off to cars. They were dressed in creepy costumes like ghouls, demons, and scary clowns. I saw at least a dozen people in costume as slasher film villains, and there was an entire family dressed up as characters from The Addams Family. 
One girl had done her makeup to look as if her skin was falling off. Her boyfriend made it look like his head had been severed. Everywhere I looked, there was some sort of dead something or other. A dead bride, a dead prom queen, and a dead nurse. One kid walked around looking like a talking ventriloquist doll, which was creepy as hell. I even saw a girl dressed up as a Ouija board, with a planchette painted on her eye and the letters on her chest. A trio of girls from school had dressed up as the Sanderson sisters from Hocus Pocus. I noticed Lena was the one dressed as the pretty blonde. Up and down Main Street, the shop owners had gone all out with decorations. Skeletons hung from signs, and cobwebs had been stretched across windows. Jack-o'-lanterns of all shapes and sizes were set up along shop stoops, or on bales of hay in front of windows. We passed by the four Imperium priestesses. They wore long, flowing robes and were handing out suckers shaped like their caste symbols to all the kids. As Grant and I made our way through the town and to the park, the Halloween decorations only became more prevalent. Plastic bats had been hung from the trees, and fake blood was smeared all over tree trunks. The vendor booths in the park were even more elaborate than the shops on Main Street. One looked like a gingerbread house, and a lady dressed as an ugly old witch invited kids inside for candy. A haunting melody came from the bandstand, and I could see the bonfire burning down by the river. Candy! Grant cried. He ran over to the first booth and grabbed a handful of chocolate from the bowl sitting there. He subconjured it, then grabbed another handful and shoved it in his pocket. I eyed him with a frown, and he stopped it in his tracks. He pulled the candy from his pocket and held out a piece to me. Sorry, bro, did you want some? No thanks, I said. Grant shrugged. More for me. So, you want to start with apple bobbing or the hay bale maze? They're both for kids, I pointed out. Grant clapped me on the shoulder. There's a kid inside all of us. It's your fault if you refuse to embrace it. Grant really wanted to do the apple bobbing, so we wove through the maze of booths to find it. Each booth had a different activity, like pumpkin painting or pumpkin carving. There were photo booths, pumpkin tosses, and all sorts of carnival games with Halloween themes. One booth had aisles made out of hay bales, and people were rolling pumpkins down them at plastic bowling pins. Beside that, miniature pumpkins had been set up on a giant checkerboard. Not far from us, a Halloween movie was playing on a projector, and kids were snuggled in blankets on the grass, watching. If the booths weren't hosting some activity, they were selling food. My favorites were the hot dogs wrapped in dough and made to look like miniature mummies, and the jello-shaped brains. Grant stopped at the apple-bobbing booth and rolled up his sleeves. Watch the champion at work. Yes, Grant, because they give out trophies for apple-bobbing, I teased. He frowned. They should. Oh my goddess. Grant's eyes locked on something across the way, and he ducked behind me. I looked to where his gaze had gone, but I didn't see anything. I turned toward him, but he just moved with me to stay hidden. Hey, dude, what's up? I asked. Grant hid his face. Talia's coming. Hide me. I scanned the crowd again, and sure enough, I spotted Talia and Nadine coming our way. Talia was dressed in a short green dress and fairy wings. Her cat wore a sack with something written across the side, though I couldn't read it. Nadine looked absolutely stunning, in a plaid shirt, overalls, and a straw hat. Her hair had been twisted into braids, and her makeup was done up to look like a scarecrow. I didn't know what it was about her outfit. Maybe the way the overalls hugged her curves. But she looked amazing. It took me a few moments to tear my gaze off of her. Relax, I told Grant. They're not coming over here. Except they were. They hadn't seen us yet, but they stopped beside the booth next to us, where a dozen other college girls were giggling. At first I didn't know why, until Grant inhaled a sharp breath. That's the matchmaker booth, he pointed out. Do you think Talia will get me? I shot him a side-eye look. You'd have to be dating her first. It could happen, Grant shot back. Come, come, ladies, Professor Wyckoff gestured Nadine and Talia forward. She was dressed in a medieval Celtic dress and was running the matchmaker booth. The booth drew in high school and college girls, and they performed various rituals that would tell them about their future relationships. Come, 
she said again. Open your minds and your future husband shall be revealed. Nadine shot Talia a skeptical look, but she giggled like she was having fun. She stepped up to the booth. How does this work? Well, my dear, there are many rituals performed on the night the veil is thin, Professor Wyckoff said in a mystical voice. The spirits of our ancestors will guide you and tell you your future. Talia nudged Nadine forward. It's worth a shot. Okay, Nadine agreed, though she didn't sound sure of herself. Start with the mashed potatoes, Professor Wyckoff said, holding out a small bowl to each of them. Oh, this one's fun, Talia said chipperly. You've done this ritual before? Professor Wyckoff asked. Talia's cheeks blushed pink. Once, but I didn't get the ring. What do you mean? Nadine asked. What's supposed to happen? We made a large batch of mashed potatoes, Professor Wyckoff explained, and I've hidden a ring inside. Whichever young lady finds the ring is said to be married by next Halloween. Nadine chuckled. If I find the ring... I think it'll come as a shock to all of us. I don't even have a boyfriend. Professor Wyckoff smiled. Well, you never know, my dear. Things can move quickly when they're meant to be. She handed each of the girls a spoon, and they both took a scoop of mashed potatoes. I didn't know why, but I found myself holding my breath. I breathed a sigh of relief when Nadine swallowed. No ring to be found. Nadine handed back the bowl. No ring, but that was delicious. Thank you, Professor Wyckoff said. Not to worry, my dears, we have plenty of other rituals for you. Professor Wyckoff offered them a bowl of hazelnuts. In this ritual, you'll name each hazelnut for each of your suitors. You'll place them into your fire at home. The nut that burns to ashes will represent your future husband. Nadine hesitated. Oh, um, I don't really have any suitors right now. Grant stiffened beside me like he hoped Talia might take a hazelnut and name it after him. But she refused the bowl as well. We don't have a fire in our dorm. Not to worry, not to worry, Professor Wyckoff said. Let's try the apple peels. Professor Wyckoff held out another bowl, which was filled to the brim with apple peels. What do we do with these? Nadine asked. Talia bounced on her toes. Oh, I like this one. I never got a good reading on it, though. It's simple, Professor Wyckoff told them. Take a handful of apple peels and toss them over your shoulder. The shape they land in will reveal to you your future husband's initials. Nadine laughed. I guess I'll give it a try. She and Talia both took a handful of apple peels and tossed them over their shoulders on the count of three. Grant grabbed my robe and tugged on it. But when I glanced over to him, his eyes were locked on Talia. He didn't seem to notice he had a hand on me at all. Mine doesn't look like anything, Nadine said. She was right. It just looked like a mess. I think mine worked, Talia exclaimed. Grant tugged on me harder until my robe was practically choking me. I coughed and he let go, but he couldn't tear his eyes from Talia. That could be a G, Talia said playfully, pointing down to her apple peels. Grant gasped. Or a C, Nadine added. Grant sighed. Talia tilted her head to the side, inspecting the peels. True, I can't make out the last initial, though. Did you hear that? Grant said to me. It might be a G. That's me. Or a C, I reminded him. Could be Cody. Grant frowned. Screw that asshat. He doesn't deserve her. I shrugged. Then ask her out. Grant ignored my suggestion and tugged on my sleeve again. Good goddess, Nadine's doing the mirror. I looked back to Nadine and sure enough, Professor Wyckoff had guided Nadine in front of a full-length mirror. It was pointed in our direction so I could see her reflection perfectly. She looked nervous as she stepped up to it, but there was curiosity in her eyes too. Take this and concentrate on the spirits around you. Professor Wyckoff instructed, ask them to guide you to see your future husband's face. Professor Wyckoff placed 
a lit candle into Nadine's hand. Nadine took a deep breath and closed her eyes. Talia stood off to the side, peering curiously at Nadine. What if Talia sees me? Grant whispered from beside me. Shh, I hissed at him. I shouldn't have cared what Nadine saw in that mirror when she opened her eyes. Whichever guy she saw wasn't going to be me. That shouldn't have bothered me since I knew we'd never end up together, but for some reason it did. Nadine's eyes shot open and she gasped, Lucas! My heart jolted in my chest. No, she didn't see me. She couldn't have. She whirled around and her eyes locked on mine. Shock was etched into her features for a moment until a darkness akin to anger took over. Lucas! She snapped. You ruined my spell! I was so stunned by the accusation that I just stood there for a moment. I... I, I what? I stammered. What are you doing standing there? She demanded. It was only then that realization hit. She had seen me in the mirror, but it wasn't because of the spell. It was because I was standing right there. The mirror pointed straight at my face. I didn't try to mess up your spell, I defended. Grant wanted to apple bob. I gestured to the booth we stood next to. No, I didn't, Grant said quickly, shooting a glance over at Talia. Apple bobbing is for kids. Talia chuckled. No, it's not. It sounds fun. Grant's features brightened. Oh, well, I'm pretty good if you want to challenge me. Dear goddess, I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. Talia stepped toward him and raised a challenging eyebrow. Maybe I will. Don't forget these. Professor Wyckoff shoved a small bag of treats into the girl's hands. It's walnuts, hazelnuts, and nutmeg. Eat it before you go to bed tonight and you'll dream of your future husband. Um, thanks, Nadine said, glancing down to the bag. She eyed it like she wasn't quite sure of this future husband ritual, since I'd screwed up the last one. Maybe after apple bobbing we could dance around the bonfire, Grant suggested to Talia. Sure, that sounds great. She sounded really excited. Grant suddenly didn't sound so shy. Cool, so what are you supposed to be, an Arcania? Grant was careful with his words. It was offensive to dress up as other races for Halloween, and we all knew it. Talia frowned. I'm Tinkerbell. Gus is my bag of fairy dust. Gus was licking his paw. He stopped when he heard his name. You're not a midnighter, are you? Talia asked, eyeing Grant's costume. He looked disappointed she didn't recognize him. I'm Dracula. Ah, I see it now, she teased. You're missing the receding hairline. I know, my hair's just too perfect for Dracula, Grant joked, running his hands through his gelled hair. Anyway, shall we? Grant and Talia ditched us to take their turn at apple bobbing, leaving Nadine and me alone. Neither of us said anything. I couldn't stand it. I think I would have rather stabbed myself in the stomach with a chef's knife than stand there in awkward silence. So, um, a scarecrow? I said to kill the silence. If anything, I only made it worse. Yep, she said, popping the pea at the end of her word. She shoved her hands into her pockets. And you're a reaper? I nodded. I couldn't look at her, so I kept my eyes on Grant and Talia as they dipped their heads into the water. Creative, Nadine said flatly. I couldn't read her tone, but it sure felt like an insult. Several minutes passed, and we just stood there. I swear I'd never waited longer in my life. Grant was taking forever. I thought about saying more to break the silence, but Nadine hadn't said anything either. I got the feeling she didn't want to talk to me. I wanted to apologize, but I could hardly find my tongue. Something told me that it'd just end in a fight, and I didn't want to ruin her night. Finally, after what felt like seven hours of excruciating silence, Grant and Talia returned. They were both laughing, and Talia was running her fingers through her wet hair. You were right, Grant, she said. You are good at apple bobbing. Grant puffed his chest out proudly. Got one on my first try. So, Talia, you wanted to dance? 
Nadine said quickly, like she was dying to escape as much as I was. Yeah, Talia said brightly. It's the best part of Halloween. Nadine looped her arm through Talia's and said, Show the way. Grant practically skipped behind them, and I followed along at a distance. Come on, Grant hissed at me. Ugh, why'd he have to invite Talia and Nadine of all people? This was too weird. We reached the bonfire, where people in costume were already dancing and having a good time. There were large logs set up around the perimeter. I took a seat on one because I wasn't much of a dancer. Party pooper, Grant choked before running off to dance with the girls. Grant took three stalks of dried yarrow off one of the picnic tables. St. John's wort flowers were woven around the stems. He handed one to each of the girls. What's this for? Nadine asked. We dance with it to keep the fairies away, Grant explained. Nadine raised an eyebrow. Fairies? Like the Arcania? Yes, but also their ancestors, Grant clarified. The veil between all realms is thin tonight. We don't want any tricksters in our midst. The three of them hurried off to join the dancing. From the bandstand, a female voice sang a slow, melancholy tune played in a minor key. She was backed by a piano and bells. Everyone danced to their own muse. There was no choreography, except they all moved around the fire in a clockwise rotation. Talia and Nadine swayed their hips slowly to the music while waving their arms seductively. Grant looked like he was doing a poor rendition of Swan Lake, though at least he looked like he was having fun. I couldn't take my eyes off Nadine. It was like that every time we were together, but tonight especially. She smiled and laughed like she was having the time of her life. It made my heart lift, even though I wasn't participating. All I wanted for her was to be happy. After a while, Nadine stepped away from Talia and Grant. She breathed a heavy sigh as she came to sit beside me. She looked totally wiped. You okay? I asked. I could pretend to be an asshole, but I still cared, so sue me. Just needed to catch my breath, she said. Are you having fun? I asked. I am, she replied. So what's the deal with Halloween around here? What do you mean? I asked. She waved her hand and gestured to the people dancing around the bonfire. You guys seem to take it really seriously. I thought Halloween was all superstition. I chuckled lightly. You're a witch, and you think superstitions aren't real? She shrugged. I don't know. Is it all real? Most of it, I told her. She raised an eyebrow. So do the gates of hell open on Halloween or something? I rolled my eyes at her. It was cute how little she knew. No, but the veil between the living and the dead is thin. She turned to face me, looking intrigued. Why tonight, though, on All Hallows' Eve? We don't call it that, I stated. She furrowed her brow. Really? I thought that was the traditional name of Halloween. Our traditions date back way further than that, I said. All Hallows' Eve ties into All Saints' Day, which is a Christian tradition that coincided with Halloween. Our traditions date back to Celtic culture and the Samhain festival. Nadine tilted her head. The coven isn't Celtic, though, is it? No, I told her, but we adopted the traditions of Samhain because they were so effective. Effective at what? She asked curiously. It was weird that she was talking to me so casually again after I'd been such a jerk to her. But she always got this way when she was curious about something. Her curiosity was one of the things that drew me to her. At keeping away the evil spirits, I told her simply, the end of October marks the end of the harvest. It's the midpoint between the fall equinox and the winter solstice. Cultures around the world believe that this is the day of the year when the veil between the living and the dead is the thinnest. That's why Professor Wyckoff was making you do all those rituals at the matchmaking booth, because they work best when the veil is thin. So evil spirits can really get through to the land of the living on Halloween? She asked. I shrugged. Sure, they all can if they want to. The point of all these Halloween traditions is to scare away the evil spirits and welcome the good ones. Scare them away? That's why everyone dresses up so scary and people hang creepy decorations? She asked. I nodded. 
Right. It's why we dance and sing around the fire and burn our crops, too. Ages ago, we used to burn cattle, but we don't do that anymore. Nadine's eyebrows shot up. If you do all this to ward off spirits, how do you welcome the good ones? A lot of people will set an extra plate at dinner so their ancestors can dine with them, I explained. After the festival, people will bring flames from the bonfire back to their houses to light their own fireplaces. Then we'll all light candles so the spirits can find their way back to the afterlife when the night is over. It was actually cool to explain this all to her because her eyes lit up with intrigue with every little piece of information I gave her. She was obviously a really big fan of Halloween. What's the deal with all the candy and crafts then? She asked, gesturing to the booths in the park behind us. I shrugged. That's just for fun. The seer booths are real, though. If you want to talk to anyone who's crossed over, now's the best time. Nadine's features fell, and she stared into the bonfire. I couldn't read her expression, but she looked deep in thought. She cleared her throat. I, um, think I might prefer the haunted house tonight. Nadine got really quiet after that. There's no one you want to talk to? I asked. I could have sworn I saw tears in Nadine's eyes, but I couldn't tell for sure because she wouldn't look at me. Great. I was an asshole again. Thanks for telling me about Halloween, Nadine said without looking at me. But I'm going to get back to dancing. Nadine stood and walked over to Talia and Grant. She barely danced, though. She picked up Gus and made it look like he was the reason she wasn't dancing. But I could tell she was really tired. Lucas, a voice hissed through the darkness. It was so chilling that it made me freeze on the spot. I glanced around, wondering if anyone else had heard it, but everyone kept on dancing and laughing. Lucas, the female voice sounded again, louder this time. I whirled around and I nearly fell out of my seat when I saw a woman dressed in black crouched at my level. Her face was only inches away from mine. She was dressed as a night hag, a creature of lore who could invade your dreams and cause sleep paralysis. She wore a black veil over her face, but red eyes glowed from beneath it. What do you want? I asked. Fear not, child, for I am only a seer, she said. I knew it was a costume, but I'd be damned if it didn't scare the living daylights out of me. A spirit has visited me tonight, she whispered. He has seen the future, and he has a message for you. The woman reached out and pressed a piece of paper into my palm. When I glanced down at it, I saw it was a tarot card. Not just any card, either. Death. My stomach dropped to my toes. I glanced back up at her. Is this some sort of joke? She shook her head. Death follows you wherever you go, Lucas. A shiver ran down my spine. Of course it does, I snapped at her. I'm the Reaper's Apprentice. What does this mean? The card could literally mean anything. I dealt with death on the daily. But I knew the death card had many other meanings. Usually it wasn't literal. You must stop this, the seer warned. Stop what? I demanded. Lucas, Grant called. Instinctively I looked toward him. He waved his hand in my direction as he passed by me. Come dance, it's fun! Grant turned back to Talia and grabbed her around the waist. She giggled as he bared his fake fangs and pretended to bite her cheek. I ignored him and turned back toward the seer. But she was gone. The card still sat in my hand, but it was as if the woman had never existed. Whatever. I was sure it was nothing more than a joke. I tossed the card into the grass behind me, and it tumbled in the wind. Even after the card disappeared from view, I still had this feeling of dread settled deep in my stomach. What if the seer had really meant something by it? The whole encounter had me shook. Grant and the girls made it around the bonfire again, then plopped down on the log beside me. Man, is it fun warding off evil spirits, Grant exclaimed. Gus had fun, Talia said, stroking her cat's head. Nadine shot a glance my way, but she didn't say anything. Silence settled over our group, and I could feel the awkwardness creeping in again. 
I just wanted to get out of there, away from the creepy seer and away from this awkwardness with Nadine. I cleared my throat. Well, Grant, we should probably get going. Get going, he balked, but I'm having so much fun. And I have that paper to write, I reminded him. Right, the seance. Grant's shoulders fell. He didn't sound as enthused about it as he had been earlier. Nadine's spine straightened and her eyes lit up. You guys are doing a seance? Um, yeah, I said nervously. She sounded like she wanted to come, but I'd been using it as an excuse to leave. Yeah, Lucas needs to do one for his afterlife studies class, Grant said. Do you two want to join us? I pinched his arm the same time Talia and Nadine answered in unison, Yes. That's not necessary, I said. You guys enjoy the festival. Grant and I are fine on our own. Grant shot me a look the girls didn't see. Come on, bro. Oh, I'd love to see it. Nadine's eyes were so bright and hopeful. I still felt bad about the first seance we did. I suppose I owed her a decent seance that didn't end in her getting hurt. I spoke before I could talk myself down. If you want, you can come, I offered timidly. My guts twisted as soon as I said the words. Something told me I was about to regret this decision. The cemetery was creepy at night, but it was particularly chilling on Halloween. The front gates had been unlocked and they creaked on their hinges. The moon was nothing more than a sliver, which cast the cemetery in almost complete darkness. Cold air brushed across my skin, raising the hairs on the back of my neck. There wasn't a soul in sight, but I could feel death in the air. Nadine and Talia clutched each other, and Gus took cautious steps forward. Is there a reason we're doing this in the cemetery? Nadine asked. If it were any other girl, I'd expect her to sound terrified, but Nadine wasn't. Her voice was steady, and she sounded intrigued. It's easier to contact someone who's recently deceased, Grant explained, and since we don't have anything personal, we figured a grave would do. Who are we contacting? Nadine asked. I shrugged and gestured to the newest plots. Take your pick. Nadine walked up to a fresh gravestone. The ground sank a little beneath her feet. The grass hadn't even started growing over the plot. Nadine! Talia exclaimed. She grabbed Nadine by the arm and dragged her back onto the grass. What? Nadine asked innocently, glancing between the three of us. It's rude to step over someone's grave, Talia told her. Nadine pressed her fingers to her lips, and her eyes went wide. I'm sorry, did I already ruin the seance? I shook my head. No, we can still contact Emily Robinson. My heart stopped when I read off the name on the gravestone. It was the girl who died in that domestic attack a few weeks ago. I thought for a moment it'd be better to contact someone else, someone who hadn't left with such a sad last thought. But then I realized pretty much everyone died with some sort of baggage. Emily was as good of spirit as any to contact. I eyed the date on the stone, then glanced down to the freshly turned earth. Something about it made me feel uneasy, though I couldn't put my finger on it. Talia's face fell. What is it, Lucas? Do you know her? I cleared my throat. No, let's get this over with. The four of us sat around the gravestone, being careful not to sit directly on Emily's grave. Gus snuggled up in Talia's lap, looking positively content. Anyone happen to have a candle or two on them? I asked. I'd totally forgotten about it before we left. Yeah, Nadine said, grabbing at her pockets. I've got a whole stash right here in my overalls. I looked at her hopefully, then realized she was joking. She chuckled, and I rolled my eyes at her. Not amused. I've got you. Grant conjured a candle and set it at the base of the grave marker, then lit it with a lighter. He looked to me for further instruction, since this was my class assignment. Everyone join hands, I said. I hesitated when I realized Nadine had sat on my left, which meant I had to hold her hand. She noticed my hesitation and frowned at me. I'm not contagious. Didn't say you were, I replied, a little harsher than I meant. Nadine's eyes narrowed. She looked like she was about to say something, but thought better of it. 
She didn't want to get kicked out of the seance. I took her hand, but I must have squeezed a little too tight because she winced. I let up a little until I was just barely touching her. But it didn't matter. Her touch sent an electric shock straight through me. It took me a few moments to find my voice. Try to relax, I told everyone. Pfft, I was the one to speak. I really didn't care for this assignment. I mean, who was I to disturb the dead? But I was barely scraping by in afterlife studies. If I missed this assignment too, I'd have to repeat the semester. Focus on Emily, I instructed. Nadine peeked an eye open. Focus how? We know nothing about her. I shrugged. Think about how she loved her grandma B, or how she used to weave blankets and loved singing karaoke. Nadine furrowed her brow. I thought you didn't know her. Did you just make that stuff up? I don't think that's how seances work. Grant shot me a knowing look. I'd never met Emily in my life, but I'd read her obituary at least 50 times. I knew enough about her to summon her. Just go with it, I said flatly. Nadine closed her eyes again, and the four of us inhaled a collective breath. Emily, I called out to the darkness, we seek to contact you. If you can hear us, please make your presence known. A light breeze rustled through the trees, but nothing about it felt particularly spiritual. Emily, I repeated her name. All we want is to know how you are. Show us a sign, any sign, that you've made it to the other side all right. Nothing but silence met us in the night. After several minutes of calling Emily's name, I was starting to wonder if I was doing it wrong. But I couldn't be. Seances were easy. It should have been simple tonight of all nights. Emily? I called again. I tried not to let the irritation in my tone show, but something told me this wasn't going to happen tonight. Emily's spirit wanted nothing to do with us. She was probably hanging out at her Grandma B's house. Why would she bother visiting us when she could go anywhere tonight? This was a dumb idea. I tried one last-ditch effort to get her to appear. Emily, please show yourself. An earth-shattering scream cut through the night, sending my heart up into my throat. My eyes shot open and I jumped away from Grant and Nadine. Talia sat across from me, screaming like a banshee. Her face had gone paper white, and she pointed to something behind me. Grant scrambled away from where he'd been sitting, looking like he might have shit his pants. Nadine's eyes went wide. I whirled around and nearly dropped dead at what I saw. A woman in a black dress limped toward us through the shadows. Her face was pale as death, and there was a sickening gray tone to her skin. Her eyes stared forward without focusing on anything. At first, I thought it was some chick from the festival dressed as a zombie, until the moonlight crossed her face. I realized I recognized her from her obituary picture. Holy shit, it was Emily. But this was no fucking ghost. She was here in the flesh. How the hell was that possible? I shot to my feet, my heart racing. Stand back, everyone. I threw my arms out to push everyone behind me. Emily limped forward. She moved her lips, but nothing came out. I'd seen Professor Warren reanimate animals in necromancy safety, but I'd never encountered a human corpse. To say it chilled me to the bone was an understatement. Nadine grabbed my robes and peeked over my shoulder at Emily. Unlike my hands that were shaking fiercely, Nadine's held steady. Emily? I asked the walking corpse. She reacted by twitching her head at me. It moved unnaturally, like a creepy demon child from a horror movie. She was almost close enough to touch now, but I didn't want to freak her out, especially if I wanted answers. How was this happening? Was there a necromancer hiding in the trees, laughing at us right now or something? Emily, what happened to you? I asked. I didn't know why I was asking. If this was a necromancer's prank, she wouldn't be able to speak. But it was too much of a coincidence that we'd been trying to summon her spirit and her body showed up. Something deeper was happening here. The thing was, did I really want to stick around and figure it out? Emily reached out for me. Two things happened at once. Emily's cold, dead fingers brushed against my robe, 
and it was like death itself had touched me. I felt the emptiness of death within my gut. At the same time, Emily parted her lips. Black smoke began billowing out of her mouth. I'd never seen anything like it. All I knew was that it could only mean something bad, like black magic bad. Nope. We were out of here, to hell with answers. Debilito, Grant cried. Green magic shot out of his hands and slammed into Emily's chest. It was a simple defense spell meant to cripple your opponent. Emily's body crumbled to the ground, but that black smoke continued to billow out of her mouth. Run! I shouted to my friends. The four of us whirled around and started sprinting toward the cemetery gates. My heart pummeled against my ribcage. I didn't think I'd ever run so fast in my life. We only made it a few gravestones down when I heard Gus screech. I took a few more paces before I realized Nadine had disappeared from my side. I spun back around and gasped. Nadine had tripped over Gus and laid in the grass, groaning. Emily's corpse had risen from the ground and had gone straight for her. Nadine rolled over, and Emily reached out toward the silver star necklace Nadine always wore. She tried to say something again, but it was nothing more than a chilling moan. Nade, get up! I shouted as I raced back toward her. But Nadine hardly needed my warning. She lifted her foot and slammed it into Emily's gut. Talia and Grant gasped in unison as Emily went stumbling back. I reached Nadine and grabbed her under the shoulders to drag her to her feet. Nadine held on to me, but she didn't move. She inhaled several breaths and stared at the live corpse like it was the most fascinating thing she'd ever seen. Eoctus! I screamed. My purple magic sent Emily flying back a few feet, but it barely phased her. Nade, come on! I tugged at her. I was about to toss her pretty little ass over my shoulder to get her out of there, but I didn't act in time. Emily recovered and lunged toward Nadine again. Nadine screamed and curled into me. I wrapped my arms tightly around her. I expected Emily's body to slam into both of us, but she didn't reach us before a sleek black cat as dark as midnight sprinted into view. It hurtled over the nearest gravestone and hissed as it jumped through the air. The cat's claws sank into the flesh on Emily's face. Nadine's eyes went wide, but we didn't have time to sit around questioning it. I grabbed her around the waist and tossed her over my shoulder. Let's go, I demanded. Talia and Grant were holding each other, and Gus had scurried on ahead. They both wore a deer-in-the-headlights expression, but they quickly snapped to attention when I hurried past them. Lucas, Nadine protested, slapping me on the back. Lucas, we have to go back. Screw that, I cried. We were almost at the front gates now, and there was no way I was going back to face that dark zombie. Sure, she moved slowly, but there was something terrifying about her. Whatever this was, was way out of our pay grade. Lucas, you don't understand, she cried, kicking her feet. We passed through the front gates, and I set Nadine on solid ground. I noticed she'd lost her costume hat at some point. She brushed the hair out of her eyes. We have to go back for... We don't have to go back for anything, I stated firmly. Whatever that was, wasn't just some everyday reanimate. There was something dark. Necromancy gone wrong? Talia asked curiously. Gus approached her and she bent down to pick him up. Grant pulled the gates to the cemetery shut and whispered an incantation to lock them. I'm not sure. My heart continued racing as I stepped up to the gate and wrapped my hands around the bars. My pulse slowed as I looked over the cemetery. I didn't see the zombie anywhere. Lucas, Nadine pressed. I whirled around and pressed my fingers to my eyes. Usually her curiosity turned me on, but right now it was downright irritating. I don't care what you want to go back for. Want to see if it's really dead? Want to know what the black smoke was coming out of her mouth? Too bad. Nadine placed her hand on her hip and looked at me with a pissed expression. She raised an eyebrow. You done? I was going to say we have to go back for the cat. She saved us. Are you kidding me? I balked. That cat can clearly take care of itself. The rattling of the cemetery gates startled all four of us. Emily had returned from seemingly out of nowhere, and she was violently shaking the cemetery gates. Her features twisted into rage, and she moaned at us like she was some sort of rabid animal trying to escape. The four of us took a collective step back. 
She can't get to us, Talia stated, though her voice shook. Grant reached for Talia and stepped in front of her protectively. Who knows? Our stunning spells didn't work. Well, we have to do something, Talia insisted. We trapped it, Grant pointed out. What more can we do? Nadine huffed, then stomped over to the side of the road. She grabbed a thick stick and started toward the zombie. Hold up. I grabbed for the stick before she could get too far. I didn't want her anywhere near that thing. I'll do it. Nadine stepped back. Be my guest. I hesitated as I walked up to the corpse. She continued to rattle the gates like a mad woman. My stomach felt hollow as I considered what I was about to do. But it wasn't like she was alive. I wasn't going to hurt her. I flexed my fingers around the stick, testing how it felt in my hand. Grant? I cocked my head at him, though I kept my eyes on the raging zombie. He stepped forward. He kept his voice steady, and I guessed it was for Talia's benefit. What do you need, man? A little help with the validus incantation, I told him. I can't do it myself. I've got you. Grant wrapped his hands around the stick with me. Validus, we spoke together. The stick glowed purple and green as we pooled our magic to make it stronger. It felt like a steel rod in my hands, and I could feel the power emanating from it. On three? I asked. Grant and I stepped closer to the corpse. One, he said. Two, I added. Three, we cried together. We lifted the stick and aimed it between her eyes. Sorry, I whispered to her. Grant and I slammed the end of our enchanted stick straight forward through the bars. It connected with Emily's face so hard that it snapped her head back, and her moaning ceased instantly. Her eyes rolled back into her skull and she collapsed onto the ground. I thought that was the end of it until her back arched instantly. The sound of bones snapping met my ears, and black smoke erupted out of her eyes, mouth, and ears. It swirled into a ball above her head, and a high-pitched shriek that wasn't quite human echoed across the cemetery. Get back! I screamed, my heart racing. The four of us stumbled down the road, but we couldn't take our eyes off the strange phenomenon happening in front of us. Then, all at once, the smoke dissipated, and the shrieking stopped. I gasped for breath as my heart rate slowed. Let's get out of here, Grant said. Wait, Nadine grabbed Grant's arm to stop him. We can't just leave her here. Well, we can't touch her either, I pointed out. We don't know what that was. Then we need to tell someone, she insisted. Yeah, let's freak everyone out, Grant said sarcastically. She frowned. Someone has to take care of this. She had a point. Headmistress Verla's house is just ahead, Talia said. We can tell her. I glanced to each of them and they all looked in agreement. Okay. Headmistress Verla's house was tucked back in the trees. It was pretty elaborate for just one person, with two stories, a three-car garage, and a balcony at the top of the Gothic turret. Verla owned like 20 acres out here at the edge of town but she was headmistress. She was loaded. The house was dark when we stepped up to the front door. There was a chill in the air that was even more apparent here in the trees. Two huge door knockers hung from the black double doors. They were shaped as skulls and kind of creepy. She's probably not home, I said, like the pessimistic guy I was. I bet she's at the festival. Nadine rolled her eyes. It doesn't hurt to check. She stepped forward and grabbed the door knocker, shaped like a bone. She slammed it hard against the door. Silence. I glanced around the forest as if searching for any signs that the corpse would reappear. Nadine knocked again, but no one came to the door. Maybe we should go, Talia suggested, eyeing the trees. There are lots of people in town we can tell. Yeah, Grant agreed. He seemed eager to get out of here. Nadine turned from the door. Okay, let's go. The four of us stepped off the porch, but the sound of a door swinging open caught our attention. We turned around in unison. Headmistress Verla stood in the doorway, looking positively surprised to see us there. She wasn't wearing a costume, just a black cardigan she pulled around herself. Her eyes fell on Nadine. What are you doing here? Nadine cleared her throat and spoke like this was an everyday thing. 
There's a zombie in the cemetery. We thought you should know. Headmistress Verla's eyes went wide. I think we killed it, Nadine added. But the corpse is lying by the entrance, and we don't want to touch it. Verla's face paled. Necromancy? I stepped forward. It was something different. Something dark. Black smoke came out of the corpse's mouth. I'm sure it's nothing more than a harmless Halloween prank. I'll handle this. But there was something akin to recognition in her eyes, like she knew there was more to what we'd just encountered than that. It was like she recognized the magic we spoke of, but couldn't tell us because we were students. I realized then what had made me uneasy about Emily's grave. The plot was too fresh. Someone had intentionally grave-robbed her and raised her tonight. The question was, who, why, and how the hell we were getting those answers? Chapter 16 Nadine The events of Halloween had me shook. I didn't know what to make of what we'd seen. Verla's probably right, Talia said as we headed back to our dorm after midnight. Grant and Lucas had walked us back to school, and we'd split up at the top of the stairs. It was just a harmless prank, right? Yeah, but who would do that? Talia raised an eyebrow. Chloe, I realized. Talia shrugged. I wouldn't put it past her. My lips pressed into a thin line. She would find a necromancer to freak us out. Well, there you go. Talia said. Mystery solved. Talia cut off when Gus jumped out of her arms. He ran down the hallway toward a black cat that sat just outside our door. He crept toward it and sniffed it curiously. The black cat sniffed him back and started purring. Um, Talia? I said as we got closer. I couldn't take my eyes off the cat, or rather, kitten. It looked only a couple of months old. It had a short black coat, and there were no unique markings on it. But there was something about those piercing green eyes. Is that the cat from the cemetery? She took a cautious step forward. I think it is. What's it doing here? I asked. It had to be more than coincidence. There was something about this cat that left me enamored. I had the strangest feeling the cat felt the same connection with me. It looked up at me, then walked over and started rubbing itself against my leg. My heart melted, and I bent down to pet it. A warm sense of peace settled over me. She's so sweet. Talia eyed me curiously. Nadine, can you describe to me what you feel? I stroked the kitten's fur. I don't know. I couldn't put it into words. There was a sense of familiarity there that didn't make any logical sense. I wanted to dress her up in little aprons and decorate sugar cookies with her. I could practically taste the dough melting in my mouth when I touched her. And there was this scent to her that made my mouth water, like the delicious scent of baking bread. I wanted to snuggle her tight and never let go. And then it hit me. I gasped and threw my hand over my mouth. Talia smiled from above me, like she already knew. I let out a shaky breath and dropped my hand. Talia, could this cat be reincarnated? I think you already know, she replied softly. Tears pricked at my eyes. Is this cat my mom? Talia shrugged, but she looked happy for me. Only you can tell. But how do I know? I asked. You just feel it, she said. Like when I first met Gus, he came to me with a chickadee in his mouth. What does that mean? I asked. My grandpa Jimmy was a bird watcher, she told me. He taught me bird calls and he called me Little Chickadee. I just knew. 
I couldn't explain it, but something deep within my soul knew this cat was my mother. I picked her up and cradled her in my arms. She nuzzled against me, and my entire body felt warm with love. I'm keeping her. Talia and I entered the room, and I sat on my bed and stroked the kitten. Does she remember me? Not quite in the same way, Talia explained as she began to strip off her costume. It's the same soul, but she's still a cat. She'll have a strong connection with you that spans lifetimes, but you'll create new memories with her. A strong connection? I questioned. Why do you think she protected you in the cemetery? Talia pointed out. And that you wanted to go back for her. It's probably how she found your dorm room, too. Reincarnated cats are different from regular cats. They have a high sense of intuition that will draw them to their loved ones, and they'll act to protect them. I pressed my nose into the kitten's fur, inhaling the sweet scent that reminded me of my mom. A tear fell from my eyes and soaked into her fur. For a moment, all my fatigue washed away, and I knew without a doubt that my mom had returned. She was here to take care of me again. I sniffled. I guess that's why the seance didn't take. My parents' souls must have been reincarnating or something. Talia looked thoughtful as she placed her costume on the hanger. That might explain it. The kitten began kneading at my stomach. I swooned. Oh, so what do I name her? Do I name her after my mom? Talia pulled an oversized t-shirt over her head. It's customary to give them a new name. It differentiates this life from their last. Hmm, I mused. Then I think I'll call her Isa. Talia sat on her bed and stroked Gus. Isa, that's pretty. It's my mom's middle name, I told her. I squeezed Isa tight to my chest. I'm so happy to have her back. Isa turned out to be a godsend over the next week. My symptoms had flared so bad I couldn't get out of bed and ended up missing a few days of class. She kept me company while I waited for the pain to settle. By Friday, I was feeling better. I went to demonology in the morning, then headed to introduction to tarot after an early lunch. I noticed Chloe walking my way. I slowed my steps so I wouldn't run into her, but she did the same thing. We ended up at the classroom door at the same time. Chloe stepped in front of it so I couldn't pass and placed a hand on her hip. At my feet, Issa hissed. That a girl. I heard you were sick, Chloe sneered. I shrugged. I'm always sick. What's your point? She narrowed her eyes. You don't look sick to me. Good goddess. Didn't this girl have anything better to do than to torment me? If you could tell I was sick, it wouldn't be called an invisible illness, I snapped. If you want to be invisible, you might as well just leave Octavia Falls, she said. It's too bad. I'd kind of been hoping that's what happened to you. I scoffed. You really think your stupid Halloween prank could scare me away? Her lips tightened. I don't know what you're talking about. You said the same thing about Verla's cat, I reminded her. She rolled her eyes. Okay, maybe I slipped something into his food, but I didn't do anything on Halloween. I take Halloween very seriously. Right, I said sarcastically, dragging the word out. I didn't believe her. You would never break the rules. Black magic's way outside of your comfort zone. Chloe's gaze darted up and down the hall, as if making sure no one else heard. Then she narrowed her eyes at me. Go die in a ditch, Evers. She whirled around and entered the classroom. I just laughed from behind her, while Issa let out another hiss. Is that a threat, Chloe? I called. Or are you working on casting a curse? She ignored me and pulled her tarot cards out of her bag. She started shuffling through them as I took my seat. 
She pulled a card from the top and started laughing so loud that the other students stopped talking to look at her. Chloe turned the card toward me and beamed. It was the death card, but I didn't really care. I knew she'd picked it deliberately to try to freak me out, but I was totally at ease. I pretended I didn't see it and faced the front of the room. Issa purred in my lap. Class continued like normal. We were studying the symbolism in various cards within the suit of wands, which was all pretty easy to pick up at this point in the semester. At the end of class, I waited until everyone else had left, then approached Professor Wyckoff. Nadine, she said brightly, what can I help you with? I missed a couple days of class, and I was wondering if there was any makeup work to do, I said. I noticed you were out of class, she said solemnly. Is everything okay? Fine, I told her. Just been feeling a little under the weather. She frowned. Must have been a nasty little bug. I chuckled under my breath, though she didn't notice. Yeah, it's pretty awful. At least you're better, she said. I mean, it could be worse. Could be chronic. My stomach sank at her words. She had no idea. Yeah, I said flatly. I didn't have the energy to explain to her that it was chronic. I quickly changed the subject. So, is there any makeup work? We studied the Ace of Wands through the Ten of Wands, she told me. But there's no homework. Okay, thanks. I turned and left the room with Issa in my arms. I knew Professor Wyckoff had been trying to make me feel better, but I couldn't get her comment out of my mind. Who was she to assume what I went through? I was walking back to my dorm, barely paying attention, when I passed through the foyer. Tons of students were hanging around, but it wasn't until Issa growled lowly that I actually paid attention. I lifted my gaze and saw Lucas chatting with that blonde chick, Lena, next to the fireplace. She laughed at something he said, which was dumb because he wasn't even that funny. When she laughed, she reached out and touched his arm. He glanced down at her fingers, but he barely acknowledged that she touched him, like it was totally natural for those two. Lena pushed a strand of hair behind her ear and fluttered her eyelashes at him. I just stood there, frozen, watching, my stomach turning into knots. If he held her hand again, so help me. Lena's eyes darted around the foyer, and for a second, they landed on me. She didn't look at me long, but something sparked in her eyes when she saw me. I couldn't even explain what it was. Jealousy, maybe? Which made no sense, because if anyone was allowed to feel jealous, it was me. Lucas clearly didn't have a problem hanging out with her. Lena said something I couldn't hear. The next second, she reached up and placed her hand on the side of Lucas's face. She leaned in and planted a kiss right on his lips, in the middle of the fucking foyer. I went completely still, and the room spun around me. Rejection settled like a knife in my gut. This was a hundred times worse than when he held her hand. This was confirmation of everything I'd worried about the first time I saw them together. Lucas didn't want me. But apparently, he didn't care about the Reaper's shadow curse when Lena was involved. Those two could have it all. How could I have been so stupid? Why had I fallen for Lucas in the first place? And why the hell was I so mad that he was kissing Lena? It wasn't like I owned him. Rationally, I knew that, but deep down, I felt a connection there that screamed of possession. He was mine, and I was his. We were two broken puzzle pieces that fit perfectly together, if only he wanted to. Except Lucas didn't want that with me. He wanted it with Lena. Screw him. He didn't know what he was missing out on. I was going to have to get him to see that for himself.
I couldn't make sense of what dark energy overcame me in that moment, but I felt nothing like myself. Jealousy, rage, and revenge bubbled up inside of me. All I knew was I had to do something to let off some steam. I whirled toward the stairs. One second, I was stomping toward the banister, and the next, I was in my room. I hardly knew how I'd gotten there. Talia was playing music at her piano, but stopped abruptly when I entered the room. Is something wrong? A maniacal laugh bubbled out of my throat. Try everything. I just saw Lucas kissing that bitch, Lena. Talia's jaw dropped. He didn't. He did, I stated. And I'm getting back at him. I dropped Isa off on my bed, then flung open my dresser and went for the skimpiest outfit I could find. I pulled on a black crop top and matching shorts that showed off my ass cheeks. I didn't even know where the outfit had come from, but I felt empowered in it. I let my hair down and slipped on a pair of high heels. Talia's jaw dropped. Nadine, are you sure about this? You're really emotional right now. Hell yeah, I am, I cried. Lucas can reject me all he wants, but he can at least tell me the truth, jackass. See you later, Tal. I waved over my shoulder and left the room. Nadine, wait, she called, but the door was already closing behind me. I didn't know where I was going, just that I was looking for trouble. I passed through the foyer, expecting to show off my new look to Lucas but he was gone. Shame. I swayed my hips as I walked down the hall, as if I was on a runway. I could practically hear the bad chick music in my mind. I pursed my lips and floated down the hall like a hella confident goddess. All eyes turned my way, and power exuded out of me. I felt like I could lift a mountain. I stepped into the lounge, where my gaze narrowed in on what I was looking for. The one thing that would piss Lucas off the most. Ryan. He sat alone in the corner by the TVs, his arms stretched across the back of one of the couches. There was something in the way Ryan sat that made it look like he was on a throne. Confidence rolled off him in waves. He seemed like a king, turning his nose up at all his peasant servants. He was the total opposite of Lucas, and right now, it totally turned me on. I walked straight up to Ryan, and let me tell you, when he noticed me, he noticed me. His eyes roamed up and down my body in such a seductive way that it already felt like his hands were on me. I should have felt dirty, and I did in a way, but something about it exhilarated me, too. Well, hello, danger. Mind if I sit? I asked in a tone that wasn't my own. Ryan straightened his spine, and his eyes traveled straight down to lock on my breasts. Go ahead, sweetheart. He gestured to the cushion beside him, but I didn't take it. I caved to the bad girl inside of me and sat straight on his lap, wrapping my arms around his neck. Where have you been hanging around, handsome? I asked. Ryan wrapped an arm around my waist. I could ask you the same thing. Have we met? I found it hilarious he didn't recognize me, considering I nearly ran him over with my car. But that was the kind of guy he was. He only noticed a girl if she was spewing sex pheromones his way. I ran a finger across his chest. I think I'd remember you. Ryan smirked. I'll give you something to remember. How about a broken jaw? My heart fluttered at the sound of the voice, and I couldn't help it when a smile spread across my face. I turned to see Lucas standing there, his hands curled tightly into fists. A dark shadow crossed his eyes, and he looked like he was about to strangle Ryan. My, my, my.
Looks like Lucas couldn't handle a little jealousy after all. And it thrilled me. Chapter 17 Lucas Lena was kissing me. What the hell? One second we were talking about our class assignment, and the next her lips were on mine. I'd kissed Lena before, back when we were dating in high school, but this was different. This was empty. I felt nothing. Absolutely nothing. Her lips were cold, and her hand felt like ice on my face. For all I knew, she could have been a ghost. It took me a few seconds to realize what was happening, because no way was Lena fucking kissing me. But it was happening, and I totally wasn't okay with it. I pressed against Lena's shoulder and pushed her away from me. Lena, what the hell? I hissed, glancing around the foyer. No one seemed to notice, or simply didn't care. Lena tossed her blonde hair over her shoulder. What's wrong, Lucas? We've kissed like a million times before. When we were together, I snapped. She pursed her ruby red lips and shrugged. I thought you'd like a taste of what you were missing. I scoffed. I gotta say, Lena, it wasn't that sweet. So what? She challenged. You've had sweeter? I raked my hands through my hair. Come on, Lena, you know I don't date. She lifted a manicured eyebrow. Really? Because word around these halls is that you have something going on with that Nadine girl. There's nothing going on. I trailed off. Lena wore a pleased expression, but I didn't understand it at first. Then it hit me. She'd kissed me because of Nadine. She saw, didn't she? I growled. You made sure of it. Lena shrugged. I don't know. Why don't you go ask her? Lena, I groaned. I started to walk away because I just couldn't take her right now. But I realized a second later I had more I wanted to say. I whirled back toward her. You know what? I'm not some piece of property you can go around marking. You know I don't think that, she said, but there was no emotion behind her voice. She was as cold as ice. Always had been. What do you want with me anyway? I demanded. You know nothing will ever happen between us. She just stood there staring at me with complete confidence written across her face. Then it hit me. If she couldn't have me, no one could. To hell with her. I could hang out with whomever I pleased. I stomped away from Lena and headed down the hall in search of Nadine. I'd never seen her in the foyer, so I didn't know which way she'd gone. Heck, I didn't even know for sure if she'd seen... It could all be a stupid manipulation tactic from Lena to get me to tell Nadine I kissed another girl. Yeah, I got that I was supposed to be playing the asshole, but I wasn't that kind of asshole. I had to explain to her what happened. I wandered down the hall and checked the cafeteria, then tried a couple study areas, but I didn't spot Nadine. I turned around and headed in the other direction toward the lounge. My stomach flipped when I caught sight of her, but it immediately dropped when I noticed everything else about the scene. It was all wrong. Nadine was dressed in a sexy little number that left little to the imagination. It seemed like something Chloe or Lena would wear, but not my sweet Nade. I barely recognized her. It wasn't just the outfit she was wearing either. It was the look in her eyes I'd never seen before. Something dark and sinister lurked beneath the surface, like she was under some sort of spell. The worst part, though, was Ryan. Nadine sat in his lap, her arm draped around his shoulder. His hand rested so low on her hip he was practically touching her ass. I think I'd remember you, Nadine said in a voice that wasn't quite her own. Ryan practically undressed Nadine with his eyes. I'll give you something to remember. Red-hot rage ignited inside of me. How about a broken jaw? I snapped. Nadine turned toward me and she smirked proudly. Ryan chuckled. You really think you can take me, Taylor? Don't forget what happened last time. Your backup's not around this time, I pointed out. Let Nadine go. Ryan smirked, like my attempt to rescue her was nothing short of amusing. You act like I'm the one who initiated this. 
I think the girl can speak for herself. I crossed my arms and looked to Nadine, a single eyebrow raised. Nade? She practically beamed. Ryan and I were just hanging out. Ryan and Nadine would never just hang out. Someone must have slipped her a potion or something. You're not thinking straight, I insisted. Let's go. I reached for Nadine's wrist, though I was careful to be gentle with her. Nadine got to her feet, but so did Ryan. He took her other wrist like he was laying his claim on her. She glanced between the two of us, looking mildly pleased. Ryan puffed out his chest. You're going to have to fight for her. Thwack! My fist connected with Ryan's jaw before he could finish his sentence. Hell yeah, I was going to fight for Nadine, and I was going to get a good swing in before he went all telekinetic crazy on me. Pain shot through my knuckles, but it was worth every ounce. Ryan's head snapped backward and his eyes rolled into his skull. His body slumped onto the couch. A girl sitting nearby gasped while the guy next to her beamed at the sight of a fight. Nadine's eyes went wide as she looked down to Ryan's unconscious body. Lucas! At first I thought she was scolding me, but she turned to me with an expression of exhilaration written on her face. I shook my hand out. Lucky shot, I guess. Let's get out of here. I took Nadine's hand and we hurried out of the lounge. She followed without resisting. I dragged her into a dark, empty room down the hall and took her face in my hands. I searched her eyes for dilation, but they looked normal. And yet I couldn't help but get lost in them. Once my eyes began to roam her features, I couldn't look away. Nadine shot a glance toward the door. Um, Lucas... What are you doing? I'm checking to see if you've been drugged. What? Nadine slapped my hands away. I haven't been drugged. Then what the hell is wrong with you, Nade? I snapped. Heat flared deep in my belly just thinking about her with Ryan. She crossed her arms. Nothing's wrong with me. That was all me back there. This isn't you, I argued. I eyed her up and down. The new look was stunning, but it wasn't her. I much preferred her usual look, tight jeans and long sleeves. You don't dress like that, and you don't act like that. I could say the same about you, she yelled. I thought you didn't date. My breath caught. I didn't need any more confirmation than that. She'd seen Lena kiss me. I raked my fingers through my hair. Nade, it's not what you think. She raised an eyebrow. Oh, what is it that I think? I frowned. I know you saw me and Lena in the foyer. She pursed her lips. Yeah, how is the new girlfriend? She's not my... <sighs> I blew out a breath of exasperation. Lena kissed me, okay? I didn't kiss her back, and I'd never want to. Nadine's features fell, and she blinked a few times. Oh, well, that's... She trailed off, looking deeply contemplative. A few moments passed before I broke the silence. So do I get an explanation, or... Where is that motherfucker? A voice sounded down the hall, cutting me off. Instinctively, I grabbed Nadine's shoulders and pressed her up against the wall, pushing both of us deep into the shadows. The two of us held our breaths as we listened to the sound of Ryan's footsteps pound down the hall toward us. I finally let out a breath when he passed. It was only then that I became acutely aware of how close Nadine and I were. I'd sandwiched her between myself and the wall, and I could feel her heartbeat against me. Her breasts were pressed firmly against my chest, and my jeans started to tighten. I jumped away from her quickly, and I cleared my throat. My eyes darted around the room. Anything not to look her in the eyes while my dick calmed the F down. It was the first time I noticed what room I'd dragged her into. It was one of those fitness rooms, complete with those big yoga balls, towels, and a shelf packed full of rolled up yoga mats. My eyes fell on a box marked, lost and found, and I noticed a black fleece and yoga pants inside. I grabbed them and shoved them at Nadine. Put these on. She gaped at me. I'm a big girl. I can wear whatever I want. I looked to her arms, which were covered in goosebumps, then shrugged. Suit yourself. She wrapped her arms around herself like she'd just noticed how cold she was. She glanced to the clothes, then narrowed her eyes at me. 
I'm only doing this because I'm cold. She snatched the clothes up and started putting them on. I peeked out into the hall. Ryan stood at the end of it, his hands curled into fists. He twitched his fingers, and the door next to him swung open. A loud bang sounded through the hall. I whirled back to Nadine. Ryan's coming. She zipped up the fleece and shrugged. Then we're going to have to make a run for it. My gaze roamed over the room. Want to take the window? Nadine smirked. I do love sneaking around. Then let's hurry. I started across the room with her, but I stopped mid-stride. Something about the yoga mats called to me. I remembered how much Nadine said she liked it. I turned back to the shelf and grabbed two mats, then subconjured them. Lucas, she hissed. She already had the window open and was straddling the sill. That's stealing. Bang. Another door crashed open, closer this time. We'll bring them back. Let's go. I nudged Nadine out the window and she jumped to the ground. I stuck my head out the window to see her catching her balance. You okay? I asked. Nadine didn't get a chance to respond. Taylor, Ryan growled behind me. We hadn't been quick enough. I whirled around just in time to see Ryan lifting his hand toward me. A dark ball of defensive magic formed inside of it. I wasn't sticking around to see which spell he wanted to use on me. I jumped out the window and landed in the grass beside Nadine. Hurry, she chuckled under her breath, like running from a madman thrilled her. Nadine and I locked hands and ran toward the forest. A ball of magical energy whizzed past us, missing my head by a hair. Ryan was pretty set on revenge, but the trees were thick and made good cover. This way, I said. I tugged on her hand and pulled her behind a thick tree. The two of us crouched down beside each other. I braced myself against the tree and Nadine pressed her back to it. I couldn't help but notice how close we were again. Her chest rose and fell rapidly, and her breath touched the side of my face. It sent my heart beating double time. While Nadine's eyes darted around the forest, I kept my eyes on her. What I wouldn't give to lean in and kiss those sweet, soft lips of hers. I think he's gone, she whispered. I breathed a sigh of relief, though all I wanted was to stay in this position, to be as close to her as I could without touching her. If only I could... I wondered where we'd be now. The images that crossed my mind were dangerous. I cleared my throat and stood. Now that I had a moment to calm down, I realized how cold it was. There'd been snowfall after Halloween, but it was nothing more than a light dusting. Still, tonight was pretty chilly. I reached out to help Nadine to her feet. You okay? She brushed her hair out of her eyes. Yeah, I'm fine. You? Good, for now, I told her. Ryan's not going to rest until I pay for that. She winced playfully. Yeah, it must have really hurt his pride. What were you doing with him? I asked. She dropped her gaze. Honestly? I nodded. Honestly. She bit her lower lip, which only made me want to kiss her more. Honestly, I don't know. My eyebrows shot up. You don't know? Yeah, she snapped. I'd really like not to talk about it right now. My heart dropped. I didn't know what she meant by that, but she sounded pretty serious. Her face fell, and I realized in that moment that a lecture from me was the last thing she needed. I didn't know what was going on with her, but I could see it in her eyes. Right now, all she needed was a friend. Okay, we won't talk about it, I agreed. The sound of leaves crunching in the distance caught my attention. We should hide, Nadine suggested. I placed my index finger over my mouth. Shh, you like haunted houses, don't you? Her eyes lit up, but her features quickly turned into a mock scowl. Not if it's anything like last time. It won't be, I promised with a smirk. This one's not actually haunted. She narrowed her eyes like she couldn't figure out what I had in mind. But like the curious soul she was, she agreed to come with me. I want to see it. Good goddess, this girl would do anything to satisfy her curiosity. It was going to come back and bite her in the ass someday. This way, I cocked my head and Nadine followed beside me. 
I navigated through the woods by sheer intuition and a vague memory. We walked for at least fifteen minutes until I finally spotted the clearing in the trees. Is this another kidnapping attempt? Nadine teased as she ducked under a tree branch. Indeed, I told her. She rolled her eyes. You gotta stop doing that, Lucas. But you're just so easy to kidnap. She shrugged. You know how to intrigue a girl. I turned serious again. You're free to go whenever you want, but we're here. I pulled back a tree branch and Nadine's eyes sparkled in wonder. In the clearing stood an abandoned Gothic mansion. It looked a lot like the school, with the sharp, peaked roofs, tall turrets, and thick wooden doors, but it was smaller. The walls were made of stone, which was probably why it had stood so long. Ivy grew up the side of the house. The place was absolutely stunning when the clearing was in full bloom and the ivy blanketed the house in green, but right now everything was just kind of dead and sad. And yet, Nadine couldn't take her eyes off it. It was like she saw beauty in the house I couldn't quite see myself. Wow, she breathed. This place is amazing. Can you imagine if someone fixed this place up how beautiful it would be? Yeah, I bet it was really nice when it was built, I said. Want to see inside? Nadine nodded eagerly. We stepped up to the house and entered through the front doors. Hardwood floors spanned in front of us, and a banister that led upstairs was intricately carved, interweaving all the five cast symbols in a beautiful work of art. There wasn't any furniture, and all the cupboards were bare. Like on the outside of the house, ivy grew on the inside, too, weaving its way through broken windows and overtaking practically everything. Nadine's jaw dropped. This architecture is amazing. Look at the archways and crown molding. What is this place? I explained as we walked through the rooms. It used to belong to one of the headmasters of the school. It was abandoned when he died. Legend has it the house will only reveal itself to those who wish not to harm it. Her eyebrows shot up. I guess that's why it makes a good hideout from Ryan. Exactly. I stated. That idiot would fuck this place up. Anyway, Grant and I found it last year. Nadine reached out a hand and ran her fingers across the wall. How often do you come back? I haven't been back, I admitted. We explored, saw what there was to see, and left. But this place is just so beautiful, she whispered. It was. But it was just a house, and it was on the cusp of collapse. Nadine's eyes continued to wander as we entered the sitting room. It was my favorite room in the house because of the massive fireplace. The black mantle was intricately carved, making it the clear centerpiece of the home. The rest of the room was empty, save for a pile of firewood someone must have brought in a few years ago. There was a thick layer of dust over all the firewood, though it hadn't started to rot. Nadine drew a breath when she saw the fireplace, then turned to me. Are you sure the house isn't haunted? She sounded a little disappointed. I'm sure. Let me show you. I took Nadine's shoulders and guided her to stand in the middle of the room. Close your eyes. Nadine did as I instructed and inhaled a deep breath. I found myself walking in a circle around her, inspecting her features from every angle. She looked so at peace, so alive and eager for answers. There was this spark inside of her that glowed bright, and like a moth to a flame... I couldn't resist being drawn in. She took another calming breath. Now what, Lucas? I stopped behind her. We were so close we nearly touched. My pulse quickened, though I resisted the urge to pull her into my arms. What do you feel? I whispered in her ear. I could have sworn I saw her shiver, but it must have been from the cold. I feel at peace. She finally said, I feel like I could be happy here forever. There's this warmth inside the house, like it was built on happiness. But there's something missing. It's like it's fading, like it's losing its memory. All it needs is someone to nurture it. I stepped around her to look at her from the front again. Her eyes opened and her cheeks blushed pink. Was that the wrong answer? I shook my head. There are no wrong answers. What does it mean? She asked. 
For one, you're intuitive, I said. She tilted her head to the side. Aren't most witches? I nodded. True, it also means there are no benevolent spirits hanging around. I'm not a seer, though, she pointed out. I can't tell when there are spirits around. Not the way a seer can, but even humans can feel the negative energy of a benevolent ghost, I explained. Good to know we're in the clear. Nadine spun around again, taking in all the little details she didn't see the first time. It's a shame that no one is taking care of this place. I just want to sweep it or something. I've got it. I stood in the middle of the room and raised my hands. Peppermint patty and grass so green make this room sparkling clean. Purple magic swirled out of my hands, causing dust to rise off the floor. It gathered into a cloud at the base of the fireplace, then swept up through the chimney and out of the house. I looked to my feet and ran the tip of my shoe across the floor. It was totally clean. Nadine's eyebrows shot up. I can't wait until I learn cleansing spells. I shrugged. Cleansing incantations are easy. You just make shit up. She looked amused. Oh, so you're a poet now? You get a feel for it, I said. Nadine wrapped her arms around herself. You called? I asked. She nodded. November's not exactly known for its warm temperatures. Hold on. I knelt at the fireplace and started building a fire with the bits of tinder next to it. I conjured a lighter and lit it, then added bigger pieces of wood. Nadine knelt beside me and warmed her hands. She breathed a sigh of relief. I watched her for several moments until she lifted her gaze and caught me staring. I cleared my throat and stood, then did the only thing I could think of to keep my hands busy. I conjured the two yoga mats I'd borrowed from school and laid them out on the floor in front of the fireplace. Nadine talked so much about how she liked yoga and needed to get back into it. Maybe this would help her, or at least give me a chance to apologize. She eyed the yoga mats. What are you doing? I kicked my shoes off and stood on one of the mats. I placed my hands together at my heart and closed my eyes. I lifted one foot and tried to balance on the other, but my balance was shit. I stood back on two feet and peeked an eye open. I'm doing yoga. What does it look like? Nadine laughed and stepped onto the yoga mat beside me. Need some help? I resisted the urge to smile. I really liked that we were getting along for once. You're the expert. Nadine lowered herself onto the mat and crossed her legs. I mirrored her posture. Let's just breathe for a minute, she suggested. Nadine went silent. For the first minute or so, it was really hard not to let my mind wander and my body wiggle. But the longer Nadine just sat there breathing, taking in the moment, the more I came to appreciate it, too. I felt grounded, rooted, right here with Nadine. My mind wasn't on my gift, my brother, my mom, my classes, any of that. I was just right here, drinking in every second I could with Nadine. How could I have been such a jerk to her? She didn't deserve any of that. She deserved to be loved. Nadine shifted and got onto all fours on the mat. She arched her back, pointing her belly toward the floor. I couldn't help but steal a glance at her ass, which made my pulse quicken. Do you know any yoga? Nadine asked, snapping me out of it. My eyes shot back up toward her face. No. This is cow pose, she told me. Then you arch your back the other way. She brought her chin inward and curled her spine. And you have cat pose. I tried it along with her, and I was surprised at how much it stretched my back. It actually really felt good, like I could breathe easier. Nadine walked me through several other simple poses downward-facing dog, cobra, and my favorite, mountain, since we just stood up and it was really easy. She explained each one until she seemed to disappear into her own little world. Soon she was moving slowly to her own muse, without speaking to me at all. She stopped in a pose that had one foot forward and the other pressed firmly to the floor. She held both arms out parallel to the floor. What's this one? I asked. She inhaled a deep breath like she was enjoying herself. Warrior too. Feels good, doesn't it? Yeah, I whispered. It felt really good to be around her. 
Nadine opened her eyes, then stepped out of the pose. She straightened her fleece and sat on the ground again. Thanks for doing this, Lucas. I forgot how much it helped. I didn't even realize what I was doing when I sat beside her and took her hand. I began massaging it like she said she liked. I knew her joints always hurt, and I just wanted to help. I shrugged. I didn't do anything. She got really silent after that, but she didn't pull away from me. She just let me run my fingers over her hands. They were so soft and small. She seemed so fragile. Do you have any other poems? Nadine asked to break the silence. Poems? I asked, then realized she was talking about spells. You mean incantations? No, she replied. Like actual poems. You seem like you'd be good at them. I kept my gaze on her hands and shrugged. Deep down, my heart warmed. No one had ever said I'd be good at poetry, and I really wanted to impress Nadine. I knew whatever came out was going to sound like shit, but I just started spewing words without thinking about it. Your eyes are like the stars, twinkling so bright. Your smile is like the sunrise, bringing light to night. Your laugh is like the soundtrack to Alora's great divine. But if one thing lights the world at all, it's your soul that really shines. My cheeks flamed when I realized what I just said. Did I seriously just improv poetry in front of Nadine? She must have thought I was such a nerd. She didn't say anything at first, which made me really nervous. I lifted my gaze to hers, and that's when I noticed her eyes sparkling with tears. My stomach twisted into knots. What's wrong? She shook her head and pulled her hand away from mine to wipe her eyes. Nothing. It was really good. I was stunned. Was she just saying that? Nadine looked like she was going to add something, but she hesitated. What is it? I asked. I was dying to know her every thought. She took a few moments to respond. Why do you act like such a jerk? My heart fell. That wasn't exactly the kind of thing a guy hoped to hear. I don't know, I lied. The truth was, we both knew exactly why. But it was hard to be a jerk all the time, because that wasn't who I was. Apparently, I was somewhat of a poet-writing romantic. Who knew? You're not a jerk, though, she said softly. Not for real. My heart felt like it was turning to stone in my chest. I felt really guilty for the way I'd treated her. Well, I act like one. Doesn't that make me one? Nadine swallowed. It depends on the intentions. Fuck. Even Nadine could see straight through me. Was it this connection we had, or was I really that transparent? The truth was, I was sick of pretending to be a jerk all the time when all I wanted to do was be near her. But could we really just stay friends? We had to, because there was no other alternative. By the grace of Mother Miriam, I couldn't stay away from Nadine. It was like we were pushed together by some divine force that wouldn't freaking give up. I wasn't sure I really had a choice anymore. I was just making it harder on both of us. I'm sorry. My voice came out so small I wasn't sure Nadine heard me. She perked up. What? I shoved my pride deep down inside of myself and cleared my throat. I'm sorry. I said more clearly this time. I'm sorry I was such a jerk to you. It wasn't fair to you, and I said things I never should have said. She took a deep breath. So did I. What you said was fair, though, I pointed out. Her lips tightened. Why do you do that? Do what? I asked. You just, I don't know, accept the worst-case scenario, she said. You put yourself down and focus on the negative. That's not true, I argued. Really? She raised an eyebrow. When was the last time you focused on the positive? I opened my mouth to answer, but the words halted on my tongue. It seemed the only time I was ever positive was around her. 
That was the moment it hit me. Why I craved Nadine's company so much. When I was around her, I felt a positive spark in my heart. She literally brought to life parts of me I long thought were dead and buried. I wasn't just bullshitting with that poem earlier. She literally brought light into my life. I didn't know how to tell her that, so instead I answered her first question. I guess I act like a jerk as a defense mechanism. Nadine's shoulders dropped and sympathy crossed her face. I wish you didn't feel like you had to defend yourself. The knots in my abdomen eased. Her words were a relief, an invitation to let life flow through me instead of bottling it up all the time. It was strange, like she was going against everyone else's unwritten rules. Another reason why I couldn't keep myself from falling for her. It's okay, Lucas, she whispered. You don't have to defend yourself around me. You don't have to hide. Neither do you, I assured her softly. She nodded her hands together in her lap. So you've noticed. Noticed what? I asked curiously. Her voice cracked and it broke my heart. That I hide. That there's this piece of me that I push deep down inside until my walls crack and she comes flooding out. She? I wasn't sure where she was going with this. Sure, sometimes Nadine acted out of character, like earlier with Ryan, but she spoke as if she was hiding a secret identity or something. Nadine didn't look at me when she spoke. She doesn't have a name. I just know she's not me. Oh, shit. I had no idea that Nadine was hurting this much. I didn't know what kind of secrets she was hiding, but that was the thing about this coven. It was full of secrets. If there was one thing I learned as the Reaper's Apprentice, it was that everyone had secrets. I wanted to know Nadine's, but I feared if I pressed her, it'd only push her away. In what way? I asked, trying my best to be gentle with her. Nadine kept her gaze on her hands. I've learned to control it, mostly. But sometimes this dark side of me just comes out and I can't stop it until she's satisfied. All I wanted to do was rip the demons out of her and make them my own. I reached out and gently brought her chin up so she'd look at me. Our eyes searched each other's for several long moments before I finally spoke. Don't hide from me, Nade, I said. I'll never judge you. A smile touched the corners of her mouth. Then suddenly the confessions started spilling out. It's hard to explain, but I've always felt like I had this darkness inside of me. When I was a kid, my teachers called me a problem child. If I got upset, even over the littlest thing, I'd freak out. Someone sat too close to me, I'd hit them. Someone took the jump rope I wanted at recess, I'd pick a fight. I can't tell you how many times I was sent to the principal's office. I got kicked off the bus for pulling a girl's hair out. My parents eventually started homeschooling me when I stopped doing my work. She continued like she couldn't stop herself. I went through a couple years of therapy, but it was really my lupus that changed me. I guess on some level it was sort of a blessing. My diagnosis was a huge wake-up call. I had to learn to control myself to keep my symptoms from flaring. It was like the angrier I got, the more pain I felt. She took a breath. Eventually, I returned to public school for high school. I learned how to control my temper, but it still comes out sometimes. I just wish I could get rid of it, you know? It's not me. Like when I almost ran Ryan over with my car, or how I acted with him today. I don't even know why I did it. It already feels surreal, like a dream. I pressed my lips together, contemplating her story. That darkness she spoke of was far from the Nadine I knew. I'm sorry, Nade, I said. No one should have to deal with that. She shrugged like it wasn't that big of a deal, but I knew she was underplaying it. Constantly watching her own behavior had to be taxing on her. It is what it is, she said. Can I ask you something? Anything, I replied. She spoke slowly, like she was choosing her words with care. What's the deal with you and Ryan? 
Do you two have a history or something? Oh boy, here we go. I didn't really want to talk about it, but Nadine didn't want me to hide around her. Just the opportunity to lay it all out there on the table was freeing. I wanted her to know everything. I just hoped it didn't change her opinion of me. I sighed. Ryan and I were buddies in high school. We formed the treacherous tarantulas together. Nadine's eyebrows shot up. You were a tarantula? I chuckled. I wasn't just one of them. I was their leader. Nadine's jaw dropped further. Lucas Taylor, the lone wolf in a gang? Who would have guessed? I was shocked by her reaction. She didn't look like she thought less of me. In fact, she eyed me up and down like the thought intrigued her. Maybe even, dare I say it, turned her on. I wasn't always a lone wolf, I said, but the tarantulas weren't always the low-life gang they are now. When we formed, it was about brotherhood. We stood to protect other people. When we saw something we didn't think was right, we'd stand up to it. You know, guys pushing other people around in the locker room, pressuring girls in the hallways, that sort of thing. That sounds incredible, Nadine praised. She looked at me with dreamy eyes like she was picturing me walking down the halls in my leather jacket and whipping other kids into shape. What happened to the group? After graduation, Ryan got into the drug scene, I explained. Shocker, she said flatly. Right? I chuckled. Anyway, he got the other guys to agree to dealing. They were all enticed by the money and the drugs, but I couldn't do it. I tried to stick it out, but then they pulled this sick prank on Grant and stole his insulin. That was the last straw. I'd left the group, and they've had it out for me ever since. They call it a betrayal, but I call it a mutiny. Nadine frowned. I'm sorry, Lucas. I had no idea. I shrugged. It's good, I guess. I've got Grant now, and he's a better friend than all five of the tarantulas put together. He is cool, she agreed. A silent beat passed. Neither of us knew what to say next. Nadine hesitated, then broke the silence. So what were you like before the tarantulas ditched you? Were you happier? The question hit me hard in the gut. Was I happier? Yes and no. In a different way, I admitted. But a lot has happened since then. There are other reasons that I'm so... I don't know, me. You can tell me, Nadine offered. You didn't judge me, and I'm not going to judge you. I knew Nadine was being honest, but I had a hard time talking about this at all. I pretty much tried not to think about it myself, but pushing it down made the memories stew, made them that much more painful. I knew it, and yet I couldn't face them. Nadine reached out and touched my hand. My breath caught. It was my brother. The words spilled out. I loved him so much, and when he left, it was like, like a part of me left with him. I get it, Nadine whispered, her eyes twinkling with tears. I feel the same way about my parents. A lump rose to my throat. I started talking to get it to budge, and I just couldn't stop after that. My brother and I were really close growing up. My dad was a total asshole, always yelling and starting fights with my mom. She excuses his behavior because he never touches her, but he gets his work in. He's a mentalist, has telekinesis. When he gets mad, glasses break, things start flying around the room, and he takes it out on Mom. Nadine's hand went to her mouth. The worst one was when Dad got in one of his fits. Mom says she tripped, but Eric and I both knew Dad used his magic to push her down the stairs. She broke her hand. Lucas, I'm so sorry you had to grow up with that, she said. Don't be, I told her. It's not your fault. Anyway, Eric and I bonded over our fear of our father. We didn't spend a lot of time at home since he didn't want us around anyway, so we spent all our time together. My entire body tensed at the memories. Things changed after his evoking ceremony. He became a seer. He couldn't see ghosts, but he could hear their thoughts. He described it to me as this constant, annoying chatter he couldn't turn off. I mean, maybe I should be grateful. 
At least I only hear a couple thoughts a day. With Eric, it was constant. I guess he just couldn't take it anymore. The night I did my evoking ceremony, my breath halted. I didn't know if I could say it out loud, but maybe it would help. That night, Eric hung himself in the garage. I spat out. Nope. Not better. Not better at all. The confession was like knives through my heart. I didn't think I'd ever said it out loud. I knew that Erica was gone, but I didn't think I'd come to terms with the fact that he killed himself. It wasn't like it was an accident. He left me by choice. That single thought made me want to hurl. It was selfish to think that way. Eric had been struggling, but I couldn't help him. Yet here I was blaming him. I wasn't being fair. I didn't even know I felt that way until now. I pressed my face into my hands to hide myself from Nadine. I was supposed to be strong, not some emotional wreck for her to piece back together. This was why I didn't open up, because when I did, it all came flooding out all at once. Lucas. Nadine's voice was like a song, a soft, comforting song that kept me grounded to reality. She reached out and took my wrists, then pulled them down from my face. I was embarrassed for her to see tears dotting my eyes. But she stared straight at me like she saw past them, like she saw me. You don't have to hide from me, remember? She asked. I choked back a sob. You don't know the worst part, Nade. I want to, she whispered. I want to hear it. I turned my head away from her. She waited. The silence was almost more agonizing than the confessions. You know how I hear the last thought of the dead? I asked her. She nodded. I forced down the lump in my throat. Well, the night my powers awakened, Eric's last thoughts were the first I heard. Tears spilled over Nadine's lids, which only caused mine to flow. I dashed them away. Sure, open up to Nadine, see what she thinks of you now. I bet she thought I was a freaking joy to be around. If I wanted to chase her away, I should have started crying sooner. Who wanted to be around the guy who was so weak he couldn't even hold his tears in? Nadine reached for my hand again. She pulled it away from my face so I couldn't wipe the tears. Don't do that, she said. Do what? My voice cracked. Cry? She shook her head. No, don't push it back in. I have to, I argued. Otherwise I'm weak. She ran her thumbs across my face and wiped the tears for me. They only continued to fall harder. Crying doesn't make you weak, she said. It's an opportunity to grow. I laughed nervously. And you call me the poet. Shh, Nadine whispered. Let's not talk. And then the strangest thing happened. Nadine crawled into my lap. I didn't know where it came from, but here she was, snuggling close to me. Not because she wanted something from me, but because she wanted to comfort me. I wondered for so long what that might feel like. For someone to love me unconditionally and expect nothing in return. It was the most amazing feeling in the world. But it felt wrong, too. It felt like I was stealing from her. Stealing what? I didn't know. This moment, perhaps? She could be anywhere, doing anything right now. And she chose to be in my arms. I wrapped her close to me, holding her to my chest. And yet somehow it felt like she was holding me. Nadine's rosy scent surrounded me and her warm body sent the chill away. Though my eyes were closed and my nose pressed into her hair, I could swear I could see the light radiating off of her. 
peace washed over me. And for the first time in my life, the tears stopped on their own. I didn't have to force them. I drew away from her and whispered, Why are you doing this, Nade? She looked into my eyes, which made my heart melt. I never knew how freeing it would be to hold her in my arms like this. Doing what? She asked. Why are you here with me? I questioned. Why do you like me? Nadine shrugged, but it was obvious she was stalling. There was an answer behind her eyes. I just couldn't read it. I like being with you, Lucas, she finally said. But why? I pressed. She sniffed. When I'm with you, I forget that my parents aren't alive. It was such a simple answer. But I felt it deep within my soul. Maybe Nadine and I were more alike than I thought. Maybe we weren't total opposites, light and dark. Maybe I brought a spark of light to her darkness, too. No, that was ridiculous. I had no light to share. But I'm broken, I told her. Not broken, she said softly. Just growing. No one had ever put it that way before. If I wasn't broken, maybe I didn't need to be fixed. If I was growing, then maybe the wounds would heal. Maybe it wasn't about putting the shattered bits back together and hoping the glue would stick. Maybe it was about growing new branches. I pressed my face back into her hair. I was quickly realizing it was the one place in the world where I felt my problems couldn't touch me. You have no idea what it means to hear you say that. Nadine wrapped her arms tight around me. There's more, you know. More what? I mumbled into her hair. More reasons why I like you, she said. There are? I asked curiously. Nadine reached up a hand and started running it through my hair. I like to think I see the real Lucas beneath the layers. I didn't even know what that meant. I am the layers. No, she said. You're not your past. You're not your darkness. That's what my therapist always told me. You, Lucas, you're kind and protective and fun. You have a heart so big it should have its own satellite. I chuckled lightly. Part of me actually believed what she was saying. You are selfless, she continued. You have this desire to take on everyone else's pain just so they won't suffer. If you could, you'd take on the sins of the world. I stared down at her. I searched for the lie, but it wasn't there. She really believed everything she was saying. You, you see all that in me? She nodded. I just wish you did too. I told myself I'd resist, but I couldn't anymore. Everything Nadine had said was what I needed to hear, and more. She was beyond anything I could ever imagine, and I'd be damned if I hadn't fallen head over heels in love with her. I brought my lips to hers. She melted into my kiss like ice on a warm summer's day. The thought to pull away, to resist, never crossed my mind. All I wanted was this moment. If I was to steal anything from her, it was this kiss, right now. Kissing Nadine was like standing on top of a cliff. My toes lined up with the edge and my arms opened wide. She was that moment as I raised my heels from the ground and tilted forward, the split second you thought you had before you could stop the freefall. Her kiss was that wild adrenaline rush, suspended in time, I was safe here, and I was free. Nadine parted her lips, and my tongue slid into her mouth. My heart beat frantically, and my jeans tightened. She was so warm in my arms that I never wanted to let her go. I thought I'd have to, but the kiss didn't end. Nadine wrapped her arms around my neck and continued making out with me. 
her breasts pressed tight against my chest, and that was the moment I lost it. I went free-falling down that cliff, and I couldn't catch my balance. The room spun around me, and I couldn't hold Nadine up any longer. I gently lowered her to the mat beneath us. She moaned as my kisses continued across her lips. Her noises were like a symphony to my ears. I loved every sound she made. Nadine's hands continued to roam through my hair, and it felt amazing. I couldn't stop my hands from running up and down her sides. I wasn't on top of her, more or less propped up at her side, but I wanted to be. I wanted to be with her in every sense of the word. I wanted to fight for her tooth and nail. But I couldn't. And I knew that. In this moment, though, it didn't seem to matter. I didn't push her away like all the other times, because if this moment was all I ever had with Nadine, I was going to bask in the warmth of every second I could get from it. I wasn't going to ruin it this time. Eventually, Nadine pulled away. I pushed myself onto my elbow and hovered above her. The light from the fire flickered off her face, and I'd be damned if it wasn't the most beautiful thing I'd seen in all my life. Is something wrong? I asked. No, she said softly. Would you just hold me? She didn't have to ask twice. Nadine rolled onto her side. I lay next to her, my front pressing against her back. I draped one arm over her. She fit so perfectly into my arms like it was where she was meant to be. Nadine went quiet for a long time. After a while, I noticed she was shivering. Are you cold? I asked. I didn't know how. I was radiating so much heat I was practically sweating. Being near her made me hot all over. No, she said. I just want to ask you something. I don't know how. You can ask me anything, I told her. She shifted and rolled over to face me. She rested her face on her hand, and her hair spilled across the floor. We just lay there staring at each other. It was a beautiful moment I wished would never end. I've wanted to ask you for a while, but I know you don't like to talk about your gift, she said. Ask me anything, I offered. I wasn't so scared to share with her anymore. She took a deep breath. I know it's a long shot, but did you hear my parents when they died? My body tensed. This wasn't the first time someone had asked what their loved one's last thoughts were. I didn't like to answer because it usually wasn't what they wanted to hear. That. And last thoughts were Reaper's apprentice privileges only. It violated the integrity of the job if I went around telling everyone what I heard. But this was Nadine. I didn't want to lie to her. I answered carefully. Your father was never part of the coven, so I didn't hear him. And my mother? She asked. I nodded slowly. I heard her. Her eyes filled with hope. Can you tell me what she said? This was where things got hard. Her mom's last thought was complicated, a mix of good and bad all wrapped into one. The coven's in danger. Stay safe, Nadine. I love you. This thought had been weighing on me for months. I didn't know what it meant. I couldn't investigate either because I didn't know where to start. For all I knew, her mom was as confused as old man Keller. I couldn't tell Nadine. I didn't want her to know her mom died worrying about her. If I told her the truth, she'd want to fix whatever danger her mother spoke of. She'd get herself hurt looking for answers. I wanted to tell her, but I couldn't until I knew what it meant. She said she loved you, I told her honestly. It was only half of it, but it was true nonetheless. Nadine's eyes glistened. Is that true, or is that just what you tell everybody? It is what I tell everybody, 
I admitted. But in this case, it's true. She sniffled. Thank you, Lucas. I love her, too. I couldn't bear to see her upset. I leaned forward and kissed her again. She reached up and placed her hand on the side of my face, and that warmth ignited in my heart all over again. The kiss didn't last long, though. A few moments later, she drew away, her eyes searching mine. Why are you kissing me, Lucas? I was struck by the question. Don't you want me to? I do, but you're kind of sending me mixed signals, she said. Do you want this or not? I hesitated. Of course I did. I wanted every moment with Nadine and more. But I didn't want her to get hurt. I do, I told her honestly. I wish there was a way we could be together, but... But if we were, this is as far as we could go, she finished for me. We can't have what every other couple has. Her voice was so sad, so melancholy. When we first met, I thought she was just chasing me for the thrill of it. I thought she'd get over me once I turned her down. But it wasn't like that between us. Nadine and I were drawn like magnets. And now that we'd come together, nothing could come between us. Not even this stupid curse. Are you okay with that? I asked. I held my breath, awaiting the answer. Part of me feared both options. I don't know, she said finally. I think I need time to figure that out. Then we won't make any decisions right now, I promised. Okay, she agreed. At least now we can be friends. I smiled, a real genuine smile. I didn't know how she did that to me. Agreed. We're done arguing. I'm done pushing you away. She closed her eyes and sighed blissfully. That sounds good. I reached out and took Nadine's hand. She lay there looking perfectly content while I ran my thumb across the back of her hand. It was in that moment that I realized it didn't matter which decision Nadine made. There would never be anyone else. Nadine would always be it for me. I just hoped I could handle her decision. Chapter 18 Nadine I needed Lucas in my life. It didn't matter that we couldn't be together in the way that I wanted. I needed him near me the way I needed the very air I breathed. Without him, I was caged, but when he was around, I was a free bird, soaring the skies. I could almost believe the two of us were capable of anything together. Something changed when Lucas brought me to that abandoned house. I didn't know if it was a change in him, or me, or both of us. It was like we could finally breathe again. The house was gorgeous, and there was a beautiful energy surrounding it that made it feel like home. It was crazy, considering the state of the place, but I just felt like I didn't have to hide anything there. I'd never felt so close to Lucas. When he stood next to me, I couldn't help but shiver. When he kissed me, the world seemed to tilt on its axis. It was magic. I walked through the school hallways the following week on this amazing, magical high. I felt energized, and my joints moved with ease. It was like Lucas's touch had a way of healing me. He was still waiting for an answer from me. Truth be told, I didn't want to think about that right now. We could figure out where we wanted to go with this later. Right now, I just wanted his company. Lucas met up with me in the hall after class on Wednesday. He carried my books, and I took his hand. It was instinctive now. It was like we couldn't be together without attaching ourselves. It turned a few heads, but I didn't care. Screw the haters. Let it be known that Lucas Taylor and Nadine Evers were a thing. A non-official thing, but a thing nonetheless. How was class? Lucas asked. I shrugged. Chloe drew the Seven of Swords. I think that means she's planning to act on her threat soon. Lucas's face paled. 
That's not good. It's okay, I said honestly. Now I have some warning. I can't say I'm surprised, though. I have a meeting with Verla today. I can expect Chloe to do something. Yeah, she's kind of predictable, Lucas said. But I'm not going to let her hurt you. My heart fluttered. Oh? How are you going to do that? He smiled. By not letting you out of my sight. I don't think Verla's going to let you in on my lesson, I pointed out. He shrugged. Then I'll stand outside the door. For how long? I asked, though I was really enjoying his offer. He slowed his step and turned to me. He pushed a strand of hair behind my ear, which made butterflies dance in my stomach. However long it takes, consider me your personal guard for the day. My heart totally melted. Thank you. No need to thank me, he replied gently. Lucas and I returned to my room to put my books away. Talia, Amy, and Mandy were there. Amy and Mandy poked at their phones while Talia flung around a string for Gus, Issa, and Stormy to chase. Hey! I greeted as I entered the room. What are you guys up to? Mandy looked up from where she lay on the couch. Looking at dress ideas for the midnight formal, I'm thinking full-on gothic. I was thinking of going with something white and sparkly, Amy said. Mandy's eyes lit up. Oh, it could be a theme. You could be like the good witch and I'll be the bad witch. Amy laughed. I love it. Consider me the good witch of the South, Talia said. I've got my pink dress picked out already. Do you have any ideas yet, Nadine? I shook my head. Lucas looked oddly uncomfortable with all the dress talk. I'll figure something out, I said. In the meantime, I have a meeting with Verla today. Talia's spine straightened. Issa grabbed a hold of the string with her paw and ripped it out of Talia's hands. She barely noticed. Uh-oh. Does that mean another sabotage? I crossed my arms and smirked. I was thinking so. Except this time, maybe we could be the ones doing the sabotage. Mandy beamed as she stood and gave me a salute. We're on it, girl. Talia and Amy jumped to their feet. You don't have to worry about Chloe, Talia promised. Go have fun at your lesson. Wait, I said. You mean I don't get to watch? Talia frowned. That would beat the point of distracting her for your lesson. I made a face. True. Any ideas? Amy stepped forward and patted me on the shoulder. You let us take care of that. You guys are the best. I reached out to hug each of them in turn, then turned back to Lucas. Are you ready? He asked. I took a deep breath. Yep, let's get this over with. Lucas took my hand and walked me to Headmistress Verla's office. Issa followed at my feet. She seemed to sense my discomfort. The whole time, I kept watch for Chloe, but I didn't see her anywhere. Maybe she'd finally given up. I knocked on Verla's office. Come in, she called. Lucas stood guard outside while I stepped inside. Verla shot me a kind smile, but she wasn't the only one here. Professor Damon, the jerk who'd called me a half-blood, sat in one of the chairs next to her desk. He barely looked my way. I hope I'm not interrupting, I said as Issa and I approached the desk. I'm here for my lesson. Verla gestured to the chair next to Professor Damon. You're not interrupting anything at all. In fact, we were waiting for you. I couldn't keep the disgust from my voice. What's he doing here? I'm here to help, he replied in a less than friendly tone. Something told me he wasn't very interested in helping me. I sat but remained at the edge of my seat. How? Issa looked to Odin, who was perched on a cat tower beside Verla's desk. She gave a low growl, then jumped into my lap. I stroked her to calm her down, but she kept throwing glances at Odin. 
I'd like to start where we left off last time, Verla said. I've invited Professor Damon here to help us run through some scenarios. Hopefully we won't be interrupted. I think we'll be okay, I told her. I trusted my friends to deal with Chloe. Verla straightened in her chair. Excellent. As you know, an evoking ceremony tests your emotional state. Everyone is tested differently based on their strengths and weaknesses. I thought we could talk about that before we try out some scenarios. I looked to Professor Damon, who held his nose high. I wasn't really interested in talking about my strengths and weaknesses in front of him. I scratched Issa behind the ears to keep my hands busy. Isn't that, um, kind of private? Well, yes, but... Verla started, but Professor Damon spoke at the same time. You want to pass your evoking ceremony, don't you? He sneered. What a prick. Yes, I said. Then let's get on with it, Professor Damon said. Verla looked a little shocked by his tone, but she brushed it off. She picked up a tablet on her desk and began scrolling through it. Nadine. I want you to rate the following statements from one to five, one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree. Okay. That didn't seem too hard. Verla cleared her throat and began reading off the list of questions. When I see someone being bullied, I feel the need to step in. Five. I answered automatically. Verla pressed her tablet, then moved on to the next question. I find it easy to forgive other people. I thought about that for a moment. Um, four. I often feel like other people don't like me. One, I said. I was a joy to be around. I get envious of other people easily. I paused for a moment. Usually, I'd answer one to this question, strongly disagree, but I couldn't help but recall how I felt when I saw Lena kissing Lucas. Three, I decided on. Verla went on like this for at least another fifteen minutes. Most of the questions I felt pretty comfortable with. Professor Damon's lips pressed into a thinner and thinner line as the minutes ticked by. It was almost like he was unhappy I wasn't a total train wreck. It wasn't until Verla neared the end that I started to feel the questions weighing on me. I find it easy to bounce back from hardship, she said. My stomach twisted into knots. I wanted it to be true, but I'd be lying if I said it was. Two, I told her. Professor Damon seemed pleased by that though I didn't know why. Wasn't he supposed to support his students? My moods are greatly affected by my situation, Verla continued. Five, I answered. I mean, who wasn't affected by their situation? I feel lonely when my loved ones aren't around. My gut sank at the mention of loved ones. All I could think about was my parents, and Verla's statement felt shockingly true in that moment. I sank deeper into my seat. Five, I said in a small voice. Verla eyed me like she sensed my discomfort. Just one more, Nadine. Memories of the people I've lost upset me. Okay, now I felt like she was doing it on purpose. Of course memories upset me. I said, suddenly feeling very defensive. I mean, who wouldn't be upset by losing someone? Verla kept her eyes on the tablet. Her expression didn't give anything away. So, where would you rate that? I hesitated, though I knew the answer. Finally, I spoke so soft I wasn't sure she heard me. Five. Verla took a deep breath and set the tablet aside. I think it's clear what we need to work on. What's that? I asked, a little scared to hear the answer. Verla gave me a sympathetic look. 
your grief. My breath halted. I knew I had work to do, but the way she said it, it was like I shouldn't be allowed to feel this way. But I should. I lost my parents for Alora's sake. Unless, unless Mother Miriam didn't want people like me in the coven. Am I not allowed to grieve? I asked in a small voice. Of course you are, Verla said kindly. But you can't shove it aside. You must work through it. I didn't want to. I wasn't ready. And I have to do that before my ceremony? I asked. Verla nodded. Mother Miriam will test your weaknesses. My bottom lip quivered. It felt as if the air was being sucked from the room. So if I can't get over it by then, that's it? I'm banished? I couldn't be. This was the only place where I had family and friends. I wasn't leaving the coven. Relax, Nadine, Verla said softly. I'm not asking you to get over it. All I'm asking for is progress. But I'm not ready. My voice cracked. Beside me, Professor Damon smirked like he was getting great joy out of this. What the fuck was his problem? You must try, Verla said. You must trust that Mother Miriam has a plan. If you don't show her that you're willing to change, your magic won't come. Headmistress Verla was really starting to scare me. How could I be asked to get over my parents' death so quickly? Surely Mother Miriam would understand. Yet part of me feared she wouldn't. I swallowed. I'll do anything to pass my ceremony. Then let's try our first scenario. Had Mistress Verla gestured to Professor Damon. Professor Damon is a unique type of mentalist. He can imprint pictures into your mind. It's a lot like the visions you'll see during your evoking ceremony. I turned to him, clutching the armrests of the chair so hard my knuckles turned white. I had to believe he was here to help me, because there was no alternative. Either he helped me get past this block, or I failed Mother Miriam's test. That wasn't an option. I'd do anything to stay here with Grammy, Lucas, Grant, and Talia. Okay, I said, my voice strong. How does this work? Professor Damon reached out a hand. My powers work through touch. I hesitated. Is it just visions, then? Or can you see other things in my mind? I wasn't about to let this stranger poke around in my head. I can project visions using memories of your past, Professor Damon explained. But I can't see anything you don't want me to see. It's perfectly safe, Nadine, Headmistress Verla assured me. I trusted her, and I really wanted to pass my ceremony, so I placed my hand in his. Immediately, the room around me disappeared. Instead, I stood at the edge of the road, it was nighttime, with nothing but the moon and stars above to light the landscape. Forest surrounded me at several angles, save for a clearing that gave way to a cliff. Below that spanned a large lake. The road curved along the outer edge of the lake, and a guardrail bordered the edge of the cliff. I glanced around. There was no motion, no sound. I don't get it! I called out to the darkness. I didn't know if I said the words aloud, but I sensed that Professor Damon could hear me. I waited another beat, and then I heard the sound of a vehicle approaching at high speed. The headlights flickered past trees in the forest, and the vehicle twisted and turned down the road. I expected the driver to slow, but they didn't. They just kept picking up speed. I knew that if they didn't hit the brakes soon— they wouldn't make it past the turn I stood at. I have to stop this, I thought. That was the answer to the test, right? Professor Damon wanted to see if I'd save them. Except there wasn't anything I could do. 
There wasn't enough time. I began running up the road. My heart slammed against my ribcage. I began to wave my hands in the air. Slow down! I cried, even though the driver couldn't hear me. There's a turn up ahead! You won't make it! The car sped by me so fast that it was there and gone in the blink of an eye. No! I cried hopelessly, running out into the middle of the road as I watched the car speed away. Horror struck when I spotted the license plate. It was so familiar, and it left this gaping hole in my heart. Professor Damon had dug into memories he shouldn't have. Mom! Dad! I screamed. I could hardly hear the sound of my own voice over the screech of the tires. Red brake lights lit up the night, a color that I sensed would haunt me for many nights to come. It was already too late. The car lost control and slammed into the guardrail. My stomach ached so badly, it was like the car had hit me. The guardrail crumpled like a piece of paper, and the car launched over top of it. Stop! I screeched. I threw my hands over my ears, but the sound of my parents' screams filled the vision. I heard the car hit the water, and then... silence. My ears rang, and my vision blurred. I didn't want to witness the aftermath, but my feet moved beneath me involuntarily. I stumbled toward the edge of the cliff. Somehow, I made it to the guardrail, and my hands splayed across the cool metal to steady myself. I leaned over to look, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Bile rose to my throat as I squeezed my eyes tightly shut. Stop it! I cried. I want out! Get me out of here! Nadine! Nadine! Verla's voice sounded just feet away from me. I felt the weight of Issa in my lap again, and I opened my eyes to see I was back in Verla's office. Sobs bubbled out of my throat, and my heart pounded. Verla shot Professor Damon a hard look, but he wore an expression of indifference. That was horrible, I spat. What did you do, Professor Damon? Verla demanded. My job, he told her simply, before turning to me. Believe me, Miss Evers, if you can't handle a simple vision such as this one... You won't pass your evoking ceremony. My hands trembled. I doubt Mother Miriam would be so heartless. That's not something anyone should ever witness. Professor Damon smirked. This just goes to show you're not ready, Miss Evers. I shot out of my chair so fast that Issa fell to the ground. Who are you to judge that? I snapped. You're cruel. Nadine, calm down, had Mistress Verla said softly. Let's discuss what happened. I opened my mouth, but nothing except a sob came out. I covered my mouth with my hand. I thought closing my eyes would help get rid of the image I'd just seen, but it only made it worse. The vision of the car falling off the road assaulted me. Then came flashes of other memories, real memories. I saw the caskets, then the gravestones, then the empty house. Even if I wanted to talk about it, I couldn't. My chest wound so tightly that I couldn't get a word out. Nadine, had Mistress Verla pressed. All I could do was shake my head. This was so embarrassing. I just wanted to hide in a hole. It felt like I was being buried in one already. I'm sorry, I managed to get out. I can't. I whirled around and ran for the door. Issa followed at my feet as I flung the door open and stormed out of the room. Nadine, had Mistress Verla called, but I ignored her. Lucas was leaning against the wall outside her office. I'd almost forgotten he was waiting for me. He straightened when he saw me and reached out for my arms. Nade, what's wrong? I heard the sound of Headmistress Verla's heels against the carpet, and I knew she was on her way across the room to follow me. I grabbed Lucas's hand. Let's go. Lucas didn't inquire any further. 
He followed me as we rushed away from Verla's office. It wasn't until we turned two other halls and I was certain we'd lost her that I finally slowed. Isa purred and rubbed herself against my leg. Lucas turned to me and took my face in his hands. Nave, what happened? I wiped my nose and sniffled. I tried to keep my voice steady, but it cracked. Professor Damon showed me a vision. It was supposed to be like one of Mother Miriam's tests, but it was awful. Lucas frowned. I'm so sorry, Nade. I took a breath, but I could hardly breathe. Lucas, he made me watch my parents die. His eyes went wide, then he wrapped me into a tight hug. His spicy scent surrounded me, and his chest felt warm against my cheek. After a few moments, I felt like I could breathe again. I wish I could make it better, Nade, Lucas whispered. You are making it better, I replied. Just being here with me is enough. My heart rate slowed, and I finally drew away to look up at him. I'm sorry I freaked out. I didn't mean to. Don't apologize, Lucas said. You're allowed to feel upset over this. I sniffled and wiped my nose again. Yeah, but if I can't handle this, how am I going to handle the ceremony? Lucas squeezed my hands. One step at a time, Nadine. The sound of heavy sobs came from down the hall. Lucas and I looked up to see Amy and Mandy walking our way. Mandy was hunched over and sobbing uncontrollably while Amy supported her. How did this happen? Mandy wailed. I don't know. Amy's voice cracked. We're going to get answers. We just need... Amy lifted her gaze, but she stopped dead in her tracks when she spotted Lucas and me. Her eyes widened and her jaw dropped. She looked like she'd seen a ghost. I glanced around the hall briefly, wondering if she really had seen a ghost. The hall was empty. Hey, guys, I said. What's wrong? I barely got the question out before Mandy squealed and raced over to me. Nadine! She flung her arms around my neck and drew me close. Amy came up beside her and pulled me into a group hug. Goddess, Nadine! You're okay! I drew away from them. Lucas looked just as confused as I was. I'm fine, I assured them. What's going on? Amy and Mandy exchanged a grave look. My face fell. What did Chloe do this time? Mandy wiped her tears. We're not sure if it was her, but considering you're standing right here... Lucas crossed his arms impatiently. Will you guys tell us what's going on? Amy hesitated. It's probably better if we show you. Just don't freak out. Yeah, because that was totally the way to stop me from freaking out. We can't make any promises, I told them. Amy and Mandy led us toward the foyer. When we got there, we saw that the front doors were open. Cold air rushed into the room, and the flames in the fireplace flickered. A huge crowd had gathered outside, and we couldn't see anything beyond them. I craned my neck. What's going on? Mandy took my arm. Come on. They'll make way for us. Mandy led me out the front doors and through the crowd. People murmured quietly, but they were dead silent when their eyes turned toward me. The sound of a woman's wail traveled across the yard. Above us, the clouds were dark, and the air was so cold it made me shiver. Mandy, what's going- I stopped dead in my tracks. The crowd parted enough that I finally caught a glimpse of what was happening. Two figures knelt at the base of a large oak tree. They were both sobbing. That's when I realized the wailing was coming from Talia. For a split second, I didn't realize why she was crying, or why Grant was next to her, trying to comfort her. Then my gaze lifted, and I saw what everyone was staring at. I saw the boots first. Black boots, 
just like mine. Then came the ripped skinny jeans, then the leather jacket, and then finally, my own face. I didn't know how it was happening, but my body hung from a noose in the tree. I was standing right here, and yet my lifeless body was spinning in the tree. Isa hissed and ducked behind me. I got so suddenly nauseous that I couldn't hardly stand. I braced myself against Lucas, but he seemed equally weak on his feet. He turned his gaze away from the hanging body and kept his eyes on me. I was almost certain I'd just witnessed my own death, but it didn't make any sense. It isn't real, Maid, he said, but it sounded more like he was trying to convince himself. Is this another test? I asked. Did I ever leave the vision? This is real, he assured me, gesturing between the two of us. We're standing here for sure, but whatever that is... He pointed to the hanging corpse, but wouldn't look at it. That's not you. Then how is this happening? I asked, my heart racing. I wasn't sure which was worse, watching my parents die or seeing myself hanging from a noose. Both were equally horrifying. I don't know, Lucas whispered. I swallowed hard and looked back to Talia and Grant. Their backs were to us, so they hadn't spotted us. It broke my heart to see Talia cry like that. Give me a minute. I stepped away from Lucas and walked over to Talia. I didn't know how to break the news to her that I was still alive. I feared I'd only scare her, but she had to know this wasn't real. I stopped behind her and cleared my throat. Grant turned first, but he more or less looked through me. He turned back to Talia to comfort her, before doing a quick double-take. Nadine? He cried. Talia turned, and her sobs instantly ceased. She went totally still, like she couldn't believe what she was seeing. After a moment to let it sink in, her gaze darted between me, the real Nadine, and the other me, the fake, dead Nadine. Her eyes grew wide, and she scrambled to her feet. Nadine! What's going on? I could ask you the same thing, I told her. She threw her arms around my neck and hugged me so tight it practically choked me. Grant got to his feet beside her and wiped the tears from his face. We thought... I know, I said, cutting him off. I didn't want to hear him finish that sentence. But I'm here. Talia's eyes darkened, and she looked out toward the crowd, who still hadn't taken their eyes off us. There must have been a hundred people gathered around, like my life was some sort of freak show. Who did this? Talia demanded. I'd never heard her talk in such a loud, stern voice. Nobody responded. They all looked as shell-shocked as we did. Issa growled at the onlookers. Mandy's nostrils flared. You fuckers better start talking! She stomped up to the nearest guy, whose face was hidden in his jacket. She grabbed the back of his hood and yanked it down, then got up in his face. Are you enjoying this, Gregory? He was a lanky guy with glasses and messy hair. His hands instantly shot up in surrender, and he cowered away from her. I don't know anything, I swear. Lucas crossed his arms and loomed over Gregory. What do you know about this kind of magic? Nothing, he repeated. I said I don't know anything. A muscle popped in Lucas's jaw. Come on, Gregory. You know everything. Gregory's eyes twinkled for a second, like he appreciated the compliment, but it was gone a moment later. He shot a dark look at Mandy, who still had a tight hold on his hood. Let me go and I'll talk. Mandy narrowed her eyes at him, then finally dropped him. As Gregory straightened out his jacket, Mandy looked out to the rest of the crowd. Well? She growled. What are you all still doing here? Show's over! The crowd started to disperse. We turned back toward Gregory, awaiting his explanation. 
My guess is it's an illusion, Gregory stammered. It's the only explanation. Witches can't cast illusions, Lucas stated bluntly. No, but the Arcana can, Gregory reminded him. The school's got enchanted objects from all over the world. I wouldn't be surprised if they had a fey object from Malovia that could do this sort of thing. But why would anyone want to make it look like Nadine? Grant started to ask, but he trailed off. The six of us looked at each other, and it was as if we all already knew the answer. Talia's hands curled into fists, and her nostrils flared. Chloe, she snarled, like the name was poison. I thought you guys were keeping an eye on her, I said. We were, Talia replied. Then this happened, and... Her eyes locked on something toward the front doors, and her features darkened. I turned to see the lucky three standing in the open doorway. Chloe's hands were on her hips, and she stared toward the oak tree with unadulterated pride on her face. I bet she fucking loved watching my friends and I squirm like this. Chloe's proud stance only lasted a moment, just long enough for us to spot her and pin her as the evil mastermind behind the illusion. Once her eyes connected with mine, she turned back into the school, her two side bitches following behind her. Amy gasped from behind me, and I turned to see the illusion was gone. A stuffed dummy hung from the tree, but my face was no longer on it. It wore clothes like mine, but that was it. There was no hair or face, just stuffed canvas. She's not going to get away with this, Talia yelled. She started across the lawn faster than any of the rest of us could react. We hurried behind her, but Talia sprinted so quickly she was inside the school before I made it halfway back. When the rest of us reached the doors, Talia was running up the grand staircase behind Chloe. She flung herself forward and grabbed Chloe around the neck, then yanked her back. My hands flew over my mouth as the two went tumbling down the stairs. Gasps traveled around the crowd that continued to linger. The two girls landed at the bottom of the stairs, but Talia barely seemed phased. She scrambled to her knees and pulled her arm back, like she was about to pummel Chloe's face. But her fist never made it. She just froze. Her face contorted in anger, like freezing up wasn't part of her own free will. You think you can threaten my best friend like that? Talia shrieked. You think you can go around doing whatever you- Who the fuck is doing this to me? Several things happened at once. Grant, Lucas, and I rushed over to Talia the same time Ryan stepped forward with a proud smirk on his face. He held his hands up toward Talia, and I knew he was the one controlling her. Poor Talia was so petite that she wasn't strong enough to push past his telekinetic hold. Before I reached her, Ryan twitched his wrist and Talia's fist shifted course, slamming straight into her nose. At that, the room broke into utter chaos. Chloe scrambled backward, laughing like a maniac. I grabbed Talia and dragged her behind the stairs, and Issa followed. Grant threw his arms out around us and acted like a human shield. I couldn't really see what else was going on, though I saw purple sparks erupt from Lucas's hands. Screams filled the foyer, and footsteps pounded above us on the stairs as students scattered. I heard the sound of glass breaking and people screaming. The sound of cats screeching and hissing came from all angles. Issa crouched in front of me like she was standing guard. Her tail stood on end, and a low growl came from her throat. A figure ran from the fight and ducked beneath the stairs with us. I didn't realize who it was at first until he spoke. Talia, babe, you okay? Cody pushed past Grant and cradled Talia in his arms. She curled into him. I'm fine, but I need to get back out there and kick Chloe's pretty little- No, Cody said sternly. I'm not letting you go back out there. Grant shot Cody a look of disdain. My heart hammered. I wanted to get back out there too. I couldn't let Lucas fight by himself. 
I started to get up, but Grant grabbed my hand. Nadine, stop. You don't have magic. I have to do something! I didn't care what it was. All I wanted was to get back at Chloe. I ripped my arm out of Grant's grip and rushed out from beneath the stairs before he could catch me. My eyes locked on Chloe, who ducked in the corner. I barely noticed magic flying around me as I stomped over to her. She didn't notice me at first, as she was preoccupied by the fight. But I sure as hell got her attention when I grabbed her by the t-shirt and shoved her up against the wall. Issa came streaking out from under the stairs after me. She stood at my feet and hissed at Chloe. "'What the hell is your problem?' I snapped. "'Come after me! Don't hurt my friends!' Chloe shoved me, and I stumbled back a few steps. "'Get off me, bitch!' "'I'm the bitch!' I snapped. "'I didn't start this!' "'You did!' she yelled. "'The second you came to Octavia Falls!' "'I didn't do anything to you,' I growled. "'You didn't have to,' she spat. "'It started long before either of us were born.' "'Was she fucking serious?' I know our grandpas had it in for each other, but that's no reason for you to act so evil, I snarled. There's enough room in Octavia Falls for both of us. That's just it, Nadine, she screamed. There isn't enough room for the both of us. That's why you need to leave. She shoved me again, and I shoved her back harder. I'm not going anywhere, I promised. You really want to risk it? She asked harshly. How badly do you want to die for this? My eyebrows shot up. Die for it? What, you're going to kill me if I don't leave? She glared at me. I'd never seen so much hatred in someone's eyes before. Someone has to die. Don't you get it, Nadine? Once we both go through our evoking ceremonies, that's it. That's all the time we have. One of us has to leave. Why? I yelled. What has you so fucking terrified of me? We're cursed! Chloe's words stopped my heart. I swayed on my feet, but I barely had a chance to process what she said before another voice boomed throughout the foyer. Everybody, stop! Chloe and I both turned to see Professor Richards standing in the center of the room. He held up a large vial of green liquid. Everyone had gone totally still. Ryan and Lucas both had each other by the collar, and they'd stopped with their fists pulled back. Amy and Mandy were on the ground with Camille and Gwen. Mandy had a fistful of Gwen's white hair, and Amy had twisted Camille's arm around her back. All eyes turned to Professor Richards. Make one more move, and I'll set off this sleeping potion on the whole room, he threatened in a stern voice. Nobody said a thing. All I heard was the click of heels down the hall. Then Headmistress Verla stepped into the foyer. She wore a look of utter disapproval. It was so intense, it could cut straight through you. For a moment, she actually sort of scared me. Everyone back to your dorms, she commanded. Now. People started to hurry up the stairs and scatter in either direction. Chloe stomped past me, purposely slamming her shoulder into mine on the way. I moved slowly, still trying to grasp what she'd said. I was cursed. Why had Grammy hidden this from me? Why had she written it off as some dead feud? I ended up in the back of the crowd. Ahead of me, Cody was helping Talia up the stairs, while Grant glared from behind them. Amy and Mandy made faces at Gwen and Camille while they headed back to their room. Issa joined me at my feet. Lucas found his way over to me. A bruise was forming beneath his eye, but his knuckles looked raw, like he'd gotten in a few good punches. Shit. I didn't want this for him. I didn't want him getting hurt because of me. You okay, Nade? 
he asked softly. I swallowed. I couldn't lie to him. Today had been one shit show after another. I was beyond exhausted. There's something I need to tell you, I whispered under my breath. I didn't want to tell him about the curse out in the open, though. Nadine? Had Mistress Verla cocked an eyebrow in my direction. She looked less than happy. I scooped Issa into my arms, then looked to Lucas. Come with me. We walked over to Verla. The room had been cleared out, so no one heard us. Verla placed her hands on her hips, like a mother disappointed in her children. What happened here? Though she looked at Lucas and me with tight lips, I realized she wasn't mad at me. She'd asked me over because she trusted me to tell her the truth. It was a prank, headmistress, I told her. Someone used illusion magic to make it look as if there was a dead body hanging from the tree outside. People got upset and a fight broke out. I didn't know why I didn't tell her it had been my body hanging from the tree. Something didn't feel right about telling her about Chloe and me. If Chloe got in trouble for it, it'd only make things worse between us, and they were bad enough already. Verla breathed a heavy sigh, like she couldn't deal with such pettiness today. Very well. You may return to your dorms. Lucas and I turned, but Verla stopped us once more. Oh, and Nadine? I stopped to look at her. Yes? Her shoulders fell. I'm very sorry about earlier. We'll get this worked out, and you'll pass your evoking ceremony. I nodded, though deep down in my gut, I wasn't sure. I only had a few weeks left. On top of it, there was this curse Chloe just told me about. You don't look well, Nade. Lucas pointed out as we climbed the stairs. Is there anything I can do? No, I told him. But there's something I have to do. What is it? He asked. Let me help. I shook my head. I have to do this by myself. My grandmother has some explaining to do. Nadine! Grammy sounded pleased to see me when I arrived at her house that night. What a pleasure! Cut the crap, Grammy, I snapped. She gaped at me. Is something wrong? I narrowed my eyes at her. You could say that. Grammy's eyes widen in concern, and she steps aside to let me in. She gestured to the living room, but I just stood there in the hallway, my arms crossed. I felt weak on my feet, but I was too angry to sit down. Cornelius rubbed up against my leg, but I wasn't interested in his affection. "'What's wrong?' Grammy asked. "'Why didn't you tell me about the curse?' I demanded. Grammy's features immediately darkened. She looked pissed that I'd brought it up. "'I didn't tell you because there is no curse, Nadine.' Then why does Chloe Olsen insist there is? I shot back. I knew you were hiding something from me the last time I mentioned her. Grammy sighed. Nadine, please sit down and let me explain. I threw my hands up. I don't want to sit down. I want you to tell me everything. I will, Grammy promised. Let's talk about it over a cup of tea. Please, like I wanted tea right now. Grammy's lips tightened. Sit down, Nadine. She spoke in a tone I'd never heard her use before. I felt like I had no choice but to sit. It seemed to be the only way I was getting answers. While I stepped into the living room, Grammy went down the hall to brew us some tea. I was fuming so badly I could hardly sit still which was saying something, considering how exhausted I was. Assumptions raced around in my head while I waited for Grammy to return. Did Grammy want the curse to hurt me? Did she think I was better off dead? 
Or had Chloe been lying to me? Somehow, I doubted that. Grammy returned to the living room with a tray. She set it on the coffee table, then pushed a cup of tea into my hands. Drink, Nadine. I started to sip it and noticed my anger begin to wane immediately. I realized what horrible things I'd just thought about Grammy, and it killed me to think them. She loved me to death. Surely she had a good reason for not telling me. Suddenly, I felt angry for a different reason. I set my cup back on the table and glared at her. If you're going to serve someone a potion, you should probably tell them first. It's nothing more than a calming tea, Grammy assured me. My lips tightened. Forgive me if I'm having a hard time trusting you right now. Grammy straightened in her chair. Look, Nadine, I'm not going to lie to you. There was a curse. Well, at least she was starting to be honest with me. What was the curse, exactly? I asked. What were our grandparents fighting over? Grammy took a long breath before diving into the story. Years ago, when I was pregnant with your mother, your grandfather served on the Imperium Council. He was the last curse-breaker and the only male to ever serve. Chloe's grandfather stole a valuable item from the council, and though he denied it, the two of them fought over it. Chloe's grandfather wanted to get rid of yours, so he cast a curse upon him and his descendants. This curse would allow only one of the families from each generation to remain in Octavia Falls. The other either had to leave or die. Wait! The pieces began falling into place. Is that how Grampy died? Grammy's eyes watered. Nadine, your grandfather was murdered. Chloe's grandfather killed him. The air left my lungs. Mom didn't leave the coven for my dad, did she? Grammy shook her head regrettably. She left to outrun the curse. How exactly does this curse work? I asked. Grammy sighed. According to what your mother learned before she left, the curse only touches you once you're accepted into the coven. Since you haven't gone through with your evoking ceremony yet, it can't hurt you. But it has, I argued. Grammy, it's been there my whole life. I can feel it inside me. Grammy dropped her gaze. I'd never seen her look so guilty. Why didn't you tell me? I demanded. Why would you keep any of this from me? Because the curse is over, Nadine, Grammy cried. How do you know that? I asked. Chloe sure seemed to think it was alive and well. Grammy's breath caught. I refuse to believe your grandfather died without breaking it. He was a curse-breaker. Oh, my God. I pressed my hand to my forehead. She was seriously basing this off nothing? Why would you even take this chance? I snapped at her. If this could cost me my life, it's going to cost me my granddaughter. She erupted. I already lost my husband and my daughter. I'm not going to lose you, too. The room went dead silent. After a few moments, I finally spoke. It wasn't right of you to hide this from me, Grammy. You have no proof that the curse was broken. And you don't know it wasn't, she said softly. Is that something you really want to risk? I asked. I was offended she'd play with my life like some sort of slot machine. The curse isn't broken, Grammy, and I think deep down you know that. Grammy's face paled and her voice quivered. Slowly, she rose to her feet and came over to sit beside me on the couch. Her eyes watered and a pang of guilt hit me. I felt bad about lashing out at her. Nadine, I'm sorry I didn't tell you, she said softly. It was selfish of me. 
All that really matters is that you're safe. Can you forgive me? I hesitated. I want to, but... My unspoken words hung in air. But she broke my trust. Grammy reached up and pulled a chain out from beneath her shirt. An antique skeleton key I'd never seen before hung from around her neck. It looked really old and had a pretty swirly design on the end. I want you to have this, she said. I furrowed my brow. What does it go to? It's not what it goes to, she told me. It's what it does. I've worn this key for over forty years. Your grandfather gave it to me just before he died, in the midst of his feud against Jeb Olson. He said it was enchanted to protect the owner. Is that true? I asked. Is it really enchanted? It served me thus far, Grammy answered. I should have given it to your mother ages ago. I want it to protect you now, Nadine. I can't lose you. You're all I have left. She pulled the necklace over her head and handed it to me. My heart warmed at the kind gesture, and I wrapped the key tightly in my hand. This should protect you from the curse, Grammy said, though she looked uncertain. Silence settled between us until I finally spoke. What happens once I go through with my ceremony? If the curse is still alive, you have until Chloe goes through with hers, since you two are the only descendants of your generation. And if we both joined the coven? I asked. How long would we have? Your mother guessed a month, tops, Grammy said. But she didn't stay that long. She left the night of her ceremony. My ceremony is before Chloe's, I pointed out. That puts me at an advantage. Chloe would have to forfeit her own ceremony if she wanted to stay. Otherwise, she'd be submitting to a game of Russian roulette with this curse. The only other option was to kill me and save herself, but she hadn't done it yet. To be honest, I didn't think she had it in her. Please don't leave me like your mother did, Grammy whispered. I won't, I promised. I'm going through with my evoking ceremony. I'm going to pass, and I'm going to show Chloe that I belong here. If anything, she'd be the one that would have to leave, because I wasn't going to. The following night, I couldn't sleep, even though I was really tired. After I told Lucas about the curse, all I wanted to do was be by him, because he made me feel better about the whole thing. My heart yearned to be in his presence, and I couldn't stand to let my hunger for him go unchecked. To hell with it. I was going to be spontaneous tonight. I crawled out of bed as quietly as I could so I wouldn't wake Talia. I changed into a swimsuit, grabbed a towel, and then quietly left the room. I tiptoed down the dark, quiet hall and stopped at Lucas's door. I knocked lightly, but no answer came, so I tried again. A few moments later, the door swung open. A sharp breath passed by my lips when I saw him standing there. He wore nothing but sweats that hung off his hips in a way that made me want to drool. His abs were freaking amazing. I just wanted to reach out and touch them. His hair was tousled and looked really sexy. Just seeing him standing there, shirtless, did things to my body I couldn't control. What's this? He teased in a low whisper so he wouldn't wake Grant. A booty call? I laughed lightly. No. Did I wake you? He shook his head. Nah, couldn't sleep. Me either, I admitted. I'm going swimming and wondering if you wanted to come along. He hesitated. The pool's closed this time of night. 
I shrugged. You think that's going to stop me? Um, it should, he said, sounding equally curious and confused. Well, if you don't want to come, I'll just go by myself, I said. I turned from the door and started down the hall, but I was totally bluffing. I knew he wouldn't be able to resist his curiosity. Wait, Nade, he hissed. I smiled brightly and turned back to him. You're coming? He groaned, though he didn't sound upset. Hold on a minute. Lucas ducked back into the room and changed into his swim trunks, then grabbed a towel. He emerged looking hella sexy. The light from the sconces along the wall accented the hills and valleys of his abs. It took all I had not to stare. What? he asked innocently. I forced my gaze away from him, hoping he hadn't seen me blush. Nothing. Let's go. Lucas and I tiptoed quietly down the stairs into the rec center. The door was locked, but all it took was one tiny incantation from Lucas, and we were in. The air was warm and thick inside, but it felt really good. The room was dark, but a light streak of moonlight came in through the tall windows that faced the forest, glistening off the water. Do they have some sort of magical alarm system for this? I asked, though I didn't really care. The threat of getting caught was all part of the fun. Lucas shrugged. Security isn't a huge deal around here. Most people aren't brazen enough to sneak in. I'm brazen? I teased as I dropped my towel on one of the pool chairs. Lucas laughed and tickled me in the side. Why do you think I like you? My heart fluttered at those words. I mean, I already knew he liked me, but hearing him say it got me every time. Don't tickle me, I snickered. I reached out and tickled his side. An electric shock traveled through my fingertips and up my arm when I touched him. I didn't think that would ever get old. Hey, Lucas cried, his voice echoing throughout the pool. Tickle me again and I'm throwing you in. My jaw dropped dramatically. You wouldn't dare. He cocked an eyebrow. You want to bet? I shrugged and tugged at the string on my robe. The flaps fell open, revealing my black bikini. Lucas's gaze dropped and roamed across my body. His eyes lingered on me a few moments, like I wouldn't notice. My eyes are up here, buddy, I joked, reaching out to tickle him again. Hey, I said no tickling, he teased. That's it, I'm throwing you in. I smirked. You'll have to catch me first. I started running away from him. Lucas caught me around the waist, and I yelped. My voice echoed through the room, as did Lucas's laughter. No! I yelled through my laughs. I locked my arms around Lucas's neck. He tried to throw me in, but I didn't let go. Instead, we both went tumbling down into the water together. I held my breath as my head dipped below water. My feet touched the pool floor below me, and I pushed upward. My head broke the surface, and I inhaled a large breath. Lucas came up a second later, gasping. That's what you get! I laughed, splashing him. Hey! He splashed me back. That turned into a full-on splashing war. Our laughter filled the entire pool. I couldn't remember the last time I'd had this much fun. Your splash game is weak, I told him. Is it? He challenged. He kicked forward and glided through the water until he was right in front of me. I tried to splash him, but he grabbed me around the middle and tossed me upward out of the water. I screamed playfully as I went flying, then landed safely in the water a few feet away. Not fair, I cried, wiping my eyes. Totally fair he countered. 
I raised an eyebrow. Oh, so we're playing dirty now. He smirked. That's the only way to play, isn't it? That sounds like a challenge. I ducked my head below the water and swam forward until my shoulder met his knee. I wrapped one arm around his leg, then pushed off the bottom of the pool. He was light in the water, but as more of his body got out of the water, he got really heavy. I pushed with all my might until my head broke the water. Lucas flailed as he went tumbling backward, kicking up water. I laughed uncontrollably as he shook the water from his hair. Droplets splashed my face, but I was having so much fun I didn't care. Come here, Lucas growled playfully. I splashed him lightly. Stay away. He grabbed my arm and dragged me through the water. My laughter instantly died when he wrapped his arms around me. Suddenly, I felt really hot, like the water might start sizzling on my skin at any moment. Our chests pressed together, though he held my arms tight at my sides. Lucas's gaze flickered down to my lips, and he spoke softly. Try to get me now. I struggled out of his hold and wrapped my arms around his neck. I've already got you, I whispered. Lucas chuckled under his breath but I felt like we weren't joking around anymore. Images of the night at Lake Santos flashed through my mind. It felt like we were back there, holding each other, ready to kiss. My breaths grew shallow, making my breasts rise and fall from the water rapidly. His gaze darted downward, first to the key around my neck, then to my breasts, before landing on my eyes again. My heart pummeled against my ribcage. Being this close to him made every nerve in my body come to life. I wondered if he could feel me shaking. So, what's this? I asked. I didn't mean to lean closer to him, but I felt my lips magnetize to his. Is this a continuation of where we left off at the lake? Lucas leaned closer. His lips were barely an inch from mine. His sweet, warm breath brushed across my cheek. My pulse quickened. I... I... Uh, Lucas stuttered. He sighed, shattering the whole moment. My heart dropped. I don't know, Nade, he finally said. I drew away. I thought you wanted this. I do, he said quickly. But do you? Truth be told, I wanted Lucas so bad it hurt. Problem was, the future scared me. Would this relationship work if the Reaper Shadow curse kept us at a distance? I couldn't think about that. So I resolved to enjoying every moment with Lucas that I could. I don't know what the future holds, I admitted. But I know that I want you, right now. Lucas's expression softened, like my words warmed his heart. I waved my hands through the water and stepped closer to him. With each step I took, he took a step away. It wasn't like he was running from me, more like he was giving me a choice to pursue him. Why worry about the future when all we need to do is live in the moment? I questioned. Lucas stilled when his back hit the edge of the pool. His breath wavered. Because our choices in the moment affect the future, Nade. I shrugged like none of that mattered, though I knew deep down that it did. Let's pretend like there is no Reaper's shadow curse. I suggested. What's a witch gotta do to get you to ask me out? Lucas sighed and hoisted himself up out of the pool to sit on the edge. Water dripped from his dark hair, and the moonlight accented the deep shadows of his muscled chest. He looked down at me with those bewitching green eyes, 
sending my heart pummeling against my ribcage. Are you sure you want to be with me, Nade? You deserve to be happy. We can be happy together, I promised. He raised a curious eyebrow. How do you know? I pressed my hands to the edge of the pool on either side of him and pushed myself upward so that only my legs were in the water. My hips rested on the edge of the pool between his legs. Heat pooled between my thighs as I came in so close we were practically touching. Energy sizzled between us, and I saw it in the way he looked at me that he felt it too. The sexual tension was palpable. Why don't you kiss me and find out? I whispered. A moment passed where I didn't know what might happen next. We felt frozen in time, and I held my breath. Then Lucas's hand came up to cradle the back of my neck, and he drew me to him. My whole body felt like it was melting into the water as his warm lips moved over mine. My lips parted, and he deepened the kiss. My arms suddenly became weak, and I lowered myself back into the water. That didn't stop Lucas from kissing me deeper, though. His lips never parted from mine as he followed me into the water. He took my face in his hands and ran his tongue over my bottom lip. I moaned as I wrapped my arms and legs around him, pressing myself so close to him that it should be a sin. Lucas's hands roamed downward until they were cupping my ass. I groaned and pressed my hips into him until I could feel his erection pressing up against my most sensitive areas. My fingers trembled as I ran them through his hair. He made little noises of pleasure that sent waves of heat all over my body. A glorious high filled me, like I was mere meters away from cresting the top of a mountain. This was how it should be with us. This was how it should feel to be with the person you loved. To be denied of that was a curse. Literally. I wanted more with Lucas, as much as I could possibly get. We were two lost souls who found each other in the darkness. Somehow, we had created a spark out of nothing. When he kissed me like this, it was as if the spark could never die. The very air he breathed was mine, and as long as we were together, the fire we shared could never die. Boldly, I reached up and tugged on the string of my bikini top. The fabric fell away, and I pressed my exposed breasts to Lucas's chest. My nipples hardened beneath the coolness of the air. Lucas's entire body quivered. I half expected him to draw away, to tell me to cover up and remind me we couldn't touch like this, but he didn't. Instead, his hands traveled up my body before settling on the curve of my breasts. My heart hammered so hard I was sure he could feel it. The air around us seemed heavy with hormones so thick I could hardly breathe. Lucas's hands massaged my breasts as mine tangled in his hair. Our lips moved in perfect sync as we made out passionately. The room spun around me so fast I didn't know which way was up or down. The only thing rooting me in place was Lucas's body against mine. We could have been making out for only a minute, or it could have been hours. All I knew was that it would never be long enough. Bang! A noise like the slamming of a door startled the two of us apart. I grabbed for the fabric of my bikini and pressed it over my breasts. Lucas and I shared an expression of total horror. We should probably go, he suggested. I quickly agreed as I tied my bikini back on. We jumped out of the water and gathered our things, then snuck quietly out of the pool. Lucas took my hand as we ducked through the shadows in the hall. We didn't see anyone, but we made our way back to the dorm slowly and carefully. My heart pounded in exhilaration. I didn't think either of us wanted to leave the other. My heart sank when we arrived back at my dorm. I stuck my arms through the sleeves of my robe and draped my towel around my neck. 
That was a lot of fun, I whispered to Lucas. It helped take my mind off things. Lucas's face fell. You mean the curse? I nodded. Any ideas what you're going to do about it? He asked. I think it's pretty obvious, I replied. Either me or Chloe has to leave Octavia Falls. I'm staying. You're playing a game of chicken, Nade, he pointed out. Chloe's not going to cave. She's going to have to, because I won't, I promised. Lucas frowned, like what he was about to say pained him. Or she'll kill you. I rolled my eyes. If she was going to kill me, she'd have done it already. Lucas's eyes roamed over me, and he took my hand. Maybe you don't have to go through with your evoking ceremony. If you don't do it, the curse would never activate. You could stay. And then I'd never be a true member of the coven, I reminded him. That's what Chloe wants. She wants to prove I don't belong. And I do, Lucas. I just want you to be safe, he said. This isn't up for discussion, I stated firmly. My mind's made up. Lucas sighed. Let's forget about that, I suggested, before wrapping him in my arms. I don't want to ruin the amazing night we just had together. Lucas pressed his nose into my hair. After a long moment of silence, he spoke. What's your secret? My secret? Yeah, you're so positive lately. How do you do it? I don't know. It might have something to do with this. I drew away and lifted the key around my neck. What is it? he asked. I shrugged. Something my grandma gave me. It's supposed to be enchanted. Lucas's eyebrows shot up. Then it must be rare. We aren't so great at enchantments in the Miriamic coven. Can I see it? Go ahead. He reached out and lifted the key in his hand. Though it was dark in the hall, he inspected it closely. As I watched his eyes roam over it, I saw something in them. It was like he needed protection. What from, I wasn't sure, whether it was from himself or some darker force. All I knew was Lucas seemed to need it more than I did. I didn't realize what I was doing until I did it. I reached up and undid the clasp on my necklace. I started to fasten it around his neck. What are you doing? He asked. I want you to wear it, I said. Nade, I can't. He declined, but I'd already placed it around his neck. It's from your grandma. So? I challenged. You want to try being more positive? Let's see if it helps. I want you to have it. I can't, he insisted. He reached up to start taking it off, but I placed my hands on his to stop him. My skin tingled where I touched him. I looked him straight in the eyes. You know I don't take no for an answer. Consider it an early birthday present. It's yours. Lucas relaxed. He came in close and pushed a strand of wet hair behind my ear. Butterflies danced around in my stomach. Thank you, Nade. Lucas just hovered there, neither of us wanting to move. He was barely a foot away, just staring at my mouth. My mouth grew dry as I awaited another kiss. I wished I could invite him inside, but Talia was sleeping. I licked my lips, but my voice wavered. Thank you for tonight. We should do it again sometime. It'd be fun. He nodded as his eyes roamed my face before traveling down my body. He reached out and ran his fingers down the arm of my plush robe. You know what else would be fun? 
my whole body trembled. I could think of quite a few things. What? Lucas looked like he was holding his breath. Then, all at once, the question spilled out of him. Would you like to go to the midnight formal with me? I went speechless. Instead of jumping at the chance, I spat out like an idiot. I, I thought you didn't dance. He smiled sweetly. I'd dance for you, Nate. My heart never felt as warm as it did in that moment. Lucas made my heart sing in ways no one ever had before. That was when I knew. No matter the limitations, I wanted to spend my life with Lucas. I'd walk to the ends of the earth and back for him. I became so overwhelmed with joy that all I could do was throw my arms around his neck to keep it from bursting out of me. Yes, Lucas, I whispered. I'll go to the dance with you. I drew away and took his face in my hands. He looked down at me with a blissful expression in his eye. I smiled back. And I'll share every dance with you after. His eyes widened, and he went breathless. Is that a decision? I nodded eagerly. Yes, I want to be with you. Lucas wrapped me in his arms, and I felt so warm and safe there. I'll find a way around this curse, Nate. I hope we can, I whispered back. I'd do anything to be with you. He shivered, but I thought it was a good shiver. Anything? Yes, I said. Wouldn't you? He let out a deep sigh and pulled me tighter. Absolutely. Chapter 19 Lucas The night at the pool was the most fun I'd ever had. Kissing her like that was beyond incredible. I'd never kissed someone like that, and no one had ever kissed me back with such passion. And her breasts. Oh, my goddess. There was no words. I could hardly believe she'd let me touch them. It felt like a dream. But it was real, and I couldn't stop playing it over and over in my mind. Nadine wanted to be with me, no matter what. She had no idea how much it meant to me that she was willing to give up her grandmother's necklace. I didn't think she understood how valuable an enchantment like this was in the magical community. When Nadine gave me that key, it was like she gave me her heart. It was in that moment that I realized I was done for. As long as Nadine was staying in Octavia Falls, I was going to be with her. One day I flagged Samantha down after necromancy safety. Lucas? She looked surprised to see me. What's up? I glanced around the hall to make sure no one was around to hear. I have some questions about the Reaper Moon. Mind if we talk? She looked a little hesitant. I told you everything I know. I just want to know how the last guy did it, I begged. How'd he get in contact with the Reapers on the Reaper Moon? I mean, did he just walk up to them and ask? She bit her lower lip. I think it requires a ritual. That's what I was afraid of. What kind? How? I asked. She shot me a look of apology. I'm sorry, Lucas. I don't know. You're going to have to ask someone else. And that's exactly what I was going to do until I found answers. Who better to go to than the last guy who figured it out? I didn't tell Nadine what I was up to. I knew it wasn't right to keep secrets from her, but I didn't want her talking me out of it. I could already hear her voice in my head. I'm not worth risking the abyss, she would say. But she was. She totally was. Friday night arrived and I ducked out the back door of the school before Grant or anyone else could find me. It was my 20th birthday, and I was pretty sure Grant wanted to go party or something dumb like that, but I had other plans in mind. As I rounded the side of the school, I heard Ryan's voice. Where's the money you owe me, Gregory? I'll get it, Gregory replied, his voice shaking. You better, Ryan spat. Now get out of here. I heard Gregory scramble off in the other direction. I spun on my heel and rounded the other side of the school. 
I didn't need another confrontation with Ryan. I felt bad for Gregory, but at least Ryan seemed distracted enough that he was off my back for a while. I left campus and walked into town. It wasn't far, and I didn't have my own car. Snow fell gently from the sky, but the air actually felt nice. I stopped at a psychic shop along Main Street and went inside. The shop was really small and had only a handful of products on display, things like tarot cards and herbs. It was dark inside with black walls, dim lighting, and a deep red curtain separating the main room from another room in the back. There was no one there when I walked in, but I suspected the seer who ran the place could sense my presence. She was supposed to be one of the best in town, slated to be the next on the Imperium Council. I'd never met her, but I'd heard of her. So when I decided to visit a seer to figure some shit out, I thought she might be the best person to ask for help. I barely waited a minute before the curtain behind the counter opened. A woman stepped into the room. She was at least twice my age and had beautiful tight curls framing her face. She wore dark clothes and a purple shawl over her shoulders. She smiled kindly. Lucas, I thought I'd be seeing you again. I hesitated. Um, I don't believe we've met. Right, she said, like she just remembered. I was in costume. I'm Everly Hall. She reached across the counter and I shook her hand. Nice to meet you. Were you... were you the night hag on Halloween? She smiled. I was. Creepy. What did the card mean? I asked. She gestured to the curtain. Why don't we sit down and talk about it? I followed her into the next room, which was just as small as the first. There were candles lit around the perimeter. In the center of the room stood a round table covered in black cloth. A crystal ball and tarot cards sat neatly on top of it. Please sit, Everly said, gesturing to one of the chairs. I took a seat, but I shifted uncomfortably. I'd come here to get answers, but now I had no idea what to expect. What can I do for you, Lucas? Everly asked as she sat across from me. I cleared my throat. First of all, you can tell me about Halloween. She shook her head and wore an expression of regret. I'm afraid I can't always make sense of the messages I receive. Do you know who sent you the message? I asked. What did they say exactly? Her shoulders fell. I don't know. I did as I was told to do. I found you, gave you the card, and... She trailed off and stared into the distance. After a few moments, she shook her head like she couldn't remember. I gave you a warning, didn't I? Yeah, I told her. You said I needed to stop... something. You don't remember? She looked at a loss for words. The way my powers work, I don't always remember the messages I relay. It's automatic. Well, that was a freaking dead end. I decided to focus on the real reason I came. I leaned my elbows on the table. I'm not actually here about Halloween. I'm looking for answers about my future. Knowledge can be a dangerous thing, Lucas, she warned. It's not like that, I assured her. I just need some guidance. She straightened in her chair. I may be able to help with that. My shoulders relaxed and I felt at ease. The thing is, there's this girl. Everly's eyes brightened. Ooh, tell me about her. Nadine is amazing, I stated. She's just so curious about life, so full of this amazing energy that lifts me up every time I'm around her. I want to be around her all the time. I want to be with her. But... But you're the Reaper's Apprentice, Everly finished for me, which means you can't be with her without hurting her. See, you understand, I said. Apparently that's not common knowledge around school. The thing is, to be with her, I'd have to get rid of my gift. Everly looked thoughtful. And you're wondering whether you should or not. I shook my head. No, I'm wondering how. Her face fell. Do you realize what you're saying? Rejecting your powers like that? I know, I said quickly. I'm not here for a lecture. It's not my job to give you one, she stated simply. I have to get in touch with the Reaper, which I can only do on the Reaper Moon, I said. Problem is, I don't know how to do it. I mean, it might be as easy as walking up to them, but if you have to do a ritual, I want to be prepared. I heard a story about a guy who did this years ago. 
Do you think we can contact him? Everly sighed. I'm sorry, Lucas, but my powers don't work that way. The messages I receive are powerful, but I can't decide who gives them. Can we at least try? I begged. She narrowed her eyes. You do realize what you're getting into, don't you? Yes, I've thought it over pretty extensively. Will you help me or not? Silence settled over the room for several long seconds. I held my breath. Finally, Everly sighed. I'm not one to refuse help when it's asked of me, so long as you understand what you're doing. I nodded firmly. All I want is information. She raised an eyebrow. You realize I can't guarantee that, don't you? Yes, but I want to try, I told her. She took a long breath. Okay, I will help you. My fee is a hundred dollars per page. Page? I asked curiously. She reached over to a nearby shelf and pulled out a stack of paper and a pen, then placed them in front of her. I'm an automatic writer, Lucas. It's how I receive the messages. I shifted in my chair. I was probably going to have to borrow money for this, but to hell with it. I'd pay it back. Anything for answers. I'll pay whatever you charge, I finally said. She nodded. Then let's get started. Everly closed her eyes and positioned her pen above the paper. She breathed in and out, barely making a sound. A creepy clock with skeleton-shaped fingers ticked on the wall. I wondered if I was supposed to do something, but Everly didn't give any instructions. I just sat there, waiting. At least if she didn't write anything, I didn't owe her anything, right? After two minutes that felt like two hours, the temperature in the room dropped. The hair stood on the back of my neck and I shivered. I should have been creeped out, but I wasn't. Without warning, Everly's eyes began to move rapidly beneath her lids. Her eyelids fluttered open and closed the tiniest bit, and it really freaked me out. She was obviously in a really deep trance. Everly started scribbling on the paper, and the pen made chilling, scratching noises against it. My heart leapt to my throat in anticipation. I jumped to my feet and rounded the table to read what she was writing. She didn't respond at all, just kept writing like she was possessed. So you want to know about the Reaper's Moon, she wrote in smooth, clear handwriting. I glanced around the room as if expecting to spot a ghost hovering somewhere nearby, but I didn't see a thing. Yes, I said aloud. I spoke quickly, like I feared the spirit may leave us at any time. What can you tell me about contacting the Reapers? Is there a ritual involved? Everly began scribbling on the next line. Yes, but why would you want to do it? That's private, I said. Won't you confide in your brother, Lucas? I gasped. My eyes went as wide as saucers. The spirit that spoke through Everly was Eric? Maybe. I thought. I didn't want to get my hopes up if this was some sort of trick. I hoped it was him, though. Uh, Eric? I asked, stumbling over the word. My throat closed up as I spoke his name. It had been so long since I said it out loud. It's me. My heart began to hammer fiercely. I wasn't sure if I was excited to talk to him again or pissed that this might be an attempt at manipulation. How do I know it's you? I asked. My eyes darted around the room, even though I couldn't see anything. We had a code word, remember? I furrowed my brow. Code word? Then it hit me. Years ago, when my brother and I were just kids, we lay out under the stars one night talking about death. We decided that if one of us croaked off before the other, we'd contact the other using a code word. It was how we'd know we weren't being punked by some mischievous spirit. I couldn't believe I'd almost forgotten. I remember, I said. I gripped on hard to the back of Everly's chair as she began scribbling on the next line, Mystic and Midnight. They were the names of the two cats we had when we were kids. My knees became weak beneath me. Before I collapsed, I dragged my chair around the table and sank into it beside Everly. She kept on writing while I tried to catch my breath and wrap my head around the fact that my brother was back in the same room as me. Do you believe me now? She wrote on the next line. That snapped me back to attention. I realized I may not have a lot of time left with Eric, 
and I wanted to get in as much conversation as I could. I straightened in my chair. I can't believe it's you. I, I mean, I do. I just... I couldn't find the words. W what's it like where you're at? I asked. I held my breath, awaiting the answer. I hoped to our goddess he wasn't where I thought he was. I didn't know if I could handle that. He took his own life, but he didn't deserve an eternity in the abyss for it. Alora's wonderful, Eric answered. My jaw dropped open. I never thought I'd feel such relief to hear Eric was safe and happy with our ancestors. You're in Alora, I asked breathlessly. That's great. There's no time for small talk. The next message read, You're right, I said. Do you know anything about the Reaper Moon? I leaned over Everly's shoulder and watched carefully as she wrote out the next message. The people here talk a lot. I've picked up a lot of information. I've come to tell you not to do it. I gaped like a fish. Wh why My own brother wasn't going to support me. Mother Miriam gave you this gift for a reason. Don't give it up like I did. This isn't the same thing, I cried. Please, just tell me how to do it. Everly's pen paused above the paper, though her eyes continued to move rapidly like she was still in the trance. Eric, please, I begged. Finally, Everly placed her pen back to the paper and wrote, You must go to the cemetery and find the grave of Caesar Peppertrine. It is there where you'll find the scroll that tells you how to contact the Reapers. Caesar Peppertrine? I asked. Everly was already writing another message. Be careful, Eric cautioned. You must heed the warning from the card I gave you on Halloween. The choice is yours, Lucas. I swore my heart stopped for a couple seconds as I read the message. You're the one who sent me the death card. What does it mean? Everly's pen didn't move. Eric! I shot to my feet and looked around the room, but I couldn't see him. What does it mean? Everly cleared her throat and my stomach dropped. I looked to her to see her eyes were wide open. She swayed a little like she was dazed. No! I cried, my heart racing. You can't be done! I have more questions! Everly set her pen down and spoke calmly. I'm sorry, Lucas. I did what I could. You must recall I did not promise you any answers. I slammed my hands down on the table, making the pen jump an inch into the air. Then bring him back! She shook her head regrettably. I'm afraid he's already gone. I couldn't explain the wave of anger, disappointment, and sadness that washed through me. All three emotions hit me at once. All I wanted was a few more moments with Eric. Like a brick to the gut, I realized how dangerous that thought could be. It was like all the other thoughts I heard, and I didn't want to be that guy. I was going to live my life, and I was going to die happy. And that meant going down this road so I could be with Nadine. Caesar Peppertrine didn't exist. At least that was the conclusion I was coming to. His name was nowhere in the coven's records. For the last week, I'd been leaving campus between classes to search the graveyard, but it was so huge it seemed to be taking forever. I entertained the idea that Caesar Peppertrine's grave wasn't on coven grounds, but it made no sense. Eric had specifically told me to go to the cemetery, which could only mean ours here in town, otherwise he would have specified. I wondered if this was Eric's way of throwing me off, of keeping me busy until the reaper's moon had passed. But I couldn't believe my brother would lead me astray like that. He'd give me the choice to make for myself. He wouldn't lie to me. Which only meant one thing. Caesar Peppertrine's grave was out there, and I was going to find it. But it was going to have to wait until after tonight. Tonight, I had other plans. I stood in front of the mirror on Saturday night, straightening the tie on my suit. The last time I'd worn it was at Eric's funeral. I expected to feel ill putting it on, but I didn't. Instead, I felt comforted, like Eric was here with me. Grant poked his head through the open bathroom door. You ready? Almost, I said, combing my hair back one last time. Wow, 
Grant said. Haven't seen you clean up this nice since... He cut off. I could already hear what he was going to say. Since your brother's funeral. It's okay. I clapped Grant on the shoulder. You don't have to tread lightly around me anymore. Grant gave me this confused look. Who are you and what have you done with Lucas? I got it. The old me would have been pissed for any reminder of Eric. But now that I knew Eric was in Alora, I felt like I could breathe at the mention of him again. I hadn't told Grant about the night with the seer and how Eric had given me a message. I didn't want to chance anyone trying to talk me out of the Reaper Moon. I was going through with it, and that was final. I mean, I hadn't found the scroll, but I had a week left. I wasn't giving up. I haven't gone anywhere, buddy, I said. This is the old me coming back. Should we go find our dates? Grant frowned. You mean your date? I furrowed my brow. What happened to yours? Grant raised his eyebrows like he was really starting to worry about me. Have you listened to anything I've said at all this past week? If I can't go with Talia, it's totally not worth going out with someone else. But you're still going, I pointed out. Grant shrugged. I'll be there to swoop in when Talia realizes Cody's a total douche. Plus, I'm not missing a dance, man. Then let's get going. I could hardly wait to see Nadine. Grant and I took the grand staircase down to the main foyer. You go on ahead, man, I said. I told Nadine I'd meet her here. He gave me a salute. See you soon. I felt pretty awkward just standing there. I shot a glance around the foyer to see other couples chatting or sipping drinks. I was about to go sit down when movement caught my eye. Nadine stood at the top of the stairs, looking like a radiant goddess. It nearly knocked the wind out of me. She had her hair in long, beautiful waves around her shoulders and wore a floor-length dress that had lots of sparkly diamonds on the bust and exposed part of her midriff. It was a deep, dark purple, like the color of my magic, and it looked really good on her. She glanced around the foyer until her eyes fell on me. Her face lit up. My heart started pounding, and it was as if all time had stood still. I was rooted completely in place, and the only thing that moved around me was Nadine. She reached for the banister and started down the steps. I couldn't take my eyes off her. It wasn't until she reached the bottom of the grand staircase and cleared her throat that I snapped back to attention. She blushed. Everything okay? I quickly reached my hand out and took hers. You look absolutely perfect. She smiled brightly. That smile lit up my whole world. Thank you. After a few moments of silence, I realized it was my turn to speak again. I'm actually really glad you picked that color. It's, um, it's my favorite. I didn't know what color you'd wear, but... I cupped my hands together and conjured the corsage I'd bought her. I opened my palms to reveal a velvety purple rose. It's for you. Nadine gazed down at it, speechless. Lucas, it's beautiful. She held her wrist out, and I placed the corsage over her hand. She ran her fingers over the petals. It's not as beautiful as you, I said. She chuckled under her breath. That's sweet of you. You don't look too bad yourself. I have my moments. I took a step back and held my elbow out to her. May I escort you to the dance? She beamed and hooked her elbow through mine. You may. I led Nadine down the hall. We walked past the cafeteria and to the end of the hall where a pair of double doors opened to a magnificent ballroom. Nadine's jaw dropped when we stepped inside. The ballroom walls were a midnight blue, and the carpet was a deep black. The room was cast in moonlight streaming in through the tall, arched windows. Candles hovered above our heads. They weren't attached to anything, but they bobbed up and down with ease, like one of the professors was using their mentalist powers to set the ambiance. Tarot cards spun between the candles. I looked up and noticed they were all major arcana cards that spoke of good fortune and abundance. The death card was nowhere to be seen, thank the goddess. A live band played at the opposite end of the room, filling the space with a punk rock melody. 
On stage, two skeletons jived to the beat in a coordinated dance. It was obviously the work of a talented necromancer. Grant was already on the dance floor, busting his moves. Amy and Mandy danced alongside him in black and white gothic gowns. Would you like something to drink? I asked Nadine. Sure, she answered with a shrug. I led her over to the refreshments table. A sweet scent emanated from a bubbling cauldron. Two, please, I said to the alchemist behind the table. As he started serving us drinks, Nadine hesitated at my side. What's in it? She asked. I could tell by the way she eyed it, she worried it might flare her symptoms. It should be okay, I said. It's just a hydration potion. Helps you go longer on the dance floor. Oh, she said brightly, sounding intrigued. I'll have to try it then. We sipped our potion, which tasted fruity and sweet with a hint of carbonation. My gaze roamed over the ballroom and stopped on the doors as Talia entered on Cody's arm. Uh-oh, I said under my breath. What? Nadine followed my gaze, and she realized what I was talking about. What's wrong with Cody? I almost snorted. Grant wants to kick his ass. Nadine sighed, but she smiled in amusement. Okay, he can't be that bad. Talia really likes him. What harm is there in letting her enjoy his company? The question was rhetorical, but it made me think of my mom. She claims she enjoys my dad's company. Sure, there were times when he could be fun, but they were few and far between. Not that Cody was anything like my dad, but still. I took another sip of punch. Depends. Want to get out there? She beamed. You're really going to dance with me this time? I tossed my empty cup in the trash nearby, then took her hand. I told you I would, didn't I? Nadine threw her cup away before she finished, then followed me onto the dance floor. The song had changed since we came in, but it was the same punk rock type of music. Nadine started swaying her hips right away, but I just sort of stood back awkwardly. I was not a good dancer. Woohoo! Grant cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted, Nadine is on the floor! Let's get this party started! Get in here, girl! Amy cried, gesturing her forward. Shake it! Mandy added. She spun around and started twerking in Nadine's direction. Nadine giggled as Grant swirled an imaginary lasso above his head. He threw it over her and reeled her to the center of the dance floor. Hey there, buddy, I cut in, stepping between them. I'm going to have to take that from you. She's mine tonight. Grant shrugged and stepped aside, then pretended to place the invisible lasso rope in my hands. Go wild. Nadine threw her head back in laughter as I pretended to reel her in. She ended up so close to me that I grabbed her around the waist. She kept dancing, so I just went along with it, moving my body to the beat. I probably looked like a total fool, but I didn't care. I had Nadine Evers in my arms. My attention was so laser-focused on her that we could have been the only two people in the room for all I knew. When she laughed and danced, it was like my whole dark world lit up. But there was only one thing to see. Her. You're dancing, she exclaimed. Don't go teasing me now, I warned. I might stop. I'm not teasing, she countered. I'm enjoying it. Well, enjoy it while it lasts, I said, though something told me Nadine and I would be sharing many dances in years to come. Hey, Talia shouted as she came onto the dance floor, dragging Cody behind her. Talia, Mandy squealed. She reached out for Talia's hand and then spun her around. Talia giggled, then returned to Cody's side. The two started grinding like they were animals. Good goddess, I did not expect that out of Talia. Nadine noticed me watching them, but she must not have noticed the look of disgust on my face. You want to dance like that? She teased. I shot a glance around the crowded dance floor. With all these people around? She shrugged. Yeah, what could it hurt? All you have to do is stand there. I liked the sound of that. Nadine started to demonstrate. She turned around and pressed her backside against my front, then dipped down a little before coming back up. I gasped. If she kept this up any longer, it was going to be pretty obvious to everyone just how much I liked it. But I didn't want her to stop, either. You okay back there? 
she asked as she continued rubbing herself against me. Peachy, I said. I wanted to slap myself. Was that really the best I could come up with? Good, she teased. Because there's more where that came from. To my surprise, Nadine bent at the waist, pressing her ass against my dick. And no, that wasn't a roll of quarters in my pocket. I was very happy to see her. Damn, I just wanted to reach out and grab her ass, but I couldn't with all the people around. She flipped her hair, then shoved her hands into it, letting it flip around in a really sexy way. Woo! Talia cheered. Nadine's got moves! Nadine turned back toward me, blushing. She placed her arms around my neck and continued to sway her hips to the music. I should maybe save that for when we're alone, huh? My eyebrows shot up. Are you offering me a lap dance? Her lips twitched at the corners. Depends. Are you accepting? Once this fucking curse was gone, she could give me all the lap dances she wanted. Nadine and I started dancing like normal again, and my eyes scanned the crowd. I realized for the first time that Grant had practically stopped dancing. His eyes were locked on Talia and Cody. He looked about ready to bare his teeth and growl. I cocked my head to Nadine, and we danced a few paces over toward Grant. He didn't notice us until I nudged him with my elbow. Finally, he snapped back to reality. What? he asked. Chill, I warned. No one wants to see a fistfight tonight. Grant scoffed. Then let's pray he doesn't give me a reason. Just then, Cody reached down and squeezed Talia's ass. It wasn't cute and sweet either. It was a very obvious full-on ass grab for the whole dance floor to see. Talia squealed and jumped away from him. She looked shocked at first, but a smile came across her face. Cody, what did we talk about? She made it sound like she was joking, but the whole thing made me uneasy. It definitely riled up Grant because he stomped over to them. What the hell do you think you're doing, man? Grant snapped. Cody scowled. Me? I don't even know who the fuck you are. Get out of here. You get out of here, Grant countered. He shoved Cody in the shoulders and he stumbled back into another couple. Grant, don't, Talia shouted. Cody's nostrils flared and he looked ready to punch Grant in the face. Talia threw herself between them. Cody, forget about Grant. He's just a friend. Grant, it's fine. It was harmless. Didn't look that way to me. Grant sneered without taking his eyes off Cody. The girl says she's fine, Cody snapped. Now back off. Nadine went to Talia's side. You okay? The two exchanged a few words in whispers. Grant looked to Talia as if he expected her to call Cody out. Tal, come on. Don't tell me you're okay with that. I'm fine, she insisted. Let's not ruin the night with a fight, okay? Cody scoffed as Talia turned back to him. They started dancing again, though Cody dragged her further away from us. What a loser, he said to her, though it was loud enough for us all to hear. You're really friends with that guy? Is she really okay? I asked Nadine as she returned to my side. She shot a glance at Talia. She says she is. She thinks Grant's overreacting. Do you think he is? I asked. I don't know. She frowned in contemplation. She looks okay now. Talia twirled on the dance floor in Cody's arms, beaming up at him. Grant still hadn't backed down. He stood there, his hands curled into fists. Mandy stepped in front of him and raised an eyebrow. Are Amy and I going to have to drag you off the dance floor? Let Talia have fun with her date. Grant narrowed his eyes at Cody. Do I have to? Yes she insisted. Grant groaned and Mandy shot him a pointed look. Do you want Amy and me to dance around you and try to make her jealous? She suggested. Grant's eyes lit up at that. Mandy, I think you just became my new best friend. Nadine gasped dramatically. I lost top spot? Don't worry, Grant played along. You're top five for sure. She laughed as Grant turned to dance with Mandy and Amy. Just as they were getting into it, the song changed to a slow melody. Now this I could do. I stepped back and offered Nadine my hand. May I have this dance? She curtsied. 
Why, yes, kind sir. I couldn't help but beam as Nadine took my hand and I wrapped my arms around her waist. We swayed on the dance floor and my heart swelled. I loved holding her in my arms. I'm glad we still get dances in college, Nadine said. I'm having lots of fun. Good, I replied. I am too. Even though you're dancing? She asked playfully. I nodded. I mean, you basically twisted my arm, but I'll heal. She snickered, but she went quiet a few moments later and rested her head on my chest. This moment was incredible. I wanted a million more like it, and then some. My eyes roamed the ballroom again. Across the room, I noticed Chloe dancing with Finn, one of the treacherous tarantulas. She kept throwing glances toward Ryan, who sat slumped in one of the chairs and looked out at the crowd like he was too good to be there. His bow tie was already undone like he was totally wasted already. Fucking loser. At least all Chloe's attention was on him and not on my precious Nadine. If she ever tried hurting her again, she was going to have to deal with me. The consequences be damned, I'd curse that bitch's ass to protect my girl. I continued to look around the room and noticed Lena dancing with Gregory. She really had to be desperate for a date if she'd come with him. The poor guy looked at her like he was a lost puppy, but she kept pulling her head away like she couldn't stand him breathing on her. She shot a glance my way, but I ignored her. If she was trying to make me jealous or something, it wasn't going to work. Finally, my eyes landed on Professor Warren and Headmistress Verla standing in the corner. We didn't need chaperones, but they were there, no doubt, to make sure no one spiked the punch bowl or started any fights. It wouldn't be the first time. Verla sipped her drink slowly while Professor Warren talked to her. Whatever he was saying must have been pissing her off because she didn't look him in the eyes. She kept her gaze on the students and pursed her lips. I couldn't tell what he was saying, but he looked somewhat annoyed with her. I hadn't realized the two were on less than friendly terms. What's wrong? Nadine asked. Nothing, I said, turning my gaze back to her. Professor Warren and Headmistress Verla looked mad at each other. She looked toward them and frowned. It definitely looks like something's going on. I saw her twice this week for makeup sessions, and she seemed fine then. I spun Nadine around, then pulled her back into my arms. What day is your ceremony again? She gasped playfully. You don't remember my birthday? I don't think you ever told me, I pointed out. I know it's next week. She snickered lightly. It's the 13th. You're coming to my evoking ceremony, right? My whole body stilled. I must have looked like a statue as it hit me. That would make the eve of her birthday and her ceremony the same night as the Reaper Moon. I know what you're thinking, she said, pushing her hair behind her ear. Friday the 13th is really not the best time for a ceremony. She chuckled nervously, but I didn't respond. Lucas? Nadine asked. I snapped out of it. I couldn't miss the Reaper Moon, but I couldn't ditch her ceremony either. I'll be there, I promised. I had to be. As for the Reaper Moon, I'd be in, out, and done before the witching hour. I'd make it to her ceremony. I hoped. After the slow song ended, Nadine announced that she was going to sit out the next song. I started to follow her before Grant grabbed me by the elbow and dragged me away from her. Sorry, Grant said to Nadine. I've got to steal him for a second. Dude, what the hell? I started. Grant dragged me out of the doors and turned on me as soon as we were in the hallway. He pointed a finger in my direction. I saw that look. What? What look? Nadine told you the night of her ceremony and you totally froze up, he accused. You ditched us the night of your birthday, too, and don't think I haven't noticed you sneaking off campus. What's up with you lately? Nothing, I lied, but my voice rose several pitches. Grant gave me a stern look. Don't lie to me. We've lived together long enough that I know your tells. My tells? I asked. Your eyes narrow when you lie, Grant pointed out. They do not, I defended, but I suddenly realized they were narrowed just a bit. I consciously widened them. Don't tell me you've gotten wrapped up in something bad, 
Grant said. God is no, I hissed. It's not like that at all. He crossed his arms. Then tell me what's up. Nothing, I lied again. I swear. Grant tapped his foot. I'm not letting you go back in there until you tell me. I rolled my eyes. Then you're going to be waiting here a while. He shrugged. I don't have a date waiting for me. I've got all night. I groaned. He had me there. I couldn't let Nadine think I ditched her. What is this, some sort of blackmail? I asked. Grant pursed his lips. It's a threat for sure. Come on, Grant, I complained. Is this for real? You're hiding something, he accused. Am I going to have to save you from yourself? No, I promised. I have it handled. He sighed and dropped his arms. Then let me help. I shook my head. I don't think you're going to want to help on this one. Grant frowned. That's what friends do, Lucas. I pressed my lips together. They were officially sealed. If I said any more, he'd know what I was up to. But I didn't have to say any more. Apparently, my silence was enough. Grant's eyes widened. That's the night of the Reaper's moon, isn't it? You're going to do it. Yes, I snapped. And you're not going to talk me out of it. Grant gaped at me. You're talking about the abyss. If you give up your powers, you'll be condemned by the goddess forever. You'll never be able to enter Alora. I shrugged like it wasn't a big deal, but to be honest, the thought of going to hell scared me. But not as much as being with Nadine for the rest of my life thrilled me. Not to mention getting rid of all these thoughts, ditching the responsibility of the Reaper's Apprentice. Carrying these thoughts around was too much. I'd risk the abyss if it meant I didn't have to carry around these secrets anymore. You said I had to make a decision, I reminded him. I decided. Well, you're deciding wrong, Grant exploded. A few people at the ballroom entrance looked our way. I grabbed Grant by the shoulder and dragged him further down the hall, where we couldn't be heard. In all fairness, this isn't your decision to make, I snapped at him. As soon as I figure out how to do the ritual, I'm doing this. All I need is to find the grave of some guy named Caesar Peppertrine, where there's supposed to be a scroll waiting for me. Grant raked his fingers through his hair. Are you shitting me, Lucas? You're doing this all for... What? A girl? His words were like a slap to the face. Nadine's not just any girl, I growled. She's the girl. Then shouldn't you want to spend the rest of eternity with her? He argued. You're trading your soul to... to get laid. Was he fucking kidding me? That's not what this is about, I argued. I hate my gift, and you know that. This is my one chance to get rid of it. So that's the real reason? He mocked, crossing his arms. You're not just upset about this sex curse? It's not a sex curse. I shot back, fuming. It sure sounds like your dick's making the decisions right now, Grant snapped. A couple walked by just then and shot us an odd look. My teeth gritted as I exploded on Grant. This curse isn't about my dick. It's the whole fucking package. As long as I'm the Reaper's apprentice, I don't get to be in a relationship. I never get married. I never have kids. Nadine deserves all that. Grant looked disgusted with me. That's noble and all, but you're talking about eternity. Our lives here are just a blip on the map. Then what are we doing here? I countered. Our lives matter, Grant. I'm going to make mine count. Nadine actually wants to be with me. She deserves the fucking world. So yeah, I'm gladly trading my soul to give her that. You wouldn't know what that feels like because the girl you're pining for doesn't want you back. Grant's jaw dropped. He stood there for a moment in total silence. To be honest, I was pretty pissed at him. I didn't care. Finally, he found his voice again. Fine, he snapped, opening his arms wide. You want to do this? Be my guest. Just don't expect me to supply the sledgehammer when you're fucking up this asshole's grave marker. I rolled my eyes. Very mature. Grant started to walk away, but he paused and turned back to me. He got up in my face and pointed a finger at me. You know what? 
I hope the mausoleum is haunted. Maybe the spirits will make you think twice about stealing that scroll. With that, Grant stormed off. I paced back and forth, raking my fingers through my hair. What the fuck just happened? I ran the conversation back in my mind, wondering where everything turned to shit. Then something Grant said hit me. The mausoleum. He knew where Caesar Peppertrine's grave was. And he had no idea he'd just helped me find it. It must have been three in the morning before Nadine and I finally left the dance. I walked her back to her room since she looked exhausted. I wanted to make sure she got back all right. When I made it back to my room, Grant still wasn't back yet. He was probably off somewhere being pissed at me for what I said. I changed back into my street clothes and left campus. It didn't matter how late it was. I wasn't going to sleep anyway until I found that scroll. I had an eerie sense of deja vu as I broke into the cemetery using my magic. I formed an orb in my hands and used it to light my path. I must have passed a thousand headstones before I reached the trees at the back of the property. Snow coated the ground, and it was really chilly out, but I barely noticed. My heart was pounding so hard at the thought of being so close. I entered the trees and pushed through the brush until I came upon the abandoned mausoleum where I'd had my evoking ceremony. I climbed over broken bricks and stepped inside. Nothing had changed since the last time I'd been here, except there was a light dusting of snow covering the ground. I glanced around at the grave markers, though there were a few that were still intact. My eyes fell upon one that read, Caesar Peppertrine. I'll be damned. I whispered as I approached. Grant must have noticed the name the night of my evoking ceremony. I knelt beside the marker and ran my fingers over the engraved letters. Something about the name seemed off. According to Coven Records, this grave shouldn't even be here. In fact, there was no pepper trines listed anywhere within the Coven Records. So where had this guy come from? Who are you? And what are you doing with the Reaper's Apprentice scroll? I said under my breath. That's when it hit me. As my eyes roamed over the letters, my brain started to notice a pattern. I quickly conjured one of my notebooks and scribbled his name down on the paper, then started crossing off letters. When I finished, it became very clear. Caesar Peppertrine wasn't a man at all. It was an anagram for Reaper's Apprentice. This grave marker was nothing more than a message. A message for me. Heart pounding, I got to my feet. Well, there's only one way to find out what that message is. I conjured the sledgehammer I'd brought along and started smashing it into the stone. I expected the stone to resist, but it cracked on the first swing. I put all my strength behind the hammer and swung as hard as I could. Smash! The stone gave way just a little more. Smash! 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 With every swing, a little more of the marker crumbled away. Even though it was cold out, I started to sweat. Smash! I swung again. Finally, I broke through. My heart lurched, and I stepped back and set my hammer aside. I stared into an open hole in the wall, trying to catch my breath. There was no casket inside like there should have been, just utter darkness. I stepped forward and knelt down next to the opening. An orb formed in my hand, lighting the cavity in the wall. Utter relief flooded through me when my light touched an ancient scroll sitting in the center. It looked as if it had gone untouched for years. It's here, I whispered. I reached into the cavity and pulled out the scroll. It felt really old and fragile. My pulse quickened as I unrolled the scroll, but my stomach dropped the further I read. I was naive to think this was going to be simple. I'd be lucky if I managed to pull this off at all. Chapter 20 Nadine I couldn't believe my evoking ceremony had arrived so quickly. I shook as I thought of what the night would bring. After tonight, 
I would either be welcomed into the coven or banished. I would cement my life here with Grammy, Lucas, and my friends, or I would be forced to leave. Part of me worried that Chloe had won, that she'd sabotaged enough of my lessons that I wasn't prepared enough. I forcefully pushed the thought from my mind. She hadn't won yet. I couldn't start getting down on myself before I even began. Where's Lucas? I demanded of Grant. Why isn't he here yet? I sat in Grammy's living room, with Issa purring softly on my lap. The coffee table had been removed, and in its place were five candles set in a circle on the floor. I was surrounded by three of the people I loved most in the world. Grammy, Talia, and Grant. But the one person I really wanted to be here wasn't. I was really worried about him, because I didn't think he'd bail on me. I brought his number up on my phone again, but before I could call him, Grant reached out and took my hand. It's not going to help, he said with a frown. We should check on him, I insisted. Yeah, it's really weird he's not here yet, Talia agreed. There's no time, Grammy argued. The witching hour is approaching. This is Nadine's one chance to contact Mother Miriam. We must go through with the ceremony, no matter what. What about Chloe? I asked, my guts twisting. Grammy cocked an eyebrow. What about her? She's sabotaged all my training lessons, I pointed out. I wouldn't put it past her to sabotage this as well. Grammy shook her head. She can't touch you tonight, Nadine. What do you mean? I asked. Mother Miriam protects you on the night of your ceremony, so you can go through with it in peace, Grammy explained. That's why Chloe tried to hurt you during your training, because she knew she couldn't get to you tonight. I dropped my gaze and muttered. Well, she might have had the right idea. I wasn't ready for this. Don't say that, Grammy demanded. You must not let Chloe get to you, especially tonight. She was right. I had to go into this with a clear head. Maybe I need more of that calming tea, I suggested. I set Issa aside and started to get up, but Grammy stood at the same time. Let me get it for you, Nadine. She was coddling me again, which was unnecessary. I'd napped most of the day so I'd have enough energy for tonight. I could get my own tea. She started for the kitchen, but I didn't sit back down. I followed behind her. Grant and Talia immediately started whispering, and I didn't miss the look of concern in their eyes before I left the room. It was almost like one of them knew something was up. Grammy poured me a cup of tea. When she turned, she looked surprised to see me there. Here you go. She handed me the cup, and I began sipping on it. Neither of us moved from where we stood. How's that feel? Grammy asked. I didn't feel any change, to be honest. Getting better, I said, mostly because I wanted it to be true. Grammy sighed. Whatever happens tonight, Nadine, you will complete your evoking ceremony. I furrowed my brow. What was she getting at? I know. She tilted her head to the side. Then why are you letting yourself get so nervous about it? Um, because it's nerve-wracking? Grammy reached out and placed a hand on my shoulder. Tonight is a special night. You only get one chance at this. Embrace it. A lump formed in my throat, and even the tea didn't help wash it down. Grammy, I don't know how, I admitted. I'll show you, she said kindly. She reached out for my tea and set it on the counter beside her. Then she wrapped her arms around me. I melted into the hug. See? Embraced. I chuckled lightly under my breath, but I didn't move to pull away. Her hug was so comforting, and it instantly helped wash away some of my worry. 
What do you think is going to happen? I don't know, she said quietly. It's different for everyone. I finally drew away, but as soon as I did, a knot in my chest tightened. I know. How do you think Mother Miriam will test me? Grammy's features softened. Well, Nadine, you're very curious. Why don't we wait and find out? I frowned, but a smile twitched at the corners of my lips. Grammy, that's not helpful. She smiled back. The truth is, there's no magic formula, Nadine. Sometimes, people who seem to be the best among us end up banished, and others are accepted. It's not the actions you let others see that makes you a part of the Miriamic family. It's the intention that's in your heart. The knot in my chest eased ever so slightly. I'd said something similar to Lucas at the abandoned house in the woods. He'd acted like such a jerk to me when all he wanted to do was protect me. Were my own intentions enough to get me into the coven? Headmistress Verla seems to think Mother Miriam will try to address my grief, I told Grammy. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Grammy's gaze dropped, like she was really contemplating what I said. Finally, she sighed. Nadine, do you think Mother Miriam only accepts perfect souls into her family? I hesitated. Of course not. There were people like Ryan and Gwen who'd already gotten their powers. Obviously, Mother Miriam chose them for a purpose. No, I admitted. She will not banish you for the grief that's in your heart, Grammy promised. She's there to help you with that. I swallowed. How did you get over Grampy's death? Grammy took a few breaths before answering. That's not something you get over. Oh, I said flatly. That wasn't at all the answer I expected. Grammy reached out and guided my chin upward to look her in the eye. It's something you accept, but not forget. I don't understand, I admitted. Death is not an end for us, Nadine, Grammy reminded me. I know, I said. We go on to live in Alora. She shook her head like that wasn't what she meant. Your parents live on in your heart. Every hug, every kiss, every moment they supported you. It filled your heart with love, Nadine. And every action you've had from the moment they died has been a chance to spread that love they showed you. Your parents left you with a gift. You must not wrap it up and try to give it back. You must open it and let your love pour out into the world. I got so choked up. I could hardly get the words out. Thank you, Grammy. She smiled. Any time. The witching hour is almost here. Shall we get started? But what about Lucas? I asked. He's coming. He promised me he'd be here. Grammy frowned. I'm afraid we'll have to start without him. I couldn't do that. Lucas would make it. He'd be at my side while I went through my trials. He had to be. I narrowed my eyes at Grammy. Is this one of my tests to see what I'd do without him? Grammy threw her head back and laughed. This is not a test, Nadine. This is real. Well, how am I supposed to know that? I asked. You can't, she admitted. But here's what you need to remember. Grammy got a really serious look on her face. Don't live your life like it's a test, Nadine. Live your test like it's your life. Grammy started back toward the living room, but I just stood there, contemplating what she said. It took me repeating it several times in my mind to realize what she meant. This test wasn't about doing the right things to get into the coven. 
It was about showing Mother Miriam who I was on a deeply spiritual level. All I could do was strive to make her proud. Nadine? Grammy called from the living room. Coming, I called back. I took another sip of calming tea before leaving it on the counter and returning to the living room. I was disappointed to see that Lucas still wasn't there. Grant must have noticed my unease because he quickly stood and grabbed my shoulders. He looked me straight in the eye and said, It's going to be okay, Nadine. Focus on the ceremony. I searched his eyes. You know something, don't you? Grant pressed his lips together. I know that if Lucas can't make it, he has a good reason. Or something bad happened to him, I pointed out. Worry about your ceremony, he insisted. Then we'll worry about Lucas. I sighed. I didn't have any other choice, did I? Grant stepped aside, and Talia stood to pull me into a hug. You're going to do great, Nadine, she encouraged. You've got this. I squeezed her back. Thanks, Tal. I'm really glad you're here. She smiled brightly. I wouldn't miss it for the world. At my feet, Issa purred and rubbed herself against my leg. I bent to pick her up, then pressed my nose into her fur. It'll be all right, I whispered to her. I'm ready, Mom. Deep down, I didn't feel like it was true, but I couldn't back out now. It's time, Nadine, Grammy said. I handed Issa to Talia, then stepped into the middle of the room. The candles weren't even lit yet, but I swore I could feel a heightened sense of energy inside the circle. I lay on my back on the carpet and closed my eyes. No sooner had I laid my head down did I hear the sound of Grammy's clock striking midnight from the hall. The witching hour has arrived, Grammy said in a grave tone. We can begin. I heard the sound of Grant striking a lighter, but I kept my eyes closed. My whole body quaked in anticipation. Issa meowed from Talia's lap, but I shut out all external stimuli and focused on keeping my body relaxed. Grammy began to recite an incantation. The clock has struck the witching hour. It's time to wake this witch's power. A shiver traveled down my spine. Grammy spoke in a voice I'd never heard her use before. It was so full of finite clarity. At first, it was strange, but her voice began to soothe me the longer she spoke. We call our goddess down to earth to bear witness to this new rebirth, she continued. A series of tests she shall partake and join the coven before day breaks. I felt my body begin to rise from the floor, and then... Darkness enveloped me. I didn't know where I was or how I'd gotten there. I lay on a warm, hard surface. When I tried to move, I went nowhere. I was paralyzed. Hello? I called, my voice wavering. Is anyone there? As I spoke, I realized the weight of a blindfold around my eyes. I started to struggle even more, and I found that I could move my feet, but my arms were bound to my sides. I began to panic. Help! I cried. Somebody, help me! A million questions raced through my head all at once. Where was I? What had happened to me? Who had done this? The sound of echoing voices met my ears. Three girls giggled in unison, and a knot in my stomach twisted so tight I could swear the ropes around my arms tightened as well. The lucky three. Chloe? I demanded. Let me go! This isn't funny anymore! I heard the sound of footsteps approach. They were soft, as if she walked on the carpet. 
Oh, Nadine, Chloe scoffed. But it is funny. Chloe! I screamed as I listened to the sound of her footsteps retreat. What did you do to me? Let me go! She chuckled again. I didn't do this to you, Nadine. You did this. Suddenly, I stopped struggling. I tried flipping back through my memory to figure out how I'd gotten here, but I couldn't remember. Though I had every reason to believe Chloe had done this to me, given her track record and complete and utter disdain for me, I had no proof. I couldn't say with certainty that she was wrong, either. But how could I tie myself up and blindfold myself? I racked my brain, trying to come up with an answer. What bothered me more than being tied up was that I couldn't recall the events leading up to it. Hello? I cried. Can anyone hear me? Chloe cleared her throat. I gave a start as I hadn't realized she was still there. No one's coming to your rescue, Chloe said. You could help, I bit at her. Why would I do that when you can just untie yourself? She asked. I scoffed. Untie myself? How am I supposed to do that? I don't know, Chloe said, like she didn't care one way or another. Get creative. It was in that moment that I realized I didn't have a single idea. I'd been here for several minutes already, and all I could do was question how I got here. I needed to look for the solution. Once this blindfold was off, maybe then I'd find my answer. I began to struggle more, but the more I struggled, the tighter the rope held on me. My whole body ached, and I thought the circulation in my arms might stop dead at any moment. I can't move, I sobbed. Please, somebody help. Chloe chuckled. Stop playing the victim, Nadine. My whole body stilled. I'd heard Chloe say that before. It was an introduction to Tarot when I drew the Eight of Swords card. Her feet are unbound. She has the ability to go in any direction she chooses. The woman in this card is bound by her own doing. All she has to do is stop playing the victim, I recalled Chloe saying. And that's the moment it became clear to me. My feet were unbound. I could go anywhere I wanted. I am not a victim, I stated with every ounce of conviction I had in me. Once I realized that, the solution was simple. I pulled my knees to my chest and rolled over. All I had to do was get to my knees, then stand on my own two feet. The moment I stood upright, the rope that bound me loosened and fell away. I reached up and tugged the blindfold off my eyes. I glanced around to see that I was standing in the middle of the main foyer. It was really dark, except for a small fire that burned in the fireplace. I looked around for Chloe, but she was gone. Before I could take another breath, an earth-shattering scream tore through the night. I whirled around and saw that the front doors of the school were wide open. A strong breeze swept past the doors, blowing leaves all over the place. I could barely see anything through the darkness of the night. I ran outside in the direction of the scream, but I stopped dead when the scene came into view. I stared up at a tall oak tree. Chloe's feet hovered just above the ground kicking frantically and searching for a foothold to save herself. Her hands grasped her neck where a tight noose had been slung around her throat. For a moment, a pang of satisfaction hit me. I didn't dare admit to anyone, but watching Chloe hang like that made me feel a bit... triumphant. I knew immediately it was the devil on my shoulder talking, because I felt the sudden urge to punch that sucker out. I didn't care what Chloe had done to me in the past. She didn't deserve a death like this. Chloe clawed at the rope around her neck. Help! She gasped, 
though I could barely understand the word. Screw the dark side of me that enjoyed watching her hang. The real Nadine found it sickening. I raced over to her and got beneath her, my heart racing in panic. I lifted her onto my shoulders, though it took every ounce of my strength to keep my aching knees from collapsing beneath me. I've got you, Chloe! I called up to her. Her center of gravity shifted from side to side. I assumed it was because she was struggling to get the noose off her neck. Are you okay? I asked, since I couldn't see anything. Can you? Chloe's weight gave way, and we both went tumbling to the ground, screaming. She pressed her hand to her bruised neck and gasped for breath. Why did you save me, Nadine? She managed to choke out. Our eyes connected, and for the first time since I met her, I saw a look of pure gratitude in her eyes. I had to, I told her. No, you didn't, she argued, like she couldn't understand me at all. I've been awful to you. You should have enjoyed watching me hang. I shook my head. Not like that. We're part of the same coven. We help each other, even if you're my enemy. Chloe opened her mouth to say something, but she never got the chance. The sound of a woman's maniacal laughter reached us. I gave a start, and both of us looked in the direction of the voice. It was coming from somewhere inside the school. What's going- I started to ask, but I cut off when I looked back to Chloe. Except she wasn't there. I glanced around frantically, wondering where she'd disappeared to. She couldn't have run off that fast. My heart started pounding fiercely as the laughter continued. Something about it sounded chillingly familiar, though I couldn't put my finger on it. Curiously, I rose to my feet and stepped toward the school. I followed the sound of laughter through the dark hallways of Miriam Mansion. Light flickered from the sconces on the wall, and the hair on the back of my neck stood. Hello? I called down the hall. No answer came. Cautiously, I stepped forward until I came to the double door entrance to the school's ballroom. I peeked inside to see a woman sitting cross legged on the ground, her back to me. She wore all leather and had long brown hair flowing down her back. The room was almost entirely black except for the light coming from five candles set around the girl. Each candle was connected by a line of salt that created a pentagram. Another salt line surrounded that, enclosing everything into a circle. The woman looked like she was doing something with her hands, but I couldn't see what it was. Are you going to stand there all day, Nadine? She asked bluntly. I hesitated. How'd she know I was here? I know you're out there, she called without turning her head. Come see what I've made for you. For us. Her voice sounded so familiar. Something told me I knew this woman, but I couldn't place her. Carefully, I took a step forward. Do I know you? She chuckled like the question amused her. Oh, Nadine, don't you recognize yourself? Finally, she turned toward me, and my heart lurched into my throat. My own face stared back at me. But at the same time, it wasn't me. She was more like my evil twin, with dark makeup around the eyes and a smirk of unadulterated pride I'd never be caught dead wearing. I had more self-respect and humility than that. What the hell is going on? I demanded. This had to be another one of Chloe's illusions. She gave me a sinister smile. Come look. I hesitated, but I was too curious to see what she was holding. I stepped around her and saw that she had a small stuffed doll in her hand. A voodoo doll? 
My knees shook as I stared down at the doll. The coven didn't practice voodoo. Hell, I didn't even know if voodoo was real. Two other dolls lay on the ground in front of my doppelganger. Each was faceless and dressed only in black fabric, except they each had a different color of yarn sewn onto their heads. The one on the left depicted a girl with short brown hair. The one on the right had long, white, blonde hair. And the one she held had black hair. Are those the lucky three? I asked, but my voice came out scratchy and dry. She smirked proudly. What do you think of them? I made them for you. Well, I don't want them, I snapped. No good could come of this. She tilted her head. I thought this was what we both wanted, Nadine. Revenge. I just want them to stop tormenting me, I stated. I don't want to hurt anyone. She smirked. But it'd be so fun. She set the Chloe doll between the other two and picked up a dagger that lay at her side. I hadn't seen it before. She brought the blade to the pad of her thumb and pressed until thick red liquid began to drip down the blade. For Gwen, I was thinking poison. She pressed her bloody finger to the Gwen doll's mouth and wiped the blood across it. Killed by her own cast. She set the blade aside and picked up a pin. For Camille, a heart attack. She stabbed the pin into the brunette doll's heart. Her eyes widened in pleasure. It should go undetected. Finally, for Chloe, I've saved something special. An evil smile spread across her face as she picked up a red string of yarn and began to tie it around the Chloe doll's neck. She held the doll up by the string and smiled down at it with crazy eyes. Hanging, she chuckled. My guts twisted, and I took a step back. This isn't what I want. No? My doppelganger tilted her head. But it's the only way to save ourselves, Nadine. I'm no killer, I spat. But you are she reminded me. You let Rocky outside without his leash. Rocky had been our neighbor's dog. They'd hired me as a kid to dog sit when they went on vacation. One day, I accidentally left the door open, and he slipped outside and was hit by a car. It had been so long ago that I barely remembered Rocky. How do you know about that? I demanded. Her lips curled into a sneer. Because I'm the one who left the door open. That dog was a fucking nightmare. We did it on purpose. No, I cried. It was an accident. She got to her feet, and I backed up another step. She stared at me under dark lashes as she stepped out of the pentagram. Tell yourself that all you want, Nadine. It doesn't change what you did. I'm not like you, I cried. Killing people isn't how I handle things. It'll only get me banished from the coven. But you want to, she accused, taking another step toward me. You want to get rid of Chloe. We both do. Not like this, I insisted. There has to be another way. There is no other way, she exploded. Let me out to play, and I'll do my worst. I took another step back. No. I hadn't realized how far we'd moved across the ballroom until my heel touched the wall. I ended up pressed flat against it. Dark Nadine got so close to me that I could feel her breath on my face. Admit it, Nadine. You're weak. That's not true, I said. It is, she growled. You're so weak, even your body's rejected you. 
It hates you so much it's trying to kill itself just to get rid of you. You're wrong, I stated. My hands shook and curled into fists. Who the hell did this bitch think she was? She narrowed her eyes. How do you expect Lucas to love you if he has to take care of you all the time? You're weak, Nadine. Let me take over, and I'll make you strong. Strong. I'd do anything to be strong again. To live a life where the constant joint pain and debilitating fatigue didn't drag me down. She reached out and lifted a strand of my hair. She spoke in a smooth, alluring voice. You're a burden, Nadine. I can change that. The more she spoke, the more I became entranced by her. And our parents, she continued, I can make you forget all about them. I swallowed. I don't want to forget about them. Yes, you do, she snapped her eyes suddenly darkening again. You want to forget the pain. You want to get rid of the memories and forget they ever existed. You don't want them anymore. Why do you think they died? They couldn't stand being your parents. They left because of you, and you want to leave too, don't you, Nadine? No, I screamed. I want them back, but I can't. So I'll live with the pain, because it reminds me that they were there to begin with. I loved my parents, and they loved me. I am not their burden. I shoved Dark Nadine as hard as I could, and she went stumbling backward. I made a run for it, but I barely made it a few steps before something hard slammed into my back. The air left my lungs, and I went tumbling down. I threw my hands outward to catch myself, but I saw stars. I quickly rolled over to see her coming at me. Dark black magic crackled in her hands. She threw her head back and laughed as she approached. Try to run, Nadine. I will always be with you. You and I are one in the same. We're not, I screamed. She came close enough to touch. I kicked my heel into her gut. She stumbled back, and the magic in her hand fizzled out. She gasped for breath as I scrambled to my feet and ran across the ballroom. But Dark Nadine moved faster than me. She sprinted in front of me and cut me off on my way to the door. With a single wave of her hand, the door swung shut, slamming so hard against the frame it shook the room. There's nowhere to go she mocked. You can't outrun me. My gaze darted to my left, toward the pentagram circle. The dagger still lay in the middle of it, next to the dolls. I can try, I spat. I jumped away from her and sprinted toward the dagger. I heard her footsteps behind me and dove for the knife. She caught me by the legs and landed on top of me. I was barely six inches from the dagger and couldn't reach it. Get off me, I cried, struggling out of her hold. I managed to yank one of my feet away, then slammed it into her face. Her head snapped backward, but she grabbed tighter to my leg until I thought it was going to bruise. Her eyebrows slammed together and her nostrils flared. Bitch, she snarled. She pulled me backward with all her strength, dragging me through the salt circle and away from the dagger. I clawed at the carpet, but it was no use. There was nothing to hang on to. Then my hands found something. One of the candles. I curled my fingers around it and swung my arm toward her. I shoved the flame up into her face. Her shrill cry echoed off the walls of the empty ballroom. As her hands came up to cradle her burnt skin, I took my chance and dove for the dagger again. My fingers touched the cool handle. I was just about to use it against her when a black heel stomped on my wrist. Ah! I screamed as my bones crushed into the ground. I heard a horrifying snap, and pain shot up through my arm and down to my fingertips. 
and still, she didn't let up. Dark Nadine bent down, her chest heaving with shallow breaths. A burn red with blisters marred the side of her face. I told you that you can't outrun me. She reached over and picked up the Chloe doll, then ripped the hair from its head. I tried to struggle away from her, but each time I moved, an ungodly pain rippled up and down my arm. She placed all her weight on my wrist and laughed maniacally. See this doll, Nadine? She held it in front of my face and smiled proudly. That's you. She held the doll over one of the candle flames. No! I cried, horror twisting deep within my gut. My toes started to heat like there was a fire burning beneath me. Don't! She chuckled as if she enjoyed the sound of me begging. Too late. She lowered the doll and the fabric caught fire. A shriek so loud it could wake the dead erupted out of my lungs. Though there was no fire at my feet, I felt the flames licking up my legs. It was like my skin was searing straight off my bones. Dark Nadine rose to her feet and took a step back. I wished I could say it was a relief when she released my wrist, but I barely felt the pain of broken bones anymore. All I could feel was the fire consuming my body. I writhed on the ground as if I could outrun the red-hot pain consuming me. It was as if a million heated pins had pricked my body all at once. My vision started to blur as the invisible flames licked up my body and began to sear the skin from my face. I was right about you, Nadine, Dark Nadine mocked. You're weak. Always have been. You can push me down. You can try to control me. But I will always win. I gritted my teeth. Pushing past the fiery inferno, I lifted my arm. Not this time. I took the dagger in my good hand and forced all of the strength I had through my arm. I lifted the dagger and plunged it downward, straight into Dark Nadine's foot. It sliced through her boot, into her skin, and out the bottom of her sole. It embedded so far that the blade didn't even show. It had stuck straight into the floor and rooted her in place. She screamed a chilling cry and dropped the doll. It fell within my reach, and I grabbed it, stomping out the fire with my hand. Relief washed over me as the pain stopped spreading. I could have sworn if I looked at myself, skin would be hanging off my bones. But I pushed past it and scrambled to my feet. I backed up several paces. Dark Nadine tried to come for me, but the dagger kept her in place. She screamed in frustration and pain as her foot tugged on the dagger, ripping into more flesh as she tried to come after me. I'm not weak, I yelled at her. I whirled around and ran for the doors. You're nothing without me, she shouted from behind me. I flung the doors open and stumbled out into the hall. As quickly as I could, I closed them again. My heart slammed against my ribcage as I glanced around. My eyes landed on a branched candlestick sitting on a table in a nearby alcove. I ran for it and snatched it up, then returned to the doors where I shoved the candlestick through the handles to trap my darkness inside. She screamed again, louder this time. Her shriek echoed down the hall and I guessed she must have ripped the dagger from her foot. I'll come for you, Nadine, she raged through the closed doors. I'll come for you. My heart raced as I whirled around and sprinted away from the ballroom and the evil woman locked inside. I glanced back to make sure she wasn't coming for me, but the hall was empty. As I turned forward again, my toes caught on the hallway rug and I stumbled forward. I threw my hands out to catch myself. But instead of landing on carpet, my hands sank into the earth. One second I was running away from my darkness in the halls of Miriam Mansion, and the next I was lying in the grass, the daylit sky overcast above me. 
Dark Nadine completely fell from my mind, as if the moment with her had never happened. The pain of a broken wrist vanished. My attention became completely wrapped in the scene before me. The first thing I saw was a stone. A smooth, polished stone. I lifted my head to see that it was a gravestone, one of many throughout the graveyard. My eyes drifted over the two names etched into the grave marker. Nathan Evers, Faith Evers, Loving Father and Mother. Somehow, I'd ended up at my parents' graves. Chapter 21 Lucas The setting sun lit the sky in a bright orange hue as I approached the gates of the cemetery. The reaper moon would rise soon, and then I could begin the ritual. I was excited by the idea to get rid of the voices, to ditch the curse. It would be a dream come true. And yet another part of me feared I might not have what it takes. This was my one and only shot, and if I couldn't summon the reapers by night's end, Nadine and I would always be kept at arm's length. I steeled my shaking nerves and stepped into the cemetery. I trudged through the snow until I came upon a tall statue at the center of the cemetery. It depicted a reaper, at least ten feet tall, clothed in a dark, flowing robe. Where his face should be was nothing but a dark hole. His fingers were only bone. One of his hands reached outward, as if inviting me closer. The other hand held on to a tall scythe. At the base of the statue was a name carved into the stone. Edgar Noak, Reaper's Apprentice. He'd been the one before me. Beneath his name were his birth and death dates. The rumors were true. The poor bastard had lived to be over a hundred. I didn't want to do the math to figure out how many thoughts he'd carried with him to the afterlife. I took a deep breath as the sun dipped below the horizon. Almost time. I knelt at the head of Edgar's grave and waited. As I waited, I tried to calm myself, to push all doubt out of my mind. I can do this, I told myself. I will summon a reaper. I didn't know if I meant it, or if it was just wishful thinking. Darkness continued to fall over the night until finally the last few rays of sunshine disappeared. Above me the full moon shone. I liked to think the clear skies were a beacon of hope, as if opening me to Alora above. But somehow the stars seemed dimmer than they should, like there was a darkness cutting me off. My gaze darted around the cemetery. The shadows of the gravestones were ominous. A shiver ran down my spine. But I knew my unease was all in my head. Tonight there were no zombies that were going to jump out of the bushes. Tonight the only enemy was myself. Though I was on my knees, my legs shook beneath me. I summoned the scroll I'd stolen from the mausoleum and read over it again for the hundredth time. It shook in my hands. I had to get this right. It had to be perfect. Give up your blood to a reaper's grave. Shed doubt, fear not, stand firm and brave. Face the thoughts that you've neglected. Accept and let go of all you've collected. The interpretation was clear. I had to revisit all the thoughts that I'd been given to me as the Reaper's apprentice before handing them over. This was going to be a long fucking night. Well, I sighed to myself, it's now or never. I summoned a knife and pressed the blade to my opposite palm. I winced as the knife sliced into my skin but after the initial shock, I didn't mind. The stinging pain was sort of welcome. Blood dripped out of my palm and stained the snow below me. I reached out and smeared the blood across the base of the reaper's statue, straight across his name. Then I shoved my hand into the snow to numb the sting. It eased it until my hand became so numb I couldn't feel anything at all. With my good hand, I summoned the leather-bound spellbook where I recorded all the thoughts I'd heard. I didn't have to open it to recall the exact wording of the first thought I'd ever collected. 
I made a mistake. I repeated Eric's last thought, though it barely came out. I'd never spoken his words out loud, and I knew why. The words cut deep into my chest, tearing deep, sharp holes in my heart. I hated that he'd died with this last thought on his mind. He should have died happy, but it was done now. He'd moved on. It was time I did, too. I swallowed the lump in my throat and continued. I don't want to die. Tears pricked at my eyes. Fuck, I was only on the first one. How was I going to make it through hundreds? The hard part is over, I told myself. You've faced Eric's last thought. You can handle a handful of strangers' thoughts. Let's get this over with. I opened the book and began to read the words I'd recorded. Some thoughts were easier than others. Some didn't make sense at all. Every now and then there were those that tore me to the very core. I couldn't help but wonder if these people had crossed over all right. Had I done right by holding on to their thoughts so they could make it to the other side? Or had their dark past behind those thoughts held them back? I hope she got what she deserved. I read. The thoughts just kept going like that. Revenge, regret, anger, sadness. I'm not ready to go. I should have stopped him from hurting her. I'll get my revenge in the afterlife. I tried not to think about how much time had passed. The coldness of the night brushed across the back of my neck and seeped through my jacket. My fingers became numb and I curled my arms around myself to try to keep warm. It barely helped, though. I shivered and my breath turned to fog each time I breathed out. I'll miss you. I hope you keep your promise. Is it playtime? Page after page. It kept going. Hundreds of thoughts piling up. The more I read, the harder it became. It was like each thought I read added another ten-pound weight to my chest. Finally, after an eternity of reviewing each and every thought in my journal, I reached the last page I'd filled in. I read out the last thought and breathed a sigh of relief. I'd done it. I'd reached the end. I glanced around the cemetery, waiting for the reapers to appear. But I saw nothing. Hello? I called out to the darkness. Anyone there? I did like the spell said. I faced the thoughts. Where are you? No answer came. My guts sank. Frantically, I flipped back to the front of the journal and read the thoughts over again. Still nothing. This is what I'm supposed to do, isn't it? I shouted. I was a fool if I actually thought someone was going to answer. I must be doing something wrong. I muttered to myself. I turned back to the scroll and unrolled it all the way. I flipped it over, once, then twice, to make sure I hadn't missed anything. This is it. That's all I have to do. What am I doing wrong? That was my only explanation. I wasn't doing it right. Face the thoughts. Maybe reading them wasn't enough. Maybe it was about feeling them. I took a deep breath and started at the beginning again for the third time. This time I didn't just read the words on the page. I took a breath for each thought and allowed the messages to seep deep into my soul. I gave each of them the time and consideration they deserved. By the time I was done, hours must have passed. Fuck, if this took me much longer, I was going to miss Nadine's ceremony. I held my breath and looked around the cemetery again. I could swear I felt a presence there, but it must have been wishful thinking because there were no reapers. No, anything. Come on! I gritted my teeth and muttered under my breath. I reread the ritual again, and something jumped out at me. I have to let the thoughts go, I realized. It was so simple. I conjured a lighter and held the edge of my journal above the flame. 
The pages caught fire instantly, and the flames eagerly ate away at the paper. Once the flames came too close to my hands, I tossed the journal to the snow in front of me. I watched as the flames ate away at the words on the page. Pieces of burnt paper broke off and drifted away in the wind, tumbling across the surface of the snow. I wish I could say I felt something, but I didn't. It should have been a relief, but the weight on my chest only became heavier. Nothing within the cemetery changed. It was just shadows, just cold, just emptiness. Fuck the reapers, I shouted to the skies. Frustration curled its evil arms around me, squeezing me so tight it was the only thing I could feel. My eyebrows knitted tightly together and my lips pressed into a firm line. Was this some kind of sick joke they were playing on me? Was this fucking ritual even real? I got to my feet. Where are you? I screamed, my voice echoing over the cemetery. You're supposed to be here. I summoned you. Come and take this curse from me. I reacted without thinking about it. I curled my hand into a fist and slammed my knuckles against the base of the reaper statue. A sharp, unbearable pain shot across my hand. Fuck! I cried. I sucked air through my teeth and tried to catch my breath. Is that what you wanted? Is that what the ritual needs? Blood and broken bones? Have them. I don't fucking care anymore. Heavy, shallow breaths racked my chest, and my arms quaked. I held my hand tight to my abdomen, but the pain started to ease quickly. I flexed my hand to find it wasn't broken. Hurt like a son of a bitch, though. Face the thoughts you've neglected. Accept and let go of all you've collected, I spat. You want to know the truth of what I've neglected? You want to know? I was raging like a madman at nothing but a lifeless statue, but I didn't care. I fucking hate myself, I screamed. Is that what you want to hear? Let's see, what have I collected? Shame, guilt, depression. You need a longer list? I didn't see the signs that my brother was at the edge of his life. I could have stopped it if I just took a second to understand what he was going through, to listen to his cries for help. I should have known when he didn't show up for my ceremony that something was wrong. I should have helped. I barely took a breath before I continued raging. And guess what else? I made a promise to the highest power of all the coven, and I broke it. I said I'd accept whatever Mother Miriam had in store, but I rejected it the night she gave it to me. I should feel guilty about that. You want to know why I'm doing this? Because I'm damned to the abyss anyway. Might as well try to enjoy the one chance of happiness I'll ever get. But I don't deserve even that. We all know it. That's why you're not here, isn't it? I'm not worthy. You think so too. Otherwise you'd be here. I plopped my ass on the ground and leaned my back against the base of the reaper statue. I pulled my knees to my chest and buried my face in my arms. My whole body shook, but I'd be damned if it didn't feel good to get all that out in the open. Lucas. My gaze snapped upward at the sound of the voice. The blood drained from my face when I saw a cloaked man standing there. He was as solid as I was. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. It worked. My heart began to pitter-patter against my ribcage. You're a reaper? I questioned cautiously. Part of me worried this might be some sort of joke. My eyes roamed over him, looking for signs of death, but his hands were covered in dark gloves, and I couldn't see his face. I'm Edgar Nowak, the newest member of the Reaper Order, he stated. I take it you've summoned me to remove your power. So it's true? I asked hopefully. You can do it? Yes he said, but a grave warning lurked in his tone. You understand what this means, don't you? I know, I said desperately. Refusing Mother Miriam's gift will damn me to the abyss, but I want it gone. The abyss is not a damnation to be taken lightly. Abandoning Mother Miriam is a sin that can never be forgiven, he warned. 
You will burn for all eternity. The flesh will be seared from your bones, regrown and burned off again and again. Splinters will be shoved beneath your fingernails before each fingernail is ripped from your nail bed one by one. Red-hot rods will be shoved into your eyes. You will not feel a moment of relief, young reaper. You will be faced with a nightmare most cannot even begin to imagine. You will suffer in ways men have never suffered before. Are you sure you want to do this? Nothing he said scared me. The real hell was never getting a chance to live a full life with Nadine. I stood and planted my feet firmly beneath me. All the shaking that had rocked my body moments ago had vanished. I held my head high as I answered, I'm sure. Tell me what to do. Chapter 22 Nadine My heart jumped into my throat, and I scurried backward until my back hit the gravestone behind me. My stomach felt as if a gaping hole were about to erupt open. I pulled my knees to my chest and curled myself into a ball. I buried my face into my knees because I couldn't stand to look at my parents' graves. I shouldn't be here, I thought. Why had I come? I knew I'd never be able to handle it, seeing their names on the headstone, knowing their bodies had been placed into the ground at that very spot. Your parents are dead. I didn't know where the voice had come from, but it must have been my own. It was a dark, cruel reminder of everything I'd been through after losing them. I wanted them back. I wanted them back more than anything. And I never would. Nadine, a woman's voice said. I must have been hallucinating, because she sounded just like my mother. I lifted my gaze. I nearly dropped dead right then and there. Two figures stood above me, but it was like looking at ghosts. Nadine? Dad asked, reaching out his hand. Nothing about him had changed. He had brown hair, electric blue eyes, and a graying beard. Yet something felt off. Of course it does. He's dead, I reminded myself. It's okay, Nadine, Mom encouraged. Her voice sounded like a song. She was so pretty. Why hadn't I ever realized how pretty she was before? My parents held their hands out to me, waiting for me to accept them. Is it really you? I asked, my voice cracking. Dad nodded. It's us, baby girl. Sobs began to rock my shoulders. I reached out and took each of their hands, and they helped me to my feet. I wrapped an arm around each of them until the three of us were locked into an embrace. They felt so real, so solid. I didn't know how, but they were here with me. Hot, heavy tears streamed down my face, but the hole in my belly started to close. I felt like I could breathe for the first time in months. How are you here? I asked. I wished I could keep them here forever. This is impossible. Mom drew away from me and tilted her head. Impossible how, sweetheart? I sniffled and wiped the tears from my eyes. You know? Mom and Dad exchanged a shocked expression. They didn't know. We know what? Dad asked. What's going on? A weight settled on my chest. How could they pretend like they didn't know what happened? Tears fell down my cheeks. I wrapped my arms around myself because it was all I could do to hold myself together. You don't remember? Mom tilted her head to the side. Remember what? You're really going to make me say it, aren't you? I sobbed. We don't understand, Dad insisted. Tell us what's wrong, Nadine. My bottom lip trembled. 
I wanted to tell them, but I couldn't get the words out. I just totally froze up. Mom stepped forward and took my arm. I couldn't believe how warm and real she felt. All I wanted to do was wrap her in my arms again, but I couldn't. Because no matter how much I wanted my parents with me, it couldn't happen. I didn't know how it was happening now, but it wasn't real. Let's go home, Mom suggested. We'll get this all sorted out. I jerked away from her, but my voice came out really small. I can't go home with you. Of course you can, Dad said, like this was any old day. We had plans to work on the car this afternoon. And you and I were going to make cookies, Mom reminded me. My stomach dropped. I wanted to do all of that so badly. I'd love to drop everything and go home with them. But instead... I took a step back. I'm sorry, but I can't, I told them. You don't belong here. I have to go back home to Octavia Falls. Mom's brow furrowed. You don't live in Octavia Falls, Nadine. You've never been there. Are you having an episode? No, I'm not having an episode, I snapped. Why couldn't they see? How could I make them understand? Then tell us what's wrong, Dad demanded. You're dead! I burst. The world seemed to stop spinning. The entire cemetery went silent, though my voice continued to echo in the distance. Dead. My parents were dead. I'd said it aloud so many times before, but I never felt it like I did in that moment. They were truly, honestly, 100% gone from this earth. And nothing I could do, no amount of praying, seances, necromancy, or potions could bring them back. Dad looked at me. His eyebrows knit together, creating deep lines of concern on his forehead. What do you mean, baby girl? Your mother and I are fine. No, you're not. I cried. You died last summer. I planned your funeral. I watched your caskets be placed into the ground, right? I cut off. As I gestured to their grave plot, I realized their names had been removed. There was nothing but smooth stone where their names had been carved. Nadine? Mom asked, worry lacing her tone. Are you okay? No! I cried, rounding the gravestone to inspect it from every angle. No, I'm not okay. This is where I buried you. You're not real. You're ghosts. And that's when it truly hit me. This was it for us. The next time I'd meet them would be in Alora. You're ghosts, I repeated in a low whisper. And as I said it, as I felt it deep down within my soul, the names on the gravestone began to appear again. Bits of stone sank inward in the shape of letters until it showed my parents' names again. Warmth spread throughout my heart when I realized what this meant. I'd been given a second chance to speak to them. I could say all the things I didn't get the chance to say. Nadine, Mom started, but I cut her off. We don't have much time, I said quickly. Please, let me get this out before you leave. I walked over to my father and pulled him into a tight hug. Dad, I should have said thank you more. You supported me in everything. Do you remember when I was eight and snuck DVDs to my room to watch those homicide detective shows you and Mom thought I was too young for? You caught me one day, and I thought I would be grounded for life. But instead, you came into my room, sat next to me on the bed, and started watching with me. You didn't say a thing, just held me in your arms and kept watching. Sobs bubbled up in my throat, but I continued. When I was ten and told you I wanted to be a homicide detective, you didn't think that it was too off the wall. 
You bought me my first Clue game for my birthday, and you played every Sunday since. You taught me more about cars than most girls will ever know, and you made me fight when I thought there was no fight left in me. I drew away and wiped at my nose. Dad stared down at me with the softest, kindest expression. That was one of the things I missed most about him. The kindness. You taught me how to be good to other people, I told him. And I'm never going to forget that. Tears welled in my father's eyes. I love you, baby girl. I love you too. Dad and I shared another embrace. I didn't want to pull away, but I had more to say to my mother. I turned to her. Mom, I wish I'd listen to you more. You are so wise, especially about boys. Mom chuckled, but she couldn't hide the tears. I do have some experience in that area. I miss everything about you, I said. The smell of your hair, the way you'd dance when you were doing dishes. I miss coming home to the smell of freshly baked bread and cookies on the counter. Sometimes I want to crawl into your bed like I did when I was a kid, because when I lost you it was just one huge nightmare. But I know everything is going to be okay because you taught me how to be independent in ways I didn't realize. Mom pulled me into a hug before I was done telling her how much I missed her. I hugged her back so hard that it made my arms hurt. Finally, we drew away from each other, and I looked to both of my parents. You have both been wonderful to me. You put up with me when I acted out and stood by me with unwavering faith when I was in and out of the hospital. You two have just been amazing. I couldn't have asked for better parents. I'm so lucky to be your daughter. And just because you're gone doesn't change that. You'll always be my parents, and you'll always be with me. Right here. I placed a finger to my heart, and Mom and Dad totally lost it. The three of us started sobbing together. But they were beautiful, wonderful tears. A huge weight lifted off my shoulders, and I felt so light I could float to the stars. I wiped my eyes. I have to admit, this is probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do, and that's saying a lot. I took a deep, wavering breath. For a moment, I worried that the words wouldn't come out. And then they just did. It was the most freeing, beautiful moment of my life. Goodbye, I said. Mom and Dad shared a smile. Goodbye, Nadine. We love you. Peace washed over me as my parents faded from view. I should have run after them. I should have sobbed and begged them to come back. But I didn't. Because somehow, I was finally okay with letting them go. It didn't mean I didn't love them. It didn't mean I didn't care that they were gone. It just meant everything was going to be okay. You've done well, my child. I whirled around at the sound of an unfamiliar voice. The cemetery had transformed around me. Instead of being day, it had instantly transformed into night. I wasn't standing near the same plot as I was before. In fact, I wasn't even sure I was standing in the same cemetery. The air was cold, and snow covered the ground. The full moon glowed above us. A woman stood several feet away from me, cloaked in a velvet hood. I tilted my head to try to get a better look, but the hood fell so far over her eyes that even the moonlight didn't touch her face. "'Excuse me?' I asked. She reached up and lowered her hood. My heart stalled in my chest when I saw her. I'd seen those high cheekbones, full lips, and beautiful eyes before, in the painting that hung above the mantel at school. It was Mother Miriam. I found myself rooted in place as I took her in. 
positive energy radiated off of her in waves, and she seemed to glow slightly in the moonlight. The cool air around us warmed, and I truly felt like I was standing in the presence of a goddess. Mother Miriam? I asked breathlessly, just to see if it was real. She nodded lightly, then stretched out her hand. Come with me, child. I hesitated a moment. Was I worthy enough to take her hand? I wanted to be, and she was offering, so I took it. All the pain in my muscles and joints washed away. When I touched her, it was like taking the hand of someone I'd known forever. All my hesitation fell away, and I felt totally at ease in her presence. What's going on? I asked as she led me through the cemetery. Mother Miriam spoke slowly, like we were in no rush. There's something you must see, Nadine. Though I'd never heard her speak my name before, something about it seemed so familiar. It was like I'd known her my whole life. We passed by gravestone after gravestone until I spotted a shadowed figure in the distance. He sat in the snow, his back pressed against the base of a tall reaper statue. His knees were curled to his chest, and he shook in the cold. Who is that? I asked Mother Miriam. I think you already know she said kindly. My pulse quickened as we came closer. I began to make out the shape of his shoulders. Lucas? I realized before raising my voice so he could hear me. Lucas! He didn't respond. He can't hear you, Mother Miriam told me. I looked to her as we came to a stop several gravestones away from him. What is this then? A vision? Of sorts, she said with a nod. Is it real? I asked. She gestured around us. Everything you see here is happening, Nadine. She was like the ghost of Christmas present. I furrowed my brow. What are we here for? What's Lucas doing? Mother Miriam's breath wavered and my stomach dropped. Though she hadn't answered, I sensed that it was something dark and dangerous. I gazed closer at Lucas, and that was when I noticed the pool of blood in the snow beneath him. Lucas is summoning the reapers, Mother Miriam said solemnly. Summoning them? Why? Because their power can take his away, she explained. He's not going to be the Reaper's apprentice anymore? I asked. I wanted to be excited about it. It meant the Reaper's shadow curse couldn't touch us. We could be together. But I sensed something deeper in the way Mother Miriam spoke. She obviously cared very deeply for Lucas. If he completes the ritual, he will be washed of his gift, she explained. Why is that bad, though? I asked. He doesn't want it. She turned her gaze back to Lucas. She got this faraway look in her eyes, like she was recalling a special memory. Because he made a promise to me, Nadine. When I offered him his power, he agreed to accept whatever gift I gave him. And now he is refusing that gift. He went back on his word. I can't accept him into Alora if he does that. The air in the cemetery seemed heavy as a rock. I couldn't breathe it in. I just stood there, completely frozen and trying to wrap my head around her meaning. You're saying if he goes through with this, he'll be cast out of the coven? I asked. He'll be damned to the abyss? Deep, unsettling worry twisted around my heart. Mother Miriam nodded solemnly. Then we have to stop him, I insisted. Lucas! Mother Miriam placed a gentle hand on my shoulder to stop me. 
I'm afraid we can't stop it, my child. A thick lump rose to my throat. You don't have to send him to the abyss. I, I thought the coven granted second chances. I am offering him a second chance. Through you. What do you mean? I asked, but my throat closed so tightly around my words that it barely came out. Lucas is doing this for you, she stated. As long as you're around, he will give up his gift to be with you. Once his magic is gone, he's condemned himself, and his soul can't enter into Alora. Not without a trade. My knees grew weak as I realized what she was offering. I can trade my soul for his? These last few months, your souls have intertwined, she explained. I can take one, but not the other. We'll be apart, I realized with sinking clarity. No matter what, we'll never be together. Yes, Mother Miriam confirmed. There are only two outcomes, Nadine. If he gives up his gift for you, and you live out your lives together, he'll end up in the abyss. Or... You can trade your soul for his. I will take away his gift, and he will live his life without the voices. But I will accept him into Alora with open arms. Yet you will be condemned to the abyss in his place, forever. The fact that those were our only two options burned me to the very core. All I wanted was to be with Lucas. But we couldn't have that. If I did this for him, it meant giving up my life and my magic. It meant leaving Grammy behind and never seeing my parents again in Alora. I'd be banished to hell. I'd have to give up absolutely everything for him. Time is running out, Nadine, Mother Miriam stated. Will you give up your soul to take Lucas's place? Chapter 23 Lucas Take my hand. That's all the Reaper said. I couldn't believe it was that simple. That's it? I asked. Edgar's robes billowed in the wind. That's all. I will take the thoughts you've collected with me. You will be relieved of your duties. Your power will be taken from you and you will be sentenced to the abyss. I took a step forward and reached for him. My hand just barely grazed his before he jerked away. His head snapped to the side like he heard a noise in the distance that had caught his full attention. I looked in the same direction, but I didn't see anything. What is it? Edgar turned to me, though I still couldn't see his features beneath his hood. I am sorry. I must go. I have a soul to collect. Wait! I cried. But he was already backing away from me. The reaper whirled around. His body glided above the snow and left no prints. I started sprinting after him, but he moved so fast I couldn't keep up. Come back! I screamed. The air seemed to suck out of the cemetery the faster I ran. It was only moments before he had vanished from sight. Panic swept through me. Had I lost my chance? Had he totally abandoned me? Was he coming back? I slowed and stared after the reaper where he'd disappeared into the trees. A feeling of hopelessness settled over me. I'd missed my chance, hadn't I? I thought we had an agreement! I shouted. A leaf tumbled in the wind and caught on my shoe. I kicked it off, but the wind swirled around me, sending the leaf back into my leg. I tried twice more to shake it off, but each time it came back. Frustrated, I bent to grab it, ready to tear the freaking thing to shreds. But it wasn't a leaf at all. I took it in my hands and lifted it. My stomach dropped out of my abdomen. It was a tarot card. The death card. 
perhaps the very one I'd thrown into the wind on Halloween. Somehow it had come back for me. It had to be a message. My eyes went wide. I glanced around like I expected to see someone standing there, willing to explain. Eric? I called out into the darkness. Is this yours? What does it mean? What do you want me to do? The voice that answered was the last one I'd ever expected to hear. I did it to save you, Lucas. I will always love you. I whirled around, expecting her to be standing there. But there was nothing but tombstones beside me. I'd heard her last thought. The heart-wrenching realization hit me like the weight of a thousand stunning spells. For a moment I couldn't move. Couldn't think. All I could do was stand there as my entire world stopped spinning. Not my Nadine. The second her name passed through my mind, I snapped back to attention. No one was taking my Nadine from me. I started sprinting. I'd never run so hard and fast in my life. The only time that came close was the night of my evoking ceremony when I'd rushed home to Eric. It struck me how frighteningly similar this was. Hurtling over gravestones and sprinting out of the cemetery was a sick form of deja vu. I just hoped this time I wasn't too late. My sliced palm stung as I pumped my arms. My legs protested as I pushed them harder than I'd ever pushed them before. My chest burned with the need for air. But none of that mattered right now, because the thought of losing Nadine hurt more than any other pain I could imagine. I'd gladly welcome a thousand eternities of flesh-burning torture for her. Houses blurred past me as I ran through town. I sprinted down her grandmother's street and stopped in my tracks when I caught sight of the scene in Helena's living room. I had a mere split second to take it in. Through the window I saw Helena Grant and Talia seated around Nadine's body, she hovered in the air as if she was lying on an invisible table. Everyone watched on silently, oblivious to the fact that there was a fucking reaper standing over her. He stood beside her like he was hungry for his next meal. The only one who seemed to notice something was amiss was Isa. She stood on Talia's lap, her hair on end hissing. The reaper reached out for Nadine and scooped her up. Suddenly I was seeing double. Nadine's body remained hovered in the air, but a transparent figure identical to her lay cradled in Edgar's arms. I didn't know how I was seeing her soul, but I sensed it was because the Reaper had touched both of us tonight. Stop! I screamed. But no one heard me. Nadine's body dropped out of the air, slamming to the ground beneath her. All at once, Helena... Grant and Talia leapt to their feet. Sheer and utter worry marred each of their faces. I barely had a chance to process it before the Reaper was on the move. He stepped through the wall and onto the porch like a ghost. My precious Nadine's spirit lay lifeless in his arms. You can't do this, I demanded. He looked toward me, but he must have decided I meant nothing, because he turned away and started toward the trees at the side of Helena's house. I didn't know how far I'd already run, but I knew one thing for certain. I'd race to the ends of the earth for Nadine. I followed the reaper as fast as my legs could carry me. I trampled over dead plants in Helena's garden and crunched down snow as I raced over the lawn. I followed the reaper into the forest, where the snow was minimal and a clear dirt path paved the way. Come back! I shouted. Edgar didn't slow, but somehow I was catching up. I heard him mumble something under his breath, and then something frightening happened. I could barely believe my eyes. In the middle of the forest, a portal opened. One moment all I saw was shadows of trees in the moonlight. The next, a wide, swirling archway grew from nothing. It expanded until it was large enough to step through. At first, all I saw was blackness around the edges. Then came the distorted image of the horrifying landscape beyond. In the flickering of the portal, I could make out fires that went for miles across a dark, desolate landscape. The Abyss. He was taking my Nadine to the Abyss. This was either a sick 
joke or a horrible mistake. I had to stop this. I didn't know if it was sheer willpower or by the fate of the goddess, but I finally reached him. My hands shot upward and my fingers wrapped around the dark fabric of his hood. I yanked downward and his hood fell away. He whirled around and thrust his arm outward. A blast of red magic shot out of his hand and slammed into my chest. I went flying backward, but hardly made it three feet before slamming into a tree. I slumped to the ground, gasping for air. It barely fazed me, because what I saw next shook me to my very core. The reaper turned, and I caught sight of his face. His true, deadly form. The legends of the reapers were true. They walked the earth as a shadow of death. His face was nothing but a skull. There were no muscles, no skin, just pure white bone. His eyes were completely hollow, a deep, dark black that seemed to suck my life energy just looking at him. He was the very embodiment of death. You can't have her, he snarled. She's my assignment. His jaw moved, but he had no lips to form his words. Somehow they came out sounding clear. I'd be damned if I didn't try, I growled. I raised my hands and purple magic shot out of my palms. A stunning spell slammed into his chest. His feet swept out from under him and he went tumbling backward. Nadine's spirit fell from his arms and she hovered in the air limply. I jumped to my feet. At the same time, the reaper sliced his hand through the air and I felt a sharp pain on my face, as if an invisible dagger had cut my skin open. The warmth of blood trickled down my face, but I didn't stop to assess the damage. I hurtled over the reaper and reached out for Nadine. I nearly touched her soul, but I didn't get there before a cold hand grasped my ankle. Let me go! I shouted. I drew my foot back and slammed my heel into his face. A satisfying crunch met my ears, though it didn't seem to slow him down. He squeezed my ankle tighter and yanked me backward, dragging me through the snowy dirt. My hands clawed desperately outward, but I couldn't find a handhold. You can't stop this, he warned, before drawing his arm back and slamming it into my cheek to slow me down. Ever been punched by a reaper? Turns out their swing is fucking strong. He had the punch of a freaking heavyweight champion, yet he didn't have a single muscle on him. Pain radiated across my face, and a blast of red flashed across my vision. The world spun around me. I was half surprised he hadn't knocked me out right then and there. The Reaper left my side to go to Nadine, but there was no way I was giving up now. I jumped to my feet, though it felt as if the earth was rocking beneath me. I forced my eyes open, but only my right one would follow my command. The left was completely swollen shut. He reached out for Nadine. I couldn't stand the excruciating thought of death touching her. Not today. I totally and 100% lost it. You're going to have to try harder than that, I growled. Fury swept through me, and I threw all of my anger into my magic. A sizzling ball of magic swelled in my palms. As the magic came too much to hold on to, it shot from my hands and went spinning toward the reaper. My battle magic landed at his feet and exploded, sending him blasting away from the portal and my Nadine. It disoriented him enough that I gained the upper hand. I threw all my weight at him and grabbed him by the back of the robes. I gritted my teeth and screamed as I spun him around. I intended to use this moment to smash his head into a tree, but I guess I forgot we were fighting on different planes. My magic worked against him, but other weapons didn't. His skull went through the damn tree. I swung him to the ground and threw myself between him and Nadine. You can't have her, I cried. He pushed himself up like he hadn't felt the thing. How the hell was I supposed to fight a freaking skeleton? He didn't feel pain. He couldn't be choked or bruised or knocked out. Plus, he was fucking strong. I was at a total disadvantage, but I'd still do anything to defeat him. Just as I was about to speak another incantation, the reaper reacted. Red magic slammed into my ribs. 
It was so heavy and strong that it knocked me on my ass in no time flat. My vision blurred. I tried to push myself up, but a sharp searing pain like a sword in my side shot through my ribs. Broken. Shit, I growled beneath my breath as I pushed myself to my feet. Edgar yanked his glove from his hand and thrust his palm out in my direction. Suddenly, excruciating pain assaulted me from all angles. Every muscle in my body seemed to twist at his command, and my skin felt like it was separating from my body. The pain permeated deep into my bones. It was battle magic like I'd never seen before. Gah! I screamed as blinding pain overtook every nerve ending. My knees buckled beneath me, and my back arched as I cried out. I tried to move my hands to force defensive magic out through them, but they stayed curled into fists at my side. My scream echoed through the forest, laced with the chilling overtone of torture. You don't know what you're doing, Lucas, Edgar warned. His bony fingers twisted like he intended to crush me by sheer will. She's dead. You can't bring her back. It's against the rules. Screw the rules, I spat. It took all my energy to push past his magic and speak. Let her stay. It doesn't work that way, he insisted. I need a soul. Then take me instead, I begged through gritted teeth. I've got a soul. I haven't been damned yet. And you won't be, he stated coolly. The pain intensified as the realization hit me. She did this for me, didn't she? At this point, the Reaper's spell might as well have been a mere tickle across my skin. The excruciating pain was nothing compared to the heartbreak that crushed my very soul in that moment. Nadine gave herself up for me. And that's something I would eternally blame myself for. I would never forgive myself for being the reason she was damned. Edgar nodded. She gave up her life to stop the ritual. She gave her soul in place of yours. She is sentenced to the abyss. I must take her and leave now. Pure fury rocked my body. I'd do anything to save Nadine from damnation. She was the sun my earth moved around, the gravity that kept me grounded, and the force that kept my world from spinning off its axis. She was the air in my lungs and the magic that flowed through me. I loved her like the night sky loved the stars. She was mine, and I was hers. Forever. You're not going anywhere with her, I growled. Only the Reaper has control over the life and death of a soul, he yelled furiously. If you restore this soul, you accept your Reaper magic, and it will bind itself to you once and for all. After that, I can't take that magic away. If you wish to continue with our agreement from earlier, you must let me take her soul to the abyss. So I either give up my gift or save her life. The answer was simple. Her soul was staying. Magic like I'd never felt before ignited deep within my belly. I gathered it tight within my chest and pushed outward with all my might. Darkness clouded my vision as the magic passed through me. Then, boom! My magic exploded, whipping through me like a tidal wave. By some miracle, my magic overpowered his, counteracting his spell. The pain washed away, and I fell onto my hands and knees, gasping. One hand clutched my broken ribs as I waited for my vision to return. When it finally did, I looked up to see an empty forest. I immediately whirled around toward the portal to see Edgar hovering over Nadine's spirit. He bent beside her and touched her. Not today, motherfucker. I scrambled to my feet and ran forward. My foot swung outward like I was about to kick the field goal of the century. I kicked as hard as I possibly could, and my foot connected perfectly with his skull. Edgar's vertebrae snapped, and his head flew off his skeleton. It went soaring forward straight toward the portal, his scream echoing through the forest. And then... Silence. His head was gone, 
lost to the abyss. I could hardly believe what I'd done. But we weren't finished. Edgar's body whirled toward me. It was kind of creepy to see a headless guy moving through the forest. His arms raised and his shoulders heaved as a spell formed in his hands. On instinct, I threw my hands upward. I had no intention, no clue, what I was doing. All I knew in that split second was I had to protect myself. A battle orb shot out of Edgar's hands, but it never reached me. The magic bounced off an invisible shield and ricocheted back at him. The battle orb slammed into his chest and exploded, his headless body blasted backward. His heel teetered on the edge of the portal, and his arms desperately reached out for something to grab onto, but they found nothing. He went tumbling backward and the portal swallowed him up. The Reaper was gone. I gasped, utterly shocked by what just happened. Did I just send the Reaper to the abyss? Had I just used shield magic? I barely had time to question it before the ground began to shake. The earth rumbled around me, and I could barely stay on my feet. Oh, fuck. Lightning crackled out of the portal, and thunder boomed through the forest. My stomach twisted into tight knots. I didn't know how much more I could handle. For a second, I thought I was going to have to deal with this damn reaper clawing his way out of the depths of hell. Then, suddenly, the portal slammed closed. Utter silence settled over the forest, and the image of the trees became clear again. It was as if the portal had never been there in the first place. Relief washed over me. It was over. I'd defeated the Reaper. I'd saved Nadine. I rushed over to her floating spirit, my heart racing. I reached out and touched the side of her face. My fingers didn't move through her spirit like I expected them to. They touched solid skin. I guess for the same reason I could see her. I scooped Nadine in my arms. She was as light as air, but she was warm and solid in my arms. I could feel the life inside of her as I cradled her to my chest. I pressed my lips to her forehead and wept as I lifted her. Hang on, Nade. We're going to get you home. Carrying Nadine's spirit back to the house was like stepping out of a fire, a hero. I had a sliced hand, at least two broken ribs, and one hell of a black eye. But most of all, I had Nadine. I didn't take my eyes off her as I carried her limp spirit back to the house. I could have sworn we moved in slow motion. The relief I felt made my heart sing. Nadine was so perfect it was enough to stop time just looking at her. I climbed the stairs to Helena's front door. It was only when I opened it and heard the panicked shouts inside that time seemed to speed up again. She's still not breathing, Grant cried. I'm working as fast as I can, Helena shouted back. How could this happen? Talia sobbed. I stepped into the living room my heart hammering like a bass drum. I hoped I wasn't too late. Grant knelt over Nadine's lifeless body performing CPR while Helena clutched a mortar and pestle, an ancient herb crusher. She ground herbs into powder that I assumed were meant to heal. Talia was pacing back and forth, stroking Isa's fur. I cleared my throat and all eyes turned toward me. Grant's eyes grew as wide as saucers and Talia's jaw dropped. Helena was so shocked, she dropped the mortar and pestle, and the herbs spilled all over the carpet. It was clear as day. They could see Nadine's spirit in my arms. It must have had something to do with me touching her after I'd touched a reaper. I felt death in the room. It was like a dark hole that nothing could enter and escape. It was just... nothing. And that feeling centered over Nadine's heart. Her body wasn't going to last much longer without her soul in it. How did you? Helena stuttered. I'll explain later, I said. My knees quaked as I rushed to Nadine's side. Grant scurried out of the way. What am I seeing? Talia asked breathlessly. I could ask the same thing, Grant said in astonishment. 
You saved her, Helena breathed. I swallowed. Not yet. I pressed my lips to the side of Nadine's spirit cheek, then positioned her spirit over her body. A single tear ran down my face and dripped onto her chest. I love you, Nade, I whispered. Now and forever. I gently lay her spirit back into her body and waited. Chapter 24 Nadine Lucas Taylor couldn't see the light within himself, but I could. Though dark cloud after dark cloud had swept into his life to block out the light, it continued to burn bright. The world would be a much better place with him in it. My world had been made better with him in it. He didn't deserve an eternity in the abyss. He deserved to be with his brother and the rest of the coven in Alora, where he would be happy. I loved him. I loved him more than the grass beneath my feet, more than the stars in the sky, more than the very air I breathed. My heart beat for him, and my world moved with him. I didn't know how much I truly cared about him until that moment. I was unconditionally and undeniably in love with him. I turned my gaze from the nearby gravestones to look at Mother Miriam. I'll do it. The scary part was, giving myself up for Lucas didn't scare me at all. A proud smile crossed Mother Miriam's face. Then it is time. She formed a ball of magic in her hand. It was the whitest, most pure magic I'd ever seen. A mesmerizing rainbow of color swirled within it. She threw the magic upward, and it exploded into a million tiny stars above my head that rained down on me like snowflakes. The flakes of magic touched my skin, and my whole body started to glow. Wait, this is it? I asked. I don't get to say goodbye? You have one chance, she reminded me. Right. Lucas would hear my last thought. I did it to save you, Lucas. I will always love you, I thought. The glow of my skin brightened until a blinding white light completely consumed my vision. Even as I squeezed my eyes shut, it was all I could see. The last thing I heard was Mother Miriam's soft, calming voice. Just remember, Nadine, you are not defined by what happens to you. You are defined by how you react to it. The light became too bright to bear, and then nothing. I saw nothing. I felt nothing. There was no light or dark, no pain or comfort, no sense of time or space. Just nothing. I could have been stuck in this state for eternity and never known it. Then something happened. A voice called out to me like a beacon in the darkness. Naid! It took me a few moments to make sense of my name. I couldn't remember what had happened to me or why I was here. Then it all came rushing back. The abyss. My heart lurched to life in my chest. My eyes shot open, and I sprang upward. A high-pitched scream pierced my ears. It took me a moment to realize it was my own voice. Nade, it's okay. Lucas's soothing voice came from beside me. As my vision focused... I saw his beautiful face in front of me. His left eye was black and swollen, but he was incredibly beautiful nonetheless. Lucas, you're hurt, I said breathlessly. He shrugged. Totally worth it. My heart raced, and my whole body quivered. Frantically, I glanced around the room to see I was sitting on the floor in Grammy's living room. The candles that had surrounded me had been burnt out. 
Grammy, Grant, and Talia all looked down on me with wide-eyed expressions of disbelief. Issa jumped out of Talia's arms and purred as she rubbed against my side. It was all a test, I realized. None of it was real. I placed a hand to my thumping heart as it started to slow. Oh my god, I thought I died. Lucas's features fell. Nade, you did. What? I nearly choked on the word. Grammy knelt beside me and swept me into her arms. She kissed me on the cheek over and over and squeezed me so tight I thought she would suffocate me. Tears streamed down her face. I'm so relieved you're okay, Nadine, she whispered. I thought I'd lost you. As Grammy drew away, Grant and Talia threw themselves at me. They both curled me into a tight group hug. We're not losing you, you hear me? Grant said pointedly. Talia swatted me on the shoulder. Don't ever do that to us again. Do what? I asked. What happened? Everyone stared back at me like they didn't know where to start. The only one who looked remotely understanding was Lucas. I looked to him for an explanation. Grammy cleared her throat. We'll just give you two a moment. Grant and Talia nodded in agreement, and the three of them quietly left the room. Tears welled in Lucas's eyes as he stared at me like I was the only girl in the world. He took my face in his hands. They were so warm and comforting. You gave yourself up for me, he reminded me. I had to fight a reaper to get you back. My breath caught in my chest. Lucas had saved my life? His eyes sparkled in a mix of pain and relief. Why'd you do it? I placed my hand over my mouth to keep the sobs from spilling out. My eyes searched his. After taking a moment to breathe, I dropped my shaking hand. Don't you get it, Lucas? I asked. I love you. I know, he said. But no, I cut him off. I really, really love you. Enough to go to hell in your place. Tears spilled over Lucas's lids, and my heart swelled. I love you too, Nate. Lucas swept me into his arms, and we kissed with a passion like never before. His love poured into me like pure, warm water filling my soul, and mine poured back. The roller coaster ride we'd been on slowed in that moment, reaching its peak at the highest point of the track. My heart lifted in anticipation of the freefall. I parted my lips, and Lucas kissed me deeper. I went spiraling downward, my stomach flipping in my abdomen. But it didn't feel like we were on a roller coaster anymore. The safety harness had given way, and I'd grown wings. I was safe here with Lucas, because he was my wings, and he would never let me fall. Lucas drew away from me and pressed his forehead to mine. Desperation filled his tone. I never want to lose you, Nade. Tears rolled down my cheeks, and a sob broke in my chest. I never want to lose you either. I don't care about the Reaper Shadow curse. Lucas said. I'll tiptoe around it for eternity just to be with you every single day for the rest of my life. I'll do everything in my power to protect you from it. I wiped the tears from my cheeks. I agree. If we can't be together fully, we'll take what we can get. Lucas's gaze dropped, and his fingers ran over my arm. His voice trembled when he spoke. Can I have you? My heart pitter-pattered against my ribcage. For as long as I can have you, I whispered. His lips pressed to mine again, and we shared an amazing kiss that made my head spin. I didn't know how long we were kissing, 
but we were interrupted by the sound of Grant clearing his throat. We drew away and glanced toward the entrance to the living room. Grant stood there, holding an ice pack. He smiled. You two make me want to cry. Spying on us? Lucas teased. Grant chuckled. No, just wondering when we can come back in to see what cast Nadine got. I gasped. I'd nearly forgotten. Yes, I cried. Everyone, come in. My heart pounded fiercely as I got to my feet. Grant handed Lucas the ice pack, and he pressed it to his swollen eye. Grammy and Talia entered the room behind him. Well, come on, Grant encouraged, nudging me in the side. What's your cast? I don't know. Let's see. I stretched my arms out and flipped them over, looking for any signs of a tattoo. Grammy started spinning me around so we could look at all angles. Issa rubbed against my leg, so I took off my shoes and checked my feet, then lifted my pants legs to check my calves. Lucas might have to strip you down to check, Grant teased. Talia and Grammy both chuckled under their breath, but Lucas looked thoroughly unamused. He'd taken a seat on the couch and clutched his side with one arm, holding the ice pack to his eye with the other. I noticed for the first time he was sweating a little. Will you be okay? I asked him. Fine, he said, waving a hand. Find your mark. I lifted the hem of my shirt to check my stomach, and that's when I saw it. Just above the inside of my hip lay a black mark. My whole body gave a start. I gasped and dropped my shirt. What is it? Talia asked, looking intrigued. Come on, Nadine, let us see, Grammy begged. Grant eyed me curiously. Judging by your reaction, I'm guessing Mortana. I felt the blood drain from my face. I swallowed and lifted my shirt to show everyone the tattoo. I got... Cursebreaker. I let out a wavered breath. All eyes locked on the crescent moon tattoo on my hip. Grammy's hand shook as she brought it to her mouth. I wasn't sure if she was terrified or delighted by the news. Talia and Grant shared a confused expression. Lucas had gone totally still. The room was dead silent. How is this possible? I asked. The curse breakers died out. Grammy finally found her voice. Yes, but Mother Miriam can assign you any cast she sees fit. She must think you're worthy, Nadine. I gaped at her. Me? What did she test you on? Grant asked eagerly. I started out tied up in the main foyer, I told them, before diving into an explanation of everything else that happened. By the time I was finished, we'd all taken a seat. I was sitting beside Lucas, and Issa was purring in my lap. Grammy leaned forward in her chair and rested her elbow on her knee. It sounds like you impressed Mother Miriam. You showed her you're willing to take responsibility. And you showed some serious integrity saving Chloe's life, Talia added. Also strength and resilience, Grant said. Yeah, Talia agreed. You fought the darkness inside of you instead of giving into it. You didn't let it consume you, which means you'll be able to fight the darkness of any curse you break. My heart melted. And then you traded your soul for mine, Lucas pointed out. You're pure of heart, Nade. Something no other witch has been since the curse breakers died out. Wow, I said breathlessly. I guess I didn't realize what I was capable of. You're capable of anything you put your mind to, Grammy encouraged. But you must be careful, Nadine. I tilted my head to the side. What do you mean? You're the only curse breaker of your generation, she pointed out. Just as your grandfather was. 
People will try to use you. I shot a nervous glance around the room. To break curses? Grammy dropped her gaze and shook her head. For much more than that, I'm afraid. Recall that when a member of each of the five castes come together, they can create elaborate spells. Like the space-bending spell that expands the school, I stated, remembering how she explained it to me on my first day at Miriam College. She nodded. I'll be honest, Nadine. If your grandfather were here, he'd tell you this is as much a curse as it is a blessing. I looked to Lucas, then to my friends, as if expecting one of them to counter her claim. Everyone wore the same uncertain expression. I suddenly felt worry, not deep within my belly. So I pose a threat, I realized. Or people will threaten you, Lucas added, looking terrified for me. They're going to want a piece of your magic. My stomach dropped. How could I get this wonderful gift only for it to put me in the line of fire? Octavia Falls was my home. I should be safe here, but I wasn't. I hadn't been since the moment I stepped foot in town. Something told me Chloe was just the least of my coming threats. But I'd be damned if I didn't fight for my right to stay. Then I'll hide it, I stated, my mind made up. Talia tilted her head to the side. Hide your powers? How? I don't know, I admitted. We could tell people I didn't go through with the ceremony. But you need to stay in classes to learn how to control your magic, Grant pointed out. I sighed. True. Lucas looked deeply contemplative. Then his eyes lit up. I know how to hide it. You do? I asked. He smirked. You can pose as an alchemist. I frowned. But I don't have alchemy powers. Grant's jaw dropped. That could actually work. What? I asked. How can I possibly pull that off? It's a good theory, Grammy agreed. Curse Breaker's powers work by transferring magic from one place to another. You can use alchemy crystals to brew potions. Alchemy crystals? I asked. It's like this. Grammy explained. I transfer my alchemy magic into a crystal. You take that magic and transfer it into a potion. Couldn't anyone do that? I asked. She shook her head. Only a member of each caste can access the crystal magic of that caste. Alchemists can use alchemy crystals. Seers use seer crystals. But as Cursebreaker... You can move magic from one place to another. So I could use crystals to pose as any cast? I asked. Grammy shook her head. Not quite. It gives you no powers. A seer crystal wouldn't allow you to see or hear spirits. You couldn't control a corpse with a necromancy crystal. Your power lies in the transfer of magic. And that's the beauty of alchemy. Brewing potions is a simple transfer of alchemy magic. We're actually not the only race who can do it. So as long as I had alchemy magic to draw from, I could fool anyone, I realized. It's our best shot, Talia said. It could be the only way to protect you, Lucas added. Then I'll do it, I said. I'll let everyone believe I'm an alchemist. What about your tattoo? Talia questioned. I'll get a fake one, I decided. I'll put it somewhere that's easily noticeable, so no one will question it. You'll have to practice your curse-breaker powers in private, Lucas pointed out. I will, I agreed. For as long as I can manage, I'll remain a secret. One of the coven's greatest secrets of all, Lucas whispered ominously. I nodded, accepting my new title. I'll be the Coven's secret. I had so much to process from that night that I didn't even know where to start. 
Since it was really late and everyone was tired, Grammy invited all of us to stay the night at her house. I was relieved because I could hardly keep my eyes open anymore. I stood from the couch and tugged on Lucas's arm. Let's go to bed. In a minute, he argued. I tugged him a little harder, and he winced. I immediately dropped his arm. What's wrong? Nothing, he said, but I heard the lie in his voice. I gazed down at him sternly. Don't lie to me. Let me see. I'll be fine, Nade, he said. If that's true, let me see it, I demanded. No secrets, Lucas. He sighed and stood. Everyone else was already moving out of the living room, but when he lifted his shirt, we all stopped dead. A huge purple bruise marred the side of his torso. My stomach plummeted to my toes. Why didn't you say something? Lucas dropped his gaze. I didn't want you to worry. You need help, I stated. We're going to the hospital. No objections. Lucas sighed. Nade, come on. It's way too late for that. It's never too late to get you help, I replied. The doctors aren't going to do anything but tell me to rest, he argued. Besides, you're too tired for an emergency room visit. Yes and no. I was exhausted, but I wanted to be with him. Grant quickly stepped in. I'll take you, bro. Lucas frowned. Lucas, you're going, I repeated. You're not burdening anyone by getting medical treatment. Please accept that. He sighed. Okay, but you need to rest. I'll see you tomorrow. I protested a while longer, but Lucas insisted he was only going to the ER if I went to bed. As long as he was getting medical attention, that was good enough for me. Talia went to the guest room upstairs, while I took the guest room next to the bathroom. My moving boxes were still piled in the corner. I found some pajamas in one of them and changed. I tossed my dirty clothes into one of the open boxes on top, but they caught on the corner and knocked it over. Issa meowed from where she lay on the bed. Sighing, I bent to clean up the contents. As I reached for the last item that had spilled out, my breath caught. It was a small wooden box I hadn't opened since my parents died. I took a deep breath and reached out for it. When I held it, I was surprised to realize I no longer felt a deep, black hole within my gut when I thought of them. I took the box and crawled under the covers with it. The lamp beside my bed illuminated the soft curves of the box and the glossy finish. I reached up and lightly touched my silver star necklace. Issa walked across the bed and curled up next to me. I took a deep breath. I'm not scared anymore, Mom. I opened the box and my heart warmed. A pile of envelopes sat inside each one of them a different color from the last. My name had been scrawled on each one in my mother's smooth handwriting. I swallowed and pulled the first envelope from the top. I flipped open the card to read the letter my parents had written me. Happy 18th birthday, Nadine. This year has been crazy. Remember the escape room when we almost lost because of your dad, but you turned it around and got us out in the last minute? We'll never forget the trip we took to Washington, D.C. this summer. We got lost for three hours looking for the Washington Monument. How's that even possible? Don't forget when your mom tried skiing on that spontaneous trip we took this winter. Miserable failure. We hope this year will bring many bright beginnings. Never stop enjoying the mystery in life. We love you, Nadine. Mom and Dad. Tears welled in my eyes. The past year brought the worst of the worst endings. I set the birthday card aside and pulled out the next one. Happy 17th birthday, Nadine. They all started out like that. 
each one sharing memories from the previous year and wishes for the year to come. It hurt that it was my birthday and I wouldn't be getting a card from them this year. I finished reading through all the letters and was placing them back in a box when a knock came at my door. I cleared my throat. Come in. Grammy opened the door. You are still up. I nodded, just looking over some old keepsakes. She eyed the box I held in my lap. Are those your birthday letters? I nodded. She held up a finger. Give me a minute. I furrowed my brow as Grammy left the room. She came back in a minute later, holding a piece of paper in her hand. She crossed the room and sat at the edge of my bed. I found this while we were cleaning out the old house, she admitted. I was saving it for your birthday, and since it's your birthday now... Grammy handed over the piece of paper, and I realized it was an envelope, like all the others. My name was written across the front in my mother's handwriting. I froze in place, unable to breathe. Grammy, what is this? She shrugged. I didn't read it. It's for you. I swallowed and took the letter from her hand, then opened it. My quiet tears turned into full-on sobs as I began to read the letter. Nadine, we know we usually save these cards for your birthday, but we have so much to say. We know you're upset about the police academy. We know it's all you ever wanted. But there's a saying we want you to remember. You've heard us say it many times before. When one door closes, another one opens. We know that's not what you want to hear right now, but you'll realize one day when all of this is over that it's true. Everything happens for a reason. We believe that bigger and better things are in store for you. All you have to do is look for the blessing and be willing to receive it. We will always be here for you and love you no matter what. Mom and Dad A beautiful swelling of joy grew in my heart. I didn't feel sad when I thought about them. I felt joy. I had 18 wonderful years with them. I was the luckiest girl in the world to be their daughter. I couldn't ask for anything more than that. It was true, this year had been rough, but wonderful things had happened, too. My parents' death had led me to Octavia Falls, and I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. I sniffled and closed the card, then added it to my box. Thank you for saving that for me, Grammy. What's it say? She asked curiously. I smiled. It says everything's going to be okay. In that moment, I truly meant it. But I never would have said it had I known the types of dark and sinister trials awaiting me next semester. Chapter 25 Lucas I lay on the bed in my hospital room. It was still dark outside, but the sun would rise soon. It had been a really long night, but I didn't sleep I lay there thinking of Nadine, how she was alive against all odds. I was the luckiest guy in the world. I was wrong, I admitted quietly without turning my gaze from the window. Grant sat in the chair next to my bed. I was surprised he hadn't gone home yet. Wrong about what? he asked. I sighed and finally turned to look at him. I was wrong about trying to give my gift back. You were right. I never should have risked it. Grant eyed me solemnly and his shoulders fell. I'm just glad you didn't trade your soul. I was really looking forward to fucking shit up with you and Elora. A half smile crept across my face. Well, we will still have our chance. Bring it in, man. Grant stood from his chair and leaned over my bed to give me a hug. I clapped him on the back. I'm sorry for what I said to you. I'm sorry too, he said. Friends? Always. 
Just then a knock came at the door. Grant turned as an older man stepped into the room. What's the verdict, Doc? The doctor adjusted his glasses and looked down to the clipboard in his hands. I'm afraid it's not good. We're looking at two broken ribs and a fractured occipital bone. Grant cocked an eyebrow at me. You're lucky that's all you walked away with. I smirked. Still totally worth it. The doctor furrowed his brow. If you don't mind me asking, what were you boys doing to cause this? Grant and I shared a look, but I answered, I beat the shit out of a reaper. The doctor laughed lightly. He thought I was joking. Okay, well, let's talk treatment. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do but send you home with pain meds and advise you to get plenty of rest. No sports until you heal. It should take about six weeks until you're good as new. Thanks, Doc, I said. I'll have the nurse get your discharge papers, the doctor said. Have a good night, boys. He left the room and I looked sideways at Grant. Told you they wouldn't do anything. He shrugged. You get pain meds? I chuckled. I'm sure you could brew me something better. Grant yawned really wide, then stood. I'm going to take a piss. Thanks for announcing it, I joked. Grant walked off and I turned back to the window. I really hoped Nadine was resting right now. She needed it after everything she'd been through tonight. I missed her so much already. Part of me was disappointed that the night hadn't gone as planned. Another part of me was glad Nadine had saved me from the abyss. I was stupid to try to contact the Reapers in the first place. I mean, how could I think the abyss was preferable to any sort of life with her? And an eternity thereafter? It was the voices, the thoughts I carried. The weight of the coven's secrets had pushed me to do the unthinkable. But the weird thing was, after burning the journal where I wrote them all down, I didn't feel their weight as heavily anymore. It was like holding on to those thoughts in the journal was the real thing that was weighing me down. A thought struck. I conjured my positivity journal and a pen. I opened up to the next page and started scribbling down the greatest perk my gift had ever given me. I saved Nadine's life. Once I started writing, I couldn't stop. For the first time since Professor Warren gave me this notebook, the positivity just flowed out of me. I pictured all the wonderful things that saving her life meant. She'd live on and would bring beauty into the world everywhere she went. But it wasn't just about her, either. Suddenly, all these other things started rushing through my mind. I help others cross over. I serve the coven. I'm ready to start doing better. I felt totally at peace as I closed the journal and subconjured it. That last thought stuck in my mind. I had admitted my faults tonight. I realized things about myself that I never knew before. For the first time in a year, I could finally face myself instead of shoving everything down and ignoring it. I wasn't there yet, but I was ready to try. I closed my eyes and relaxed into the pillow as Grant came out of the bathroom. You okay, man? Grant asked. A smile touched the corners of my lips. Nadine's alive. We're together now. I would hope so after tonight. My eyes shot open and darted to the doorway. Nadine stood there twisting her purse strap around in her fingers. Nade, I said breathlessly. I thought you were at home resting. I couldn't sleep, she admitted. That was so unlike her. Grant cleared his throat. I'm going to go see what I can find in the vending machine. He left the room, leaving Nadine and me in private. The door swung shut behind him, and Nadine stepped forward. She pulled a chair to the side of my bed and sat down, then took my gauze-wrapped hand in hers. Tonight was... crazy, she breathed. I know, I whispered unable to take my eyes off her. But we made it. Silence settled over the room for a few moments until she finally spoke. I can't believe you'd go to hell just to spend your life with me. I placed my good hand over hers. 
Nade, you know I'd do anything for you. And I for you, she whispered. Which is why? Hang on, I said, suddenly realizing something. She tilted her head curiously as I raised my hand and curled it into a fist. It's your birthday, I pointed out. I got you something. I conjured her present and unfurled my fingers. It was a brass key, but it wasn't like the antique one she'd given me. This was old, but still modern. She reached out and took it. What does it go to? A smile spread across my face. The abandoned mansion behind the school. She stared down at it, gaping like she couldn't believe it. I went back after that night, I admitted. I found it upstairs in one of the bedrooms. It works on all the doors. She blinked a few times. I don't get it, Lucas. Why are you giving me this? Because that place is ours, Nade, I said. It's our special place, and this is me promising you we'll be making lots of memories there. Her eyes sparkled and she curled her fingers around the key. I love it, she cried before throwing herself over me. I winced as her weight pressed into my broken ribs. Nadine kissed me gently and my stomach flipped in my abdomen. Kissing her was never going to get old. This is amazing, Lucas, she said as she drew away. I smiled. I'm glad you like it. Nadine sat back down and took a deep breath. Look, there's a reason I couldn't sleep. A reason I came to visit you. Uh-oh, I said, my guts sinking. It's not bad, she said quickly, and I relaxed. It's complicated, I guess. I was lying there in bed thinking about being a curse breaker when it hit me. What hit you? I asked when she paused. Her eyes brightened. Lucas, we could break the Reaper's shadow curse. Her words thrilled me. What a blessing that would be. But my thrill only lasted a split second. This curse was one of the darkest I'd ever known. She couldn't break it on her own, especially as a novice. Breaking this curse? Well... It could consume her before she managed it. The magic was so strong and so dark it could overpower her. She could die in the attempt, and I'd lose her all over again. That wasn't a risk I was willing to take. Nade, I don't think that's possible, I said solemnly. Why not? She argued. I'm a curse breaker. Yes, but you're the only one, I pointed out. A curse this big could hurt you. I don't want you getting mixed up in magic you can't handle. I'll practice, she promised. I don't want to lose you, I replied firmly. I thought I was going to lose you tonight, and I don't want either of us to go through with that again. Magic like this, it could be too much for you. You could get yourself killed. I was willing to go to the abyss for you, she reminded I'll risk this, too. But you don't have to, I assured her. We agreed we'd live with the curse to work around it. That was before we knew I was a curse breaker, she said. The least we can do is try. My heart sank. The last thing I wanted to do was risk losing my Nadine again. She didn't know how much magic she could handle, or what breaking this curse could do to her. Curse breaking is a complicated process, Nade, I said. She tilted her head to one side. Don't you want to get rid of it? Of course I do, I insisted. I just don't want you to get hurt. I won't, she promised. But I wasn't sure I believed her. I'm going to figure out this curse and I'm going to break it. I don't care how long it takes me. My lips tightened. You're going to do it with or without my help. I hope you'll help me, she said quietly. I want this for both of us. I do too, I replied. I just, I can't watch you put yourself in danger. 
She stared at me under long lashes and spoke softly. You know me, Lucas. I don't run from danger. And that's why I'm here, to drag you away from it, I teased. Nadine dropped her gaze. Apparently, she didn't find that funny. Maybe we should take some time to think about it. Agreed, I stated, though I wasn't planning on changing my mind. I just hoped she would. I don't think I'll be around for winter break, she announced, finally lifting her gaze to meet mine. What? I gasped. The thought of being away from her killed me. Why not? I need to go home, she said. Octavia Falls is your home, I reminded her. I know, but I want to visit my parents' graves. Before I could suggest coming along, she added, It's something I need to do by myself. Are you sure? I asked. I didn't want her going anywhere alone, but I couldn't force her to take me with her. She nodded. I'll be fine. I'll stay with a friend from high school. When I get back, we can figure out this curse and what to do about it. Okay, I heard myself agree, though I was thoroughly against all of this. I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you too, she said, choking up. I couldn't stand to see her like this. All I wanted was to make her happy. I reached an arm out. Come here, Nade. She leaned on the bed and curled into me. Her head rested on my shoulder, and though her weight put pressure on my ribs, I didn't care, because I had my Nadine with me. We could handle this curse later. Right now, all I could do was be grateful that Nadine and I had both survived the night. All was good in the world. Or it would have been if I hadn't been hit by the most debilitating nausea in the next moment. A brick slammed into my guts, and bile shot up my throat. I sprang upright in bed, throwing Nadine off of me. I leaned over and heaved. A sharp, searing pain radiated across my side. Nadine gasped, Lucas! I was pretty sure she said something else, but I didn't hear her over the high-pitched ringing in my ears. I'd never felt anything like it in all of the time I'd been a Reaper's apprentice. A child's voice played in my mind as if he was sitting at my side. Playtime is over. No child in the coven is safe. The air sucked out of the room. This thought was shockingly similar to another I'd heard months ago. The one that left me curled on the bathroom floor between classes. Is it playtime? but this new one came with a warning. A dark, ominous cloud seemed to swirl around me as realization hit. These two kids' deaths were connected. The warning was clear. Someone had murdered these kids. And there was no telling who they'd come for next. The End this story will continue in The Reaper's Shadow, College of Witchcraft, Book 2. A note from the author. This book contains characters with the following medical conditions. The information included is meant to educate readers on disabilities featured within the College of Witchcraft series. Lupus. Lupus is an autoimmune disease that affects approximately 5 million people worldwide. Symptoms may include chronic pain and fatigue, sun sensitivity, and rashes, among other complex symptoms. Lupus affects each patient differently, and symptoms can come and go throughout the course of the disease. Type 1 Diabetes Type 1 diabetes affects insulin-producing cells in the pancreas. Insulin is the hormone responsible for allowing sugar into the body's cells. Patients require insulin injections to regulate their blood sugar levels. Without treatment, symptoms may include fatigue, blurred vision, and, over time, life-threatening complications such as nerve damage, kidney damage, and eye damage. Depression and Suicide Depression is one of the most common mental disorders in America, 
and affects over 264 million people worldwide. Symptoms may include fatigue, insomnia, and suicidal thoughts or actions. Suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the United States and affects people across race, age, and gender identity. The College of Witchcraft series is part of the Hidden Legends universe, a paranormal fantasy world created by authors Megan Linsky and Alicia Radis. Included in this universe are the following series. The Academy of Magical Creatures series, the University of Sorcery series, and the Prison for Supernatural Offenders series, with more to come. Each Hidden Legends novel features magical romances with disabled characters fighting for a better world. You can find out more about the Hidden Legends universe by going to www.hiddenlegendsbooks.com. This has been The Coven's Secret, Hidden Legends, College of Witchcraft, Book One. Written by Alicia Raddis. Narrated by Logan Young and Jonathan M. Matthews. Copyright 2019 by Alicia Raddis. Production Copyright 2020 by Alicia Raddis.